Chapter 13 Emerson's Concept of the Oversoul In every human nature abides a cyclopean self with whom, at long intervals, the mortal part of man communes. With this thought is introduced a new phase of Greek metaphysical speculation. The instructors in the mysteries declared that at birth each individual was assigned an invisible patron spirit called the natal daemon. This entity was analogous to the totem of the North American Indians, except that the totem was invoked by prayer and fasting, while the daemon, being coexistent with the generating soul itself, became, as it were, the identity of the senses. By some, this natal daemon was considered the personified aggregate of past experiences or the summation of previous lives. It was synonymous with the instinctive impulse nature, that inevitable product of existences which stands behind and urges the issues of the outer life. This natal daemon is the composite self, the sum of countless previous selves, the personality compounded of multiple personalities the thinking, feeling, and actuating sensory organism of material urge, the superphysical byproduct of temporal achievement. The natal daemon is the god who protects the fool, making it impossible for man to actually undo himself beyond redemption. It is the patron saint of the outer life, the intuitively sensed superiority, the intangible authority by which mortal man is given courage to assert his participation in a divine energy. According to the Egyptians, the natal daemon is created by the converging celestial rays at the time of nativity. It becomes the intangible cause of dispositions, and through its agencies, to individuals. Though similarly organized, neither think nor feel the same, but work out their diverging destinies motivated by this demoniacal part. Plato, writes Apuleius on the god of Socrates, asserts that a peculiar daemon is allotted to every man who is a witness and a guardian of his conduct in life, who without being visible to anyone is always present, and who is an arbitrator not only of his deeds but also of his thoughts. But when life being finished, the soul returns to the judges of its conduct, then the daemon who presided over it immediately seizes and leads it as his charge to judgment, and is there present with it while it pleads its cause. Hence the daemon reprehends it if it has acted on any false pretense, solemnly confirms what it says if it asserts anything that is true, and conformably to its testimony passes sentence. All you, therefore, who hear this divine opinion of Plato, as interpreted by me, so form your minds to whatever you may do, or to whatever may be the subject of your meditation that you may know there is nothing concealed from those guardians, either within the mind or external to it, but that the daemon who presides over you inquisitively participates of all that concerns you, sees all things, understands all things, and in the place of conscience dwells in the most profound recesses of the mind. For he of whom I speak is a perfect guardian, a singular prefect, a domestic speculator, a proper curator, an intimate inspector, an insidious observer, and an inseparable arbiter, a reprobator of what is evil, an approver of what is good. And if he is legitimately attended to, sedulously known and religiously worshipped, in the way in which he was reverenced by Socrates with justice and innocence, will be a predictor in things uncertain, a premonitor in things dubious, a defender in things dangerous, and an assistant in want. He will also be able, by dreams, by tokens, and perhaps also manifestly, when the occasion demands it, to avert from you evil, increase your good, raise your depressed, support your falling, illuminate your obscure, govern your prosperous, and correct your adverse circumstances. The natal daemon is declared by Olympiodorus to be the supreme flower of the soul, for it is the blossoming of soul qualities. To a certain extent, the soul is generated from the interplay of action and reaction in the sphere of sense. The soul is the garment woven from the threads of incident. The natal daemon is consciousness born of experience, the realization begotten of necessity. The natal daemon is the diamond soul, 
the transmutation of corporeal reality into incorporeal reality, the regeneration of bodily quantities into bodiless qualities. But the natal daemon is the wholeness of consciousness which must ever result from the coordination of heterogeneous parts. In the terms of mathematics, the natal daemon is the spirit of the number six, which is invoked by the coming together of six monads and is inseparable from them as long as they continue to constitute a unit or wholeness. The natal daemon must therefore be regarded as the consciousness of the senses, conceived as a monad and established at the summit of the pyramid of sense from whence it flows downward to tincture with that understanding based upon experience, the entire structure of the corporeal perceptions. The philosophers declared that a natal daemon, or familiar, is assigned to every man, with whom it remains until the rational soul, having been elevated above the sphere of the senses, and having achieved comparative illumination, turns to the contemplation of super-essential verities. Upon one who had achieved this distinction, the Greeks conferred the appellation of hero. A hero was one who had heroically turned from the contemplation of the temporal to the contemplation of the eternal, and consequently was dedicated to the service of the gods. Gazing rapturously upon the faces of the ungenerated ones, the heroes verged towards certain divinities, with more ardor than to others, thus expressing the innate preferences of their dispositions. The heroes, therefore, were divided among the orders of the gods, each serving his own preference and by degrees coming to be identified with the qualities of his chosen deity. As the gods themselves are incapable of descending into the corporeal sphere, they incline toward it through their vassals, the heroes. As a result, certain men have come to be revered as divine incarnations and the creative principles venerated under their similitudes. Unable to discern that... The hero is not a god. The non-philosophic have befogged the issues of theology, with the result that men have become the worshippers of men and have propitiated mortal heroes before the super-essential gods. While ordinary mortals, being as yet rationally unawakened, depend largely upon their natal daemon, the heroes, or those already approaching liberation, are the beneficiaries of a more exalted genius, denominated the essential daemon. The father star of the Neoplatonists is this essential daemon, into whose nature the natal daemon has been merged by a process in which the lesser is mingled with the greater, and their issues become one. The essential daemon is unapproachable by him who is still a servant to his sense perceptions. Nor can the essential daemon descend into man, but as a silent watcher must brood over the irrational soul until, emerging from its chrysalis of materiality, it spreads its spiritual wings and soars swiftly to the source of its own light. In Homer's Odyssey, Ulysses is revealed to be a mortal aspiring to the estate of a hero, which end he attains by his perilous voyagings through the seas of temporal uncertainty. As the senses must be mastered before that which is above, the senses can be liberated. One of the labors of Ulysses was the blinding of the Cyclops. The giant signified Ulysses' own natal daemon, his self-will, whose power must be destroyed before divine will could be seated in its place. The Cyclops is, therefore, a monster of the astral light, a shadowy giant who abides amid the shadows of man's own being and whose single eye is the pineal gland, the only organ with which he discerns the outer universe. But it is possible for the eye of the natal daemon to see two ways. By turning inward, it ceases to serve the cyclops and fixes its gaze upon the splendid features of the essential daemon, who, abiding in the sphere of pure intellection, is the father star, the pole star, by which the mariner of life steers the bark of his own soul into the safe haber of divine perfection. The philosophy of daemons is the outgrowth of man's natural veneration for the rationality manifest in every order of life and form. The very clouds scudding across the sky exist by virtue of the intercession of rational intelligence, and upon fulfillment of their destiny are dissipated by the activity of this self-same intelligence. A peculiar providence equips every organism with the instruments of its own survival. The plant's vital seed is protected by a stalwart husk and the life of the crustacea by its defensive shell. 
The urge that causes irrational nature to act in a rational manner we call instinct. To the ancient philosopher, however, the flowering of plants, the propagation of species, the tinting of rocks and crystals, the motions of the elements, and the emotions of the soul, all these were regarded alike as evidence of the presence of invisible but powerful spirits, demons, who, seated in the causal nature of the manifesting sphere, guided primitive lives to the fulfillment of the predestined ends of the universal procedure. Some of these daemons are analogous to the elemental spirits of Paracelsus, with whose characteristics the great Swiss physician was made familiar by Arabian sorcerers. Recognizing all diversified activities to be suspended from causal unities, the philosopher of antiquity realized that while green, for example, dominates the color scheme of numberless organisms, green is itself a monad or unity, its intrinsic nature being coetinous with a rational daemon. The orderly or rational distribution of green is thus affected through the ministrations of this guardian spirit which is synonymous with the very nature of green itself. To attribute rationality to a tube of pigment at first may appear to be a baseless concept. Those who have experimented with most colors realize, however, that they have an inherent orderliness and are very much alive, possessing the power to excite pleasure or displeasure, and through their intermingling to demonstrate various complexions of universal order. As the salamander is born by the very friction that ignites that sulfur match, so a daemon is spontaneously produced through every combination of forces, substances, or circumstances, becoming the patron of such combinations and remaining with them until divine procedure returns these combinations to their original simplicity. The belief in guardian spirits is a very lofty one when the unfolding rationality of man permits him to regard these entities as ever beautiful and virtuous. On the other hand, untutored peoples consider these transcendental entities to be innately malevolent, conspiring against human beings and seeking to spread sorrow and mischief throughout the world. The idealism of the Greek aestheticians enabled them to recognize divine agency in all that was beautiful in that divinities rejoiced in the harmonious combinations of substances and circumstances. Accordingly, a place of beauty must needs be the dwelling of a thing of beauty, and somber groves dwelt grave dryads, formed of the soft shadow that lingered there. In the high-flung spray of waterfalls, nymphs disported themselves, while diminutive but pompous gnomes industriously hoarded beech nuts against the possibility of seven lean years. Though these creatures were invisible to the normal sight, man was conscious of their presence. They were indeed creations of place, products of environment and necessary to the setting of the picture. All these creatures are daemons of different orders, for there are not only vast spirits whose bodies are stars, but daemons so small that they seek the shelter of toadstools or play hide-and-seek among the blades of grass. The daemon is the spirit of feeling that is born of and is inseparable from the circumstance that gives it birth. It is the preserver of universal order in the lesser, the untiring minister to parts, the protector and patron of unfolding life. Just what relation, then, does the oversoul of Emerson bear to the god of Socrates, that strange yet exalted spirit which impelled the Athenian commoner to a martyr's end? Emerson, the Occidental Orientalist, thus defines what he conceives to be that common oversoul of whose nature we all partake, and which is the common measure of us all, the supreme critic on all the errors of the past and the present, and the only prophet of that which must be, is that great nature in which we rest, as the earth lies in the soft arms of the atmosphere, that unity, that oversoul, within which every man's particular being is contained and made one with all other, that common heart, of which all sincere conversation is the worship, to which all right action is submission, that overpowering reality which confutes our tricks and talents, and constrains every one to pass for what he is, and to speak from his character and not from his tongue, and which evermore tends and aims to pass into our thought and hand become wisdom and virtue and power and beauty. 
It is a philosophic axiom that as we verge toward cause, we verge toward simplicity. And as we depart from cause, we incline toward complexity. For all things are simple in their beginnings, complex in their midmost parts, and simple again in their ends. As man passes from childishness through maturity to childishness, so life, according to the doctrines of Herbert Spencer, is from simple homogeneity to complex heterogeneity, and from heterogeneity back again to homogeneity. Approach to simplicity, then, presumes an ever-decreasing number of parts, until ultimate simplicity is utter privation of partition. Emerson clearly senses the common unity of cause, that vast monad which is our common parent and whose sufficiency is the only noble reality. This is indeed the great daemon, the supreme soul invoked by existence, whose ministrations we manifest in common with whose edicts are the code of our lives. As we increase in rationality, we become diffused among or enter into the inner nature of an ever-increasing number of organisms, thereby becoming capable of knowing and feeling the impulses which actuate these organizations. Thus man became the oversoul of men, the Adam, or archetypal one, from whom issue the many, the protogenos, from whose nature and from the pores of the skin come forth the sweat-born and the establishment of generations. Thus man, the oversoul, is the anthropos, or demoniacal spirit, which is the common father of infinite progeny, the vast sphere of influence which men can never escape, but which is their allness and against the sovereignty of which they vainly struggle, ignorant of the fact that it is their common life. The oversoul alone is man, for men are but fractional parts of themselves and are never complete until altogether form one grand nature. Therefore, while all men differ in their outer lives, in their inner life there is a common ground whereupon all stand together and upon which they must erect the citadel of their strength. Only to the dreamer who sees not with his eyes but with his soul is the dignity of the anthropos apparent. Only the mystic can comprehend that vast being which towers above the puny sensibilities of mortals and from the lofty place broods over the body of its sovereignty. This anthropos exceeds man to the degree that the whole exceeds its parts, for each part contributes to the sufficiency of the sum. The Neoplatonists differed from the Egyptians in their definition of the anthropos, or the nature of the all-containing self, when related to the status of men. According to one group, all of man descends into the sphere of generation there to wander for a given time in the confusion of sense, and later by rational procedure to escape therefrom and reascend to the sphere of spiritual sufficiency. The more profound philosophies, however, declared that the ungenerate can never actually generate, nor can that which abides in the contemplation of perfection ever become immersed in the delusions of mortality. While the inferior nature of man, suspended from its monadic cause, may thus struggle for a brief period in the darkness of the moral sphere, the true self remains throughout this period in the presence of perfect order and adequate comprehension. According to this viewpoint, all of man does not descend into the realm of his corporeal limitations, but rather broods over the incarnating part, and from its own state of detachment, contemplates the attachments which involve the inferior self. Thus man is more than man. He is like the oft-employed simile of the iceberg, of which only a fractional part of its great bulk is visible. This invisible greatness of man, unmoved and uninvolved and residing in the pure rationality of the supreme sphere, is termed the silent watcher, the Atman, who is the true man, and of who the lesser part becomes increasingly aware as it ceases to be conscious of its animal part. In this manner is man, the comparative physical non-entity, suspended from man, the actual spiritual immensity. It is not this over-brooding divinity which man senses when he explores the depths of his own feeling and seeks to measure the magnitude of his intellect. Is it not the transcendent superpersonal one who is the true substance of man's hope in the body of his aspirations? Picture then the mortal nature of man who, obscured by the insufficiency of his physical perceptions, crawling worm-like upon the surface of earth, 
dares to believe in his own thoughts and assume the reasonableness of his own contentions. Men conceive the blind mortality which men call life to be directed by a great and observing spirit which, grasping the lesser life by the hand, gently leads it toward comprehension and realization. Imagine that behind the little you at all times stands the greater you, majestic, illumined, magnificent, who communicates to the earthiness, which is your mortal body, a splendor more than sufficient, and through whose greatness the little you is made partaker of the greatness and goodness of all things. This is the Anthropos, the heavenly man, the supreme Manu, from whose presence man departs for his terrestrial wandering in the prodigal's sphere. While Emerson conceives this soul to be within man, in philosophy we prefer to conceive of man as within this soul. As through philosophy we increase the dimensions of our internal selves, we gradually annihilate the interval between our human souls and this oversoul. Our internal selves take on the stature of this nobler part, until, though our body may be still of mortal size, the scope of expanding consciousness becomes tions of inspiration. We then understand the qualities which inspired Emerson to pen these words. The soul looketh steadily forward, creating a world always before her, and leaving worlds always behind her. She has no dates, no rights, nor persons, nor specialties, nor men. The soul knows only the soul. All else is idle weeds for her wearing. We now turn to a more detailed consideration of the intrinsic nature of the soul and the position it occupies in the composite structures of both man and the universe. As already defined, the soul is the first and chief of the generations. It abides in its own essence at the apex of the pyramid of form. If the soul then be a generation and not an eternal principle... Of what it is it generated, and why is it superior to other generations? That which is generated receives its life from another. Having had this active agent once imparted to it, it is thenceforth capable of separation therefrom. On the other hand, an ungenerated being, because its life is inherent, must ever abide in that life and that life in it, and hence is incapable of dissolution. Being a generation, the soul must consequently be included under the classification of bodies. Yet it is different from bodies. For being the chief of them, it possesses a fullness of virtues which exceeds the fullness of any other body. Of inferiors, then, the soul is the superior, and by virtue of its disposition occupies a midmost place between abiding life and unabiding form. As the physical man is clothed in a vehicle composed of the objectification and substantial counterpart of his superphysical corporeal impulses, so an invisible body generated of attributes too subtle to assume physical aspect envelopes the spiritual part as with an appropriate robe. Virtue, for example, is irreducible to physical perceptions. Seated, however, in the invisible nature, it manifests as an intangible and definite attribute of the self. Man is as surely clothed in the garments of virtue as he is in the garments of the physical. They are vehicles of his expression, no less real than are the members formed of bone, flesh, or sinew. Besides the physical, man is the owner of many bodies, invisible, however, to those whose perceptions are limited solely to the earthly senses. Each of these bodies is the vehicle of the definite potentialities which are slowly being manifested through appropriate organisms. Man lives in many worlds simultaneously, but of this fact he is unaware until he comes to realize that every phase of his temperament attunes him to a different level of universal activity. A concatenated chain of vehicles extends upward from the dense physical organism to the attenuated superphysical organism of the soul. These bodies originally issued forth from the soul, and to the soul they must return, or rather, we should say their essences verge. For soul existed before bodies and shall endure after bodies have ceased to be. Yet the soul is profoundly influenced by its bodies, and its nature is subjected to change by the reactions of bodily conditions. As the proper monad of bodies, the soul causes to issue out from its own being all that is inferior to itself. And by the same course that dominated their issuance, the soul reabsorbs these selfsame bodies back again into its own essence. For by this reabsorption is the perfection of bodies consummated. 
Man cannot enter into the presence of reality while still invested with body, for body can never contemplate the bodiless, form the formless, or the generated, the ungenerated. As bodies, forms, and generations are thus transmuted into soul, more correctly, reabsorbed into the soul substance. Man creates for himself a new and more subtle garment, a luminous sheath, a bodiless body, a form verging toward the formless, by which it is enabled to contemplate formlessness with comprehension. The soul, then, is the all-sufficient body. It is form elevated to the vanishing point. It is nature retired into its own apex and thus rendered capable of contemplating its own cause. Through progressive sublimation, bodies are caused to retire from their own materiality and incline themselves toward that spirituality from which they derived their actuating principle. If the fruitage of physical experience were apprehensible by the physical nature alone, then life would be put a span of useless suffering, for the deed would perish with the doer, and the self would be left as impecunious as before. Though every tangible evidence of physical achievement must be discarded by the decarnating spirit, yet there is carried forward into the invisible a subtle substance or pablum extracted from incident and assimilable by the soul nature. Every incident, every experience, every conclusion of the physical life has its own soul nature, to be extracted therefrom by a strange distillation. The vapors are thus distilled, are inhaled by the soul, even as the physical body subsists upon the material atmosphere. The distilled essence of incident thus becomes the essential nutriment of the soul, and the experiences of life are ultimately metamorphosed into soul qualities, becoming psychical urges and influences by which the outer nature is inclined hither and thither. As polarity exists throughout the sphere of generation, it follows that the soul itself, though intrinsically a monad, must manifest through the duad, the positive and negative channels of expression. The soul is accordingly symbolized as two creatures, one a beautiful and radiant spirit subsisting upon the manifesting virtues of the life, the other an evil and rebellious spirit fostered by every unworthy thought or deed. These two guard the mystic gate between the outer and the inner self, for as the soul, they are the portal through which the polar forces of cause and effect pass in mutual exchange. The radiant soul fashioned from the very substance of achievement becomes the animating principle of intuition. For what is intuition but a kind of memory in which particulars are forgotten but principles remembered? The mind may lack the power to reason through, and the outer nature be uninformed regarding the solution of perplexing problems. But based upon ages of endeavor, intuition unerringly points out the law of probability. For by virtue of ripe experience it inclines with more certitude than the reason, and with more discretion than the thinking but inexperienced personality. The evil part of the soul speaks also, and its voice is conscience. Conscience is the still, small voice of unremembered suffering which long vanished from the conscious mind, yet lives in the deeper recesses of the nature, where it warns of impending catastrophe and whispers to such as will listen the standards of right and wrong as established by experience. Men and women of normal intelligence never commit wrong deeds which they do not know are wrong before their commission. We may dissemble or feign ignorance, but all too often we realize that we lie, even while we speak. The mentor of ages dwells within, and irrespective of our pretensions, its words are audible to our inner selves. What is that accusing self from which the malefactor can never escape, and which hounds the evildoer to the bitter end? It is the soul, living its own life consistent with the principle of truth. The soul will never let us rest until our outer lives are rendered harmonious with the code within. Why are some happy? Though surrounded by all manner of misfortune and sorely oppressed by offending circumstances, because the soul, satisfied with the behavior of the life, bestows the sense of satisfaction upon these outer sensibilities, so keenly vexed by an unkind providence. The all-sufficing realization of accomplishment flows from the soul, and like the balm of Gilead, assuages the torments of the material Tartarus. 
persecuted parts are imbued with fresh courage and conviction and given new strength to meet every emergency. On the other hand, why are so many who are fully blessed with this world's goods and possessors of all that should bestow happiness and tranquility so miserable, so abject, so afraid? Because the soul, dissatisfied, refuses to allow an outer complacency to silence its accusations. When man's soul thus convicts him of misdirected living, there is no tribunal to which he can appeal for mitigation of his offense. Shall we then wonder that the Greeks declared conscience to be a daemon that eternally whispers in the ear of the mind, and intuition a guardian deity that can conduct the life through the perils of the physical universe? Intuition and conscience are the tangible expressions of the intangible soul by which man is made to realize that from every act a residue remains which shall influence his doing unto the end of time. Nothing that we accomplish is lost. Nothing that we achieve is forgotten. For while the particulars may vanish away, the principles involved are interwoven into the fabric of an invisible vestment that clothes the self in the ample folds of experience and ensures that spirit shall never be without a counselor or life without a patron. We have already set forth the triform constitution of the divine agent who through the one, the beautiful, and the good creates, preserves, and destroys the innumerable orders of beings. Apuleius, the metamorphosis, sets forth in allegorical terms the inner mystery of the soul. A legend of Cupid and Psyche existed, however, prior to the time of Apuleius, being preserved inviolate by the philosophers, lest a profane would desecrate the sacred truths. A king and queen had three daughters, so the story goes of whom the youngest, Psyche, was of such surpassing beauty that mortals paid her a homage that elevated her above the dignity of even Venus herself. The indignant goddess of beauty thereupon dispatched her winged son, Cupid, to humble the pride of Psyche by infusing her with a passion for some gross and unnatural being. Invisible to mortals, Cupid entered the apartment of Psyche to carry out his mother's mission but became so enamored of the beautiful maiden that he repented of his role and schemed to win Psyche for himself. Suffering from the enmity of Venus, Psyche found no love among mankind, and in obedience to an oracle which declared that she would never be the bride of a mortal lover, but that her husband would be a monster whom neither gods nor man could resist, she ascended the mountain upon which it was decreed she should wait the coming of her unnatural bridegroom. As she stood upon the mountain top, the god Zephyr picked her up and bore her into a flowery dale, in the midst of which stood a grove of tall and stately trees and a magnificent palace which was not the work of mortal hands. The palace roof was supported by gilded columns, and the walls were ornamented with tracing of beasts and strange creatures. Vast treasures of gold and jewels were also gathered there, and Psyche was served by invisible attendants who gratified her slightest wish. Psyche never saw her husband, who came only at night and departed before dawn. She begged him to permit her to look upon his face, but he declared that she must be content with his love and never try to see him. Desirous of putting at rest the worries of her family, Psyche sent for her two sisters, and these, jealous of her fortune, incited her to make an effort to see her husband. So one night when he was asleep, she lit a lamp, and carrying a knife with which to slay the evil monster, described by the oracle, stole into her husband's bedchamber and discovered him to be Cupid, the son of Venus, and the most beautiful of all the gods. As she stood watching him, a drop of hot oil fell upon his body, and awakened by the pain, Cupid spread his downy wings and fled through the window sorrowfully reminding Psyche that love cannot dwell with suspicion. The palace thereupon vanished, and Psyche found herself in a field near her father's city. Broken-hearted, she began a quest for her lost lover, first seeking the help of Ceres, who suggested that if she go humbly to Venus and surrender to her dictates, she might regain Cupid's love. Desiring the discomfiture of Psyche, however, Venus made a servant of her, setting her almost impossible tasks, which Psyche in every instance accomplished with the assistance of sympathetic gods. Her first task was to separate a vast quantity of mixed grains, 
her second to gather golden fleece from a large flock of vicious rams, and her third to descend into Hades and bring back from Persephone, the goddess of the underworld, a casket filled with beauty. Still inquisitive, however, Psyche opened the casket, in spite of the warning given her by the tower god who had aided her in the adventure. Instead of being filled with beauty, the casket contained a Stygian sleep, which loosed from the box overcame Psyche, so that she fell unconscious on the path. Cupid, coming to her rescue, returned the sleep to the box, and interceding with Jupiter for her hand, both finally reconciled Venus to the match. Psyche was then given a cup of heavenly drink, which conferred upon her immortality, and in common with all fairy stories, the two lovers lived happily ever afterward. In the interpretation of this fable of the soul's descent into generation, more correctly, its descent into the concept of generation, we must reiterate certain of our earlier assumptions. In the words of Thomas Taylor, In the first place, the gods, as I have elsewhere shown, are super-essential natures, from their profound union with the first cause, who is super-essential without any addition. But though the gods, through their summits or unities, transcend essence, yet their unities are participated either by intellect alone, or by intellect and soul, or by intellect, soul, and body, from which participations the various orders of the gods are deduced. When therefore intellect, soul, and body are in conjunction, suspended from this super-essential unity, which is the center, flower, or blossom of a divine nature, then the god from whom they are, suspended, is called a mundane god. The Platonists further affirmed that the human soul was born from the intellect and soul of the world, but that its direct parents were the intellect and soul of a certain star which is its father star, and from which it first descended into the sphere of non-tranquility. As the soul is suspended between intellect and body, its fall, so-called, represents its inclination toward body. Therefore, the mundane soul and the intellectual or supermundane soul are identical in essence, but verge in opposite directions. The fall or descent of the soul into materiality is the result, consequently, of its contemplation of body, and conversely, its liberation from the mundane sphere is accomplished by turning about to the contemplation of intellect. The soul is an immortal mortal, for when mingling with immortals it shares their permanence and transcendency. When mingling with mortal concerns, however, it is bereft of these endowments, becoming susceptible to a certain degree of mortality by which its luminosity is destroyed and its wings are clipped. From this we understand how it is possible for a soul to fall from its estate and yet still remain in that estate. For though it may verge toward the intellect or the body, it is still essentially in its own estate and remains soul regardless of the nature with which it mingles. Apropos to the subject matter, we have the remarks of Aristides concerning the descent of the soul. The soul, he says, as long as she is seated in a pure place of the universe, in consequence of not being mingled with the nature of bodies, is pure and inviolate, and revolves together with the ruler of the world. But when, through an inclination to these inferior concerns, she receives certain phantasms from places about the earth, then she gradually imbibes oblivion of the goods she possessed in her former superior station, and at the same time descends. But by how much the more she is removed from superior natures, by so much the more approaching to inferiors is she filled with insanity and hurled into corporeal darkness, because through a diminution of her former dignity she can no longer be intelligibly extended with the universe, but on account of her own oblivion of supernal goods and consequent astonishment, she is borne downward into more solid natures, and such as are involved in the obscurity of matter. Hence, when her desire of body commences, she assumes and draws from each of the superior places some portions of corporeal mixture. The same author continues his description of the descent of the soul through the orbits of the divine planets, from each of which, as in the story of Ishtar, as the seven gates and also the descent of the soul in the divine pymander of Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus, the soul receives a luciform and enveloping nature. At last, approaching the sphere of the moon, the soul becomes of such corporeality that a certain gravitation draws it into the rhythm of the physical world. 
The soul then loses its spherical form and assumes the human shape. The luciform and ethereal substances gathered from the stars first becoming fetal membranes and later definite parts of physical structure, of the outer nature, of psychical qualities in the inner nature. For, as Aristides again remarks, the shell-like vestment of man is nourished from its own root, which is the descending soul. Psyche, or the soul, is described by Apuleius to be of royal parentage, thus arcanely intimating that she is of a divine line, for royalty here signifies the spiritual lineage. That which has its foundation in the gods is declared to be of kingly order. For the gods were the patrons of rulers who thus administered their kingly office by divine right. In contradiction, mortals were regarded as creatures of common birth to signify that their mother was the earth and they themselves earthborn and not, like the gods, the sons of heaven. Psyche is further described as the most beautiful of all mortals, so far surpassing all other earthly beings in loveliness that men venerated her as a goddess and made her offerings similar to those with which Venus, the mother of generations, was propitiated. The soul is thus represented as exceeding in perfection all other material bodies, its beauty being due to its proximity to the fountain of beauty, of whose harmonies it partakes and whose excellence it reflects into the inferior sphere. The perfections of the soul surpass the perfections of the body, even as the qualities of the superior nature surpass the qualities of form. In Book 10 of the Laws, Plato puts into the mouth of the Athenian stranger the following words, And if this is true, and if the soul is older than the body, must not the things which are of the soul's kindred be of necessity before those which appertain to the body? Clinius answers, Certainly. Then, rejoins the Athenian, thought and care and mind and art and law will be prior to that which is hard and soft and heavy and light. Here Plato emphasizes the doctrine of the excellence of the soul over the body, for the concerns of the soul are more noble, more lasting, and more satisfying than are the concerns of the mortal nature. As mental activity is more beautiful than physical activity, and virtue more excellent than pulchritude of person, so the ancients ascribed to the soul a transcendent and luminous beatitude. Sensing the felicity of this inner part, the outer nature regarded the soul as a divinity in some cases as the divinity. The misdirected homage is said to have vexed the higher gods, who, since they greatly exceeded the virtue of the soul, should properly be the recipients of a fuller and more perfect devotion. If the gods, however, be impersonal principles, how shall we interpret that vexation which prompts them to divert their benevolence and leave the offending mortal deprived of their qualities? When man in his quest of realities exalts secondary natures, such as the soul, and loses sight of the divine origin and wholeness from which souls are suspended, he reaps for his imprudence irrationality, or the suspension of rational activity. Thus is his mind continually vexed by its own unsoundness, and such disquietude in the rational faculties is declared to represent an offended intellect or an indignant divinity. The goddess Venus manifests a twofold disposition. The superior phases liberates souls from material generation and elevates them to those super essential generations which subsist from the apex of the generating sphere. The other and lower phase of Venus inclines souls towards corporeality and binds them in servitude to the generating nature for which reason the goddess was regarded by the ancients as a personification of carnality. The great dragon or monster whom the oracle prophesied was to become the husband of Psyche, signified materiality, the mortal nature with whom she must be wedded at the time of her entrance into physical life. The fabulous monsters of the ancient mystery rituals, such as Behemoth, Leviathan, and the Hippocampus, all signify the mortal sphere that devours the souls descending into generation, and like the Minotaur claims for its own the fairest and bravest of every age. Psyche is led forth to the top of a high mountain, there to wed this strange creature, decreed by the gods, that her spirit might be duly humbled, and that she might realize that only the immortals can escape the limitations of matter and the ravages of time. 
From this mountain top, Psyche is borne downward by Zephyr, the west wind, into a beautiful valley where stands a mighty grove of oak trees. This valley signifies the mundane sphere or lower world into which the generating soul is conducted. The east is the portal of generation, for it denotes the place of the nativity in a horoscope. So the west wind blows the soul gently into birth. The grove of trees signifies creation, which is, as it were, a clump of mighty agencies. In the midst of this grove is the palace of the world, where there are vast treasures and the jewels of the stars. The tracings upon the walls of the palace are the constellations. Those vast signs upon the walls of heaven which hem in our solar system and are the limits of the mundane house. Here Psyche is served by invisible beings, whose voices she hears. For having descended from her true estate, the spiritual agencies which are her excellence are no longer visible. But their voices still speak to her inner nature, even as the gods still speak through the oracle of the human heart. Psyche, however, is not yet physical and mortal, hence the physical agencies of creation are also invisible. Suspended thus between two spheres, she wanders in the great house of life, which she is eventually to discover is the dwelling place of Cupid. Cupid is chiefly familiar to the 20th century as the matchmaker supreme, but in antiquity he played a most significant role. He is the symbol of love which, according to philosophy, has a duality of natures. The first is that supernal passion by which the soul is moved while still pure and undefiled in the luminance of the soul sphere. The second is mortal love, in which the soul, deluded by the findings of sense, exchanges for the adoration of internal qualities, the infatuation for external appearance. Married to an invisible being, Psyche thus becomes the bride of spiritual love, into which union the element of form or materiality has not yet entered. She dwells in a beautiful astral place, served by creatures whose natures have not yet been invested with mortal fabric. Here she remains until her sisters, who signify mortal instincts, begin to pull her downward into the sphere of sense. When Psyche beholds the physical form of her husband, spiritual love is changed into material passion. She is forthwith precipitated from her heavenly palace into the broad meadow of the earth, where broken-hearted she wanders in search of the happiness she foolishly sacrificed by listening to the voices of worldliness. She then becomes a servant of Venus, who sets for the unfortunate girl a number of difficult as well as dangerous tasks. These tasks represent the labors of life, the misfortunes of existence, which generation heaps upon those who come beneath its sway. In each instance, however, she is assisted by a heavenly voice, which representative of the ever-present daemon or divinity, with its greater vision, leads the soul befogged by matter through the tortuous byways of existence. When Venus enslaves Psyche, the lower love becomes master of the soul qualities, and the shackles of desire hold the will in bondage to the animal propensities. The last task set by Venus for Psyche to perform is the journey to Hades, to bring back with her from the sphere of the dead, a casket filled with beauty. This casket signified physical life, which the ignorant soul believes to be the receptacle of happiness and beauty, but which proves upon opening to contain only an evil and stupefying spirit. Seizing the soul, the spirit causes it to descend into the very depths of corporal reality, there to remain until Cupid, or love, comes to awaken and elevate it to its lost estate. Cupid, the invisible god, is rational love, that affection which is seated in the true qualities of the soul. This higher and more divine emotion, rousing the rational soul as from a stupor, communicates its vitality thereto and thus enables the soul by rational procedure to cast off the lethargy of the illusions of the flesh. Upon completion of this task, Psyche placates the angry Venus and even wins favor in the sight of awful Zeus, the demiurgist himself. Thereupon she is given the heavenly drink and, ceasing to be immortal, verges toward immortals. She thus becomes the mother of joy, which is born of the union of the rationality in each soul with that greater rationality which is the invisible but all-potent god of intellectual love. Thus is set forth the story of a prodigal daughter, whose experiences parallel those contained in the biblical allegory of the prodigal son. 
Here also is the key to the allegory of Lohengrin, for the young prince of the Holy Grail is divine and unnamed love, which is destroyed or forced to retire when its nature is brought within the sphere of denomination. From the foregoing, it is evident that the integrity of man is posited in his superior part, and regardless of the physical inhibitions by which the flow of his divinity is impeded, that which is essentially good and true must perforce ultimately dominate the entire character. Not without just cause does man instinctively turn to his own soul for consolation and guidance. While he may not consciously realize the immensity of reality, he senses an expansive principle which, residing within the innermost recesses of his being, is ever ready to incline him toward perfection. Life posits his own awareness and the soul quality. Through the soul, spirit learns of its own apparent aloofness from, yet, its actual identity with matter. Clothing its own transcendency in soul, spirit gives its impersonal self into the keeping of a personal nature. Clothed with the rationality of a personal nature, spirit descends into the inferior universe to fulfill the natural law of being, that in the nature of perfect existence there shall constantly manifest generations. The divine plan includes an order of forms through which life principles continually flow from awareness through the veil of unawareness back to awareness again. In philosophy, therefore, we labor without ceasing to stimulate our higher natures and thereby rouse the soul from the lethargy of materiality, permit it to ascend from personals to impersonals, from forms to the estates of the formless, to be finally reunited with that sovereign voice of rational or intellectual love that passion of the soul for reality, that impulse to verge toward those natures, partaking most fully of the permanently beautiful. Thus, within human nature, which is incapable of appreciation in its fullest sense, dwells an all-comprehending power, the human soul, which ever seeks reunion with that omniscience to which each action of universal agency is, in turn, the object of a profound appreciation. This greater soul, this mysterious Cupid, this formless being which man may not behold without destroying, this least of forms and most of spirit, this is the true oversoul in whose intellection we are perpetually immersed and of whose transcendency we continually partake. Chapter 14 Exoteric and Esoteric Knowledge In Plato's Carmides, wisdom is declared to be the science of itself, and also the science of other sciences. Furthermore, the science of the absence of science and the science of mental temperances. While all other divisions of learning are concerned with objects, substances, places, or conditions, wisdom is concerned with its own nature. From it flow, however, all other sciences, and by it it is determined not only the knowable but the unknowable not only the extent of that which is, but also the extent of that which is not. Defined as the proper temperance of the mind, this wisdom, verging toward neither extreme but abiding in perpetual equilibrium, may be likened to the monad of knowing, the unity of rationality, the summit of all sciences and speculations. Today we have preserved those sciences which are properly termed the classifiers of extraneous facts. But that form of wisdom which is primarily concerned with the substance of erudition itself has vanished from the institutes of man. As Plato further observes, a wise and temperate man is one capable of correctly estimating the extent not only of his own knowledge or ignorance, but also of performing the same service for others. No one is wise who is not as fully acquainted with the extent of ignorance as with the extent of wisdom. For in mortal concerns, wisdom is an inconsequential area of rationality existing in an infinite expanse of ignorance. Temperamentally a skeptic, Socrates infers that wisdom is not the knowledge of things, but the knowledge of the condition of knowledge with respect to its absence or presence. An observation plainly intimating that wisdom deals with generals and not with particulars. Wisdom may therefore be considered as composed of the universals of knowing and the sciences of the particulars of knowing, which as the practical are suspended from theory. Exoteric knowledge, then, can be defined as the knowledge of particulars, 
familiarity with those arts and sciences arrived at through application and concentration upon external natures. Conversely, esoteric knowledge is concerned with the inherent nature of knowledge itself and is limited to those acquainted with the more profound issues of philosophy and rational theology. Lest the reader grasp too much of this sublime teaching, Plato causes Socrates to refute the statements concerning this abstract science of knowing, thus making it perceptible only to such as are in turn able to refute Socrates. When he claimed for science that it would wrest from theology the entire domain of cosmological theory, Professor Tyndall would so magnify the part as to swallow up the whole. The puerility of such an assumption is self-apparent, for science by virtue of its very nature has not and cannot invade the realm of true theology. Science may overthrow the false gods and dogmas of creed, but the mysteries of the divine spheres elude the grasp of corporeal learning, since they belong to a more subtle and esoteric realm. Never until knowledge is capable of analyzing itself can it retire into its own causal nature, and behold the luminous and stupendous wholeness from which beings are suspended by most intangible threads. Thus, while the knowledge of external natures and the classification of objective phenomena are the definite province of science, none but the mysteries held the true keys to wisdom. They were the custodians of secrets most arcane. Through peculiar disciplines, they equipped certain selected mortals with rational instruments by which to measure, estimate, and classify those internal facts which forever elude the intellect, delimited by its training to the phenomena the exterior universe. Founded according to Sanchoniathon, in the night of time, the mysteries were established upon the premise of this twofold wisdom, of which the greater phase was committed to their reverent custody and the lesser revealed to all men without discrimination. The world, however, was not left wholly devoid of truth, for the secrets of the inner life were set forth under the guise of theological fables that those whose rational faculties were awakening might sense and incline toward the more sublime verities. Sallust declares the fables of the wise to be of five orders, of which the first is the theological, the second physical, the third animistic or psychical, the fourth material, and the fifth of a mixed order. Many generations often elapsed between the appearance among men of exalted intellects able to comprehend and reconstruct from the figures and metaphors of mythology the hidden body of this spiritual learning, belief in which is now regarded as one of man's most tenacious superstitions. Yet shall we consider as pure figments of the imagination those theological systems which wholly occupied the intellectual faculties of such men as Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Proclus, Porphyry, Cicero, Epictetus, Cranter, Atticus, Galen, Plutarch, and Boetius. Is not the rational proof advanced to support the existence of this esoteric knowledge as valid in its own field as the proof adduced by science, and now regarded as infallible evidence of scientific erudition? That knowledge is not the common property of all is evident from the natural superiority of one mind over another. For no two individuals possess equal faculties of comprehension. These intervals of intellect, manifest to even the most obtuse senses, can never be annihilated save by a definite process of improvement, by which the lesser self equips itself to comprehend the findings of the greater. The line of demarcation, then, between the hidden and the revealed is not to be considered definite, but rather relative. For the unfolding rationality is ever rejecting the old in favor of the new, which, half to find, is scarcely tangible enough to support the intellect. Thus, the individual is ever engaged in tearing away the veils that drape the sciatic figure of knowledge. Yet, in the words of Sir Edwin Arnold, as veil upon veil he lifts, he finds veil upon veil behind. The elements of realization are forever elusive and greatness or littleness of thought is dependent upon comparison for its estimation. Man is increasing in his ability to comprehend things, to orient himself in relation to place, and to estimate quantity and condition. Though the conceivable universe is actually but an anthill in cosmos, inquisitive humanity in the interests of science will eventually explore the universe to its outermost fringe and fling itself therefrom into eternity. 
As long as the human intellect thus involved in its own insufficiency communicates its opacity to all external natures, the term esoteric should not be applied to that which is simply unknown, but rather to that which in terms of mortal intellect is unknowable. We have but begun our struggle to master the phenomena of the physical universe. Millenniums must pass before we can hope to classify its infinite diversity and cope with the problem of eternity. Although the universe envelopes us as with a vast mantle of obscurity and isolates us in the midst of our insufficiency, yet no phenomenon discoverable either by scientific apparatus or philosophic deduction can be classified as truly esoteric. The building of an improved telescope with lenses powerful enough to reveal a galaxy of stars at present invisible would in no way encroach upon the province of esoteric knowledge. For the fact that these stars may be seen if the physical apparatus is sufficiently acute assigns them to the category of exoteric knowledge. The term exoteric covers the area of communicable facts and includes every form of knowledge discoverable to the intellect, to the sense perceptions of the physical mind. That which has been, is now, or can ultimately be recorded upon paper, discoursed upon in the lecture room, debated by polemics, or dissected by the anatomist, must perforce belong to the inferior sphere of speculation, where these activities are common and hence be exoteric. That which can be couched in the language of the mortal sphere pertains to the mortal sphere, but that which pertains to the higher spheres can never be caught upon the surface of grosser substances or sensed by duller perceptions. In one sweep, the self-recommended vendors of things esoteric who herald the coming with 24-sheet posters are thus eliminated. The communication of esoteric knowledge requires a method far more than any of the command of metaphysical mountebanks. The proper custodians of this knowledge, the ancient mysteries, realized too well that its transmission and perpetuation were the most difficult of all tasks in many instances bordering on the impossible. How shall we reveal to another that which entirely transcends the province of the senses, that which is non-convertible into mundane terms, and with which nothing physical is comparable? Hence the secret schools of antiquity instituted systems of definite discipline by which the whole nature was dissociated from the elements of exoteric knowledge and through protracted effort elevated to the level of supersensuous comprehension. Having reached this state, the principles of higher knowing were then communicated to the neophyte by a method almost as arcane as the secrets themselves. A strange telepathic system was developed whereby the findings of the subtler inner perceptions were communicated without passing through that place interval, which exists between ordinary intellects. An interval which must be filled with words or other symbolic forms in which the esoteric matter is necessarily lost. How then shall we define esoteric knowledge? It is the classification of those superessential elements of the pure intellect sphere, where form as man recognizes it does not exist. It must be communicated by a method which, while it awakens no response in the sensory organisms, renders knowledge comprehensive to the inner perceptions. The subject of this inner knowledge and its method of communication has long confounded men of letters. Science cannot conceive of the human mind functioning independently of matter, nor, if consistent to their premises, can man of science admit the possibility of the mind thinking in terms independently of form. In other words, they cannot disassociate the rational processes from the similitudes of phenomena and the laws of comparison that dominate the field of material thought. According to science, the human mind instinctively clothes its conclusions and reactions in the vestments of form, so that even before the thought is registered by the outer nature of the thinker, it is inhabited in familiar, yes, even trite and conventional forms. What science really means, however, is not that thoughts are necessarily always related to form, but rather that until they are clothed in the elements of form, they are incommunicable. In other words, thoughts for which there are no form associations must die at birth, dominated by the laws of generation and under the patronage of the goddess Demeter. The physical sphere will permit no energy to exist within its domain, unless that energy abide by the dictates of matter, 
by being clothed in the substances of matter. When thoughts abide in the mind, they are thus launched into generation through words. These words, which are the bodies, dimming like the mortal vehicles of man, the lucidity of the inner nature. Like the human soul, word souls function imperfectly while enveloped in the grosser substances of the generating sphere. Thus, while the mind under certain conditions is capable of receiving into itself definite superphysical stimuli, and cannot communicate these attenuated impulses and still preserve their integrity. A notable example is that of the eminent psychologist Henry Havelock Ellis, who, as the result of intense functioning in the realm of psychologic idealism, became so sensitized that to him occurred what is classified under the general heading of mystical experience. In his book, The Dance of Life, he writes, Myself was one with the not-self, my will one with the universal will. I seemed to walk in light. My feet scarcely touched the ground. I had entered a new world. The effect of the swift revolution was permanent. At first there was a moment or two of wavering, and then the primary exaltation subsided into an attitude of calm serenity toward all those questions that had once seemed so torturing. Neither was I troubled about the existence of any superior being or beings, and I was ready to see all the words and forms by which men tried to picture spiritual realities are mere metaphors and images of an inward experience. I had become indifferent to shadows, for I held the substance. I had sacrificed what I held dearest at the call of what seemed to be truth, and now I was repaid a thousandfold. Henceforth I could face life with confidence and joy for my heart was at one with the world, and whatever might prove to be in harmony with the world could not be out of harmony with me. Similar experiences are recorded in the lives of Meister Eckhart, Emanuel Swedenborg, Dante Alighieri, and Martin Luther. Scientists regard the mystical experience in a troubled sort of way. Those savants more generously minded cherish the vague hope that some such experience may be their lot and thus afford them opportunity to analyze firsthand its attendant reactions. Unfortunately, the mystical experience does not occur to such pedants as are minded to dissection, or whose paper learning causes them to view lives as simply complicated mechanisms. When, therefore, the apparently miraculous does transpire, the men of letters congregate to marvel and debate, desirous of scoffing but withal perturbed. To them, spirit is so intangible and the bugaboo of superstition so tenacious that they fear even to register an interest in things superphysical, lest they be accused of mental senility. In the light of the persistent drift of modern thought toward materialism, it is not difficult to understand why the ancient systems of learning mean so little to the modern mind. Firmly posited upon what it terms the practical, science can discover no purpose in ceremonial or symbol, nor can it conceive any tangible good to result from chanting grave rituals to the accompaniment of the lyre. The professional standing of Pythagoras the philosopher was almost irremediably impaired by the discovery that he advocated dancing as essential to education, and that even in his advanced years he was accustomed to invoke Turpishore, with true scholastic measure. Modernity cannot picture such profound and serious-minded men as Plato and Aristotle, or even the skeptical Socrates, capering with aesthetic abandon in some moonlight grove. Yet we have not the slightest evidence that the accuracy of their philosophic deductions was adversely affected thereby. Pythagoras declared, upon the authority of Empedocles, that every individual who is to achieve greatness must be capable of expressing rhyme in some proper manner, that the soul which cannot so acutely sense the exalted tempo of the celestial spheres that he has possessed thereby, can never hope to so approach the soul of things as to reach the summit of achievement in any form of learning. Pythagoras realized what the modern gownsman has ignored. Namely, that none is capable of knowing in great measure who is incapable of intense feeling. Learning, acquired in an aesthetic atmosphere, is far more valuable than that gained in the severe or lifeless schoolroom. In the effort to preserve its integrity, science posits its dogma upon the infallibility of material evidence. 
which is presumed to increase in accuracy as it departs from sentiment, and is most valuable when most cold. Add to this a second premise, that of the impossibility of knowing beyond the sphere of phenomena, and you have the schoolman's dilemma epitomized. A transcendent form of knowledge demands for its expression a transcendent form of communication. Vocabularies are created to supply certain needs and are useless beyond the confines of these ends. Language is intended to transmit the more common attitudes of mankind. But for those rare souls who have elevated themselves beyond the level of common attitudes, the language of the herd is wholly insufficient. Thus, in ages past, philosophy evolved its own language, an unspoken tongue, a method of communication which was mostly a communion by which the unutterable was transmitted. In the initiations of the ancient Kabirian mysteries of Samothrace, knowledge was disseminated by a curious method not unlike a highly perfected radio. The instruments of this unique procedure were the rational faculties of the disciples themselves, and the activating agent was a mysterious electric fluid which the priests had learned to capture from the atmosphere and direct by impulses of the will. It has been clearly demonstrated that the Greeks were familiar with electricity, a knowledge secured by them from the Egyptians. This accounts for the peculiar veneration accorded amber by the early priestcrafts, for this substance had been found to possess the quality of capturing and storing electricity. Among carvings and figures of the Samothracian mysteries are several depicting what is called the electric head. The face is surrounded by a circlet of hair which is standing on end as though galvanized by an electric current. In one symbolic group, the hierophant is seated in the center like the sun in the midst of the zodiac. This venerable one is giving the instruction, and his appearance is that a singular repose. Yet the forcefulness pervading the figure is arcanely significant of the concentration of will upon the dissemination of the great work. Gathered about him are the disciples who have the appearance of being electrified. Each individual's hair is standing on end as though caused by a current of electrical energy, in each instance flowing away from the central figure from whom the current emanates. To the initiated beholder, this picture is evidence that the central figure is creating and disseminating rings of electrical energy, which, passing outward in ever-increasing circles, moves through the bodies of the disciples and produces the appearance of electrification. Ancient sculpture also abounds with these electrified heads, whose significance thus far has been almost entirely overlooked by modern students of the mysteries. It is evident, nevertheless, that these heads and the pageantries in which the electrified hair is shown represents efforts to portray the method employed in the communication of esoteric philosophy. The doctrines, projected like an electric current, thus stimulated certain rational faculties in the inner natures of the disciples. As a result of such internal stimuli, the disciples were enabled to sense, feel, or intuitively grasp that which was incommunicable by any objective means. Only when the disciplines of the secret schools had stimulated the internal centers of consciousness to a point where it was possible for the neophytes to be brought en rapport with the inner perceptions of the hierophant could this body of secret tradition concerning formless and eternal truths be communicated from one to another. Mystical philosophers have demonstrated that proficiency in certain arts and sciences stimulates the sensitivity of the superphysical rational faculties because of the definite impulse toward orderliness and exactitude conferred by the study of mathematics. This science was elevated to chief place among the stimuli to rationality. Sculpture, similarly, was highly venerated, for it was a medium by which beauty could be liberated from the shapeless block of marble. The sculptor was not regarded as a creator of beauty, but rather as one who chipped away the rough exterior and thus brought to light the concealed symmetry of an inner nature. In short, the statue existed in the stone before the artist released it and made its symmetry apprehensible to the casual observer. Dialectics also stimulate the subtler phases of rationality by causing them to rise in defense of principle or premise. Through dialectics, the mind is rendered flexible and sufficient for any and every contingency. 
schooled in the thrust and parry of dialectics, the mind produces a Roland for every Oliver in the intellectual affair d'Honneur. The ideal education system by which the cultural standards of our youth are to be molded is the stimulation of these inner perceptions and the preparation of the mind for the contemplations of life's broader and profounder realities. For the most part, however, modern institutions of learning fail to accomplish this summum bonum because they are regarded as ends rather than means. They are considered capable of educating the mind when actually their sole province is to prepare the intellect to receive into its own substance those impregnations of the rational self upon which all true mental excellence depends. Mathematics per se, for example, leads to ends comparatively mean and insignificant, yet nearly all great mathematicians have developed some phase of clairvoyance or clairsentience as a result of their application to its principles. Gradually, the inner perceptions assert their sovereignty, and through a concrete mental organism rendered supersensitive by mathematical speculation, become aware of the polydimensional vistas of the higher and more spiritualized sciences. The musician is similarly subjected to a sublimation of feeling. Through protracted application to the principles of harmony and rhythm, the musician so refines his own emotional nature that it comes to be ensouled by universal concords and the musician himself is moved as though possessed by universal agencies. Thus, the mind that has given itself over to the rather prosaic science of harmonics is instinctively caused thereby to verge toward universal rhythm and actually hear the music of the spheres. Standing in the place of the wise and discoursing to his students upon the profundities of divine order, the philosopher suddenly discovers that he speaks better than he knows becoming, as it were, a disciple of himself. He finds new meanings in his own words. He becomes aware that his mortal mind is being moved by an immortal agent, and that by some indefinable circumstance he has become the very mouthpiece of the ages. Thus, while the exoteric learning disseminated by our public schools and universities inclines the whole nature toward mental illumination, only through the mysteries is that inclination brought to the high tide of expression namely that point where the principles by which eternal verities are maintained and proceed according to their own essences are rendered apprehensible to limited human comprehension. With rare exceptions, eminent educators admit that our schools are primarily intended to be stimulators of internal faculties, which faculties alone are capable of inducing the state of knowing. In the majority of cases, however, even our comparatively sufficient educational facilities are productive of results either abortive or hopelessly mediocre. Too often the student is simply introduced to those phases of learning which are definitely applicable to the utilitarian problems of the age. His education is consequently considered complete when he is schooled in any subject sufficiently for it to serve as a livelihood. Only occasionally do we find the man or woman whose Knowledge of any particular subject is profound enough to support the mind in a state commensurate with its dignity. The lack of rational philosophy common to this age is most evident in our educational systems, whose object ostensibly is to superimpose extraneous thoughts upon those half-awakened adolescent minds, groping for substance amid the shadow of their own immaturity. Educators presumably have adopted Locke's theory that the juvenile mind is a blank sheet of paper upon whose receptive surface must be scribbled conventional platitudes, premises, or admonitions. Regarding the intellectual equipment of youth as a sort of highly attenuated putty, instructors subconsciously relegate to themselves the molding of this mental stuff into the likeness of the conventional, the substantial, and the prosaic, what they esteem as the outstanding characteristics of sound and useful thought. Under the molding influence of the old, it is thus assured that the new life will be a replica of those inadequate generations, which rise from their stupor only to blight futurity. When philologic pedagogues have finished poking their intellectual fingers into the plastic substances of his brain, its youthful owner is prepared to go forth into the world and repeat every imprudence which marred the tranquility of his ancestors. The dire circumstances that torment each succeeding generation are thus reinvoked and perpetuated. This mental overshadowing renders its beneficiary incapable of originality even in vice, 
He cannot even make his own mistakes, but must continue to repeat the errors of the ages and bow beneath such time-honored institutions as war and competition. With the possible exception of theology, nowhere outside the realm of education does man's egotism find more grandiloquent expression. Here fools in purple doublets sanctimoniously bestow their foolishness upon posterity. Having lost sight of the true purpose of education, these pedants regard him well-cultured who thinks least and remembers most while in the schoolroom, but who, having matriculated into the greater concerns of life, there conveniently acquires the knack of forgetting even the little he once remembered. With the ends of education thus most effectively obscured, the means by which these ends should be attained are at best but high roads to nowhere. Education has become a vicious circle wherein the ignorance of one generation is transmitted like a hereditary taint to its progeny. Every form of social evil is made to thrive exceedingly, and the racial virtues are periodically threatened with extinction. Interpretation is the preponderant factor in modern teaching. The instructor perforce acts as an intermediary between the complexity of a science and the insufficiency of a partly developed mind. To interpret adequately is a divine gift, bestowed by the gods, only upon those whose attainments rival the heroic deeds of myth and legend. A great interpreter is no less a master than a great originator, for only a mind as great as the conceiving mind can intelligently interpret the concepts of that conceiving mind. A proper instructor of the young is born, not made. His genius is supreme, for not only must he be able to grasp the infinite complexity of a subject, but he must also reduce that complexity to an orderly simplicity. He must think downward to those intellects that still verge upon the state of thoughtlessness, inclining them gently, reverently, yet unmistakably toward rational procedure. Plato was dead 500 years before an interpreter was found worthy of the task of revealing the intellectual achievements of this illustrious mortal. Of all the Platonic successors, only Proclus sensed the significance and magnitude of Plato's contribution to human knowledge. Each century gives birth to but one or two truly creative and interpretive minds. All other claimants to proficiency and conversance are merely meddlers in matters of the mind dabblers, dilettante, veritable parasites upon the bodies of art and science. They suffer from that most loathsome and fatal of all diseases, ignorance of their own ignorance. The prime requisite of every great exponent of an art or science is that he shall recognize and emphasize its aesthetic and ethical aspects. Even such prosaic arts as carpentry and cookery may become media by which the mind can be introduced to the beautiful, the noble, and the good. Failure to perceive the substratum of divine agency below surface of every physical procedure is to demonstrate one's disqualification to instruct in the elements of that procedure. Therefore, none but the idealist who can see the beautiful in all things should be entrusted with the education of a child, in whose nature it is hoped that the spirit of beauty will take up its abode. Of Greek philosophy, it has been said that its interpretation was reserved for men who were born indeed in a baser age but who, being allotted a nature similar to their master, were the true interpreters of his sublime and mystic speculations. Of education in general, as of jurisprudence in particular, it is all too evident that the spirit is dead and only the letter remains. Those dependent upon it for intellectual sustenance sicken and ultimately become intellectual corpses from whom the rational life has fled. As without the fructifying principle, the germ of potentiality cannot burst its confining walls. So without the higher ethics of philosophy, the seed of divinity resident in man can never be quickened. Only a comprehending soul rendered aware of the luminous realities behind the veil of form through the disciplines of right thinking can dispel those illusions which, like the monsters of a fabled age, guard the aditum of the sacred sciences. The corruption that crept into its ethical institutes was the direct cause of decadence of pagandom. Those custodians of the secret doctrine, the venerable hierophants of the mysteries, left their schools and hide themselves to the remote corners of the earth. Deprived of their inspired leadership, the mysteries became mere mongers of empty words. After courageously passing all the hazardous trials of the ancient rituals, 
The enthusiastic neophyte did not receive at the completion of the rites the promised esoteric knowledge. Sanctimonious priests could only drone garbled fancies or whisper with bated breath elegant nothings in his ear. In the quest for truth, men will risk much. But even the most intrepid soul will hesitate to jeopardize life or limb for such dubious returns. A similar betrayal of trust also awaits the modern seeker after truth. The ends to be gained by modern education are so doubtful that there is much justification for the revolt of youth against a system which, in exchange for some 18 years of application, leaves him as unfitted for life as before. While the social standing of the well-educated man may be a trifle more impressive and his earning capacity exceed that of his less schooled brother, he does not necessarily excel him in an understanding of those deeper issues of life, with which higher education should be, but unfortunately is not, concerned. College men are quite as unhappy as illiterates. In fact, their capacity for sorrow is enlarged, for their curriculum has acquainted them with a legion of miseries to which the uneducated are immune. All too often, schooling complicates uncertainties, multiplies doubts, generates disquietudes, and verifies the growing suspicion that all creation is awry. Instead of solving problems, modern education complicates them. Reacting to this divergence of dictum and tenet, the mind schooled beyond its capacity either rejects them in toto to become a philosophic atheist, or making a show of digesting them becomes unbearably sophisticated. The defection of modern youth from education is more than a surface symptom. The student is content to slip through college with mediocre grades because he is firmly convinced that all the knowledge he can ever hope for to secure is nugatory in solving the imminent problems of his life. Hence, the chief incentive for distinction in scholarship is removed. When the modern college rose as a substitute for the ancient collegia, it fell heir to its task but not to its toga. While the collegia of Greece and Rome were the domiciles of a transcendent learning under the patronage of the gods and heroes, the colleges of today are but hollow imitations of these older and nobler institutions. In comparison to that sublimer knowledge disseminated by these ancient schools, modern houses of learning have become dispensaries of but the husks of knowledge. The illustrious record of the past must not be erased from man's memory. Modern methods, on the other hand, must be recast into a more sufficient mold, for the morbid materialism of this age can only be dispelled by educating the juvenile mind in the principles of higher rationality. In antiquity, the roads of lower education led, like the converging spokes of a wheel, toward the mysteries. Knowledge was then an actuality, and the byways of speculative thought, though torturous, eventually led to the open gates of operative knowing. Those who excelled in temporal education, by right of their superior mentality and integrity, were permitted to enter that inner sanctuary, where the principles of divine knowledge were unfolded. Here the mind was diverted from the course of materiality and initiated into those secrets of spiritual comprehension which bestows tranquility, compassion, and comprehension. Higher education began where lower education ceased, and all who sincerely desired to know were privileged to receive knowledge up to the limits of their own capacity. The arts and sciences of men were revealed to be but outer garments of a divine spirit, the concealments of a superior science, the science of living. Today, all this has been swept aside, and the advanced bodies of learning are unable to confer with more adequate interpretation, for lack of which education necessarily fails. How little true incentive there is for the scholastic greatness when he who has learned all that men can teach finds not but disenchantment in the inadequacy of the whole system. When the masters of a science confess their ignorance on the very principles which are the daily subjects of their speculations, what shall it profit a man to sit at their feet and spend his years in the determination of the exact degree of ignorance possessed by his mentors? It is not possible that man comes into this physical world better fitted to function in harmony with rationality than after passing through what we like to term our course of culture, wherein the divine impulses toward the virtuous and the beautiful are stunted, and the integrity of the nature incurably upset. Man is fortunate indeed if his education does not render him incapable of knowing. 
As Paracelsus might have said, he is best served by education who is least injured by it. A great thinker is one who, by some strange providence, has escaped the pitfalls of mediocrity, unwittingly dug by men to entrap genius. All the world, wrote Emerson, is at hazard when God lets loose a thinker. Humanity seems to fear an intellect which is great enough to destroy our prevalent sense of smugness and complacency. We are naturally inclined toward inertia. Whether comfortably or uncomfortably, we prefer to vegetate. And woe unto him who dares disturb our proletarian serenity. Humanity chooses to languish in the darkness of things as they are, for fear that the godlike splendor of things as they might be will also uncover humanity's foibles and impose the burden of their correction. Knowledge is a responsibility, and responsibility is a term formidable and disquieting. No better epitome of the enslavement of the intellect by education can be found than Alexander Pope's Exoriation of Pedantism in the fourth book of the Dunciad, the Epic of the Dunces. The pedagogues of every land are here personified by a specter whose index finger the virtue of the dreadful wand holds forth, and whose behavioured the pedagogues of every land are here personified by a specter whose index finger the virtue of the dreadful wand holds forth, and whose beavered brow a birchen garland wears. Preceptor of an awful knowledge, the bloodless lips of this spectral doctrinaire speak out the mandates of the superficial. Since man from beast by words is known, words are man's province, words we teach alone. When reason doubtful like the Samian letter, Points him to two ways, the narrower the better. Placed at the door of learning, youth to guide, we never suffer it to stand too wide, to ask, to guess, to know, as they commence, as fancy opens the quick springs of sense. We ply the memory, we load the brain, find rebel wit and double chain on chain, confine the thought to exercise the breath, and keep them in the pale of worlds till death. Whatever the talents, or however designed, we hang one jingling padlock on the mind. How utterly we have become the servants of words, elevating mere terms to the degree of infallibility. While it is fitting that we should regard them as media of intercourse, is there not an understanding which is superior to words? A silent language by which comprehension blends with comprehension? A transcendent mode by which the within, which is you, communes with with the within, which is I, and we together commune with that within, which is all? Do not the stars upon their lofty thrones commune by a strange silence with each other, by wordless tongue and soundless voice uniting in a common knowing, far beyond the ken of mortal apprehension? With upright larynx, does man so greatly excel all other creatures that he shall achieve glory by virtue of his lips alone? If he earns a crown, must he wear it on his tongue? Words are but the infinite diversity of sound, and by many a curious gasp and rattle do we make our whimsies known. We live in a universe of words. Terms and letters continually intervene to become the agencies of endless misunderstanding. As the memorizer of words is not a thinker, so the cloth of philosophic terminology cannot make the philosopher. Words are but names for unknown quantities and conditions. No more. For words are powerless to acquaint us with the inner natures whose qualities they bound. In Genesis, it is declared that Adam went forth and named all creatures, and following his example, men have never ceased to coin appellations with which to designate or describe the objects and conditions of environment. By appropriate terms, the heaven and earth came to be defined, and how different from worldly definition is the comprehending nature of those polynomial powers which founded in eternity, verged toward time, just enough to be vaguely apprehensible. Picture the enlightenment of the proverbial inquisitive schoolboy who, pointing to a growing mystery of leaves and stems, presents his instructor with his poser, Master, what is this living unfolding thing? And he in whom the acumen of the past is presumed to be concentrated can only reply, My boy, that is a tree. The teacher might also very consistently have added, We know it is a tree, for we named it ourselves. Groping after realities, the juvenile mind is confronted with nothing but the limiting, strangling bonds of terms. 
As he passes through the various stages of education, the pupil is familiarized with all the relatively inconsequential opinions we share concerning the subject of trees. Through a cross-section of their trunks, he studies their inner constitution, and with the microscope may see the roots that terminate in hungry mouths, or the infinitely minute life particles that conspire to produce leaf and stem. Yet, of tree itself, the mystery of that intangible something which expands from a tiny seed and surrounds itself with bark, man can discover nothing. Thus, education turns us from the consideration of living realities to cherish the baseless notion of our sires. While the heavenly orbs march on in majestic file to a glorious and unlimited destiny, while the whole universe, celestial and terrestrial, thrills with vibrant actualities and thunders on in accord with cosmic principle, humanity concerns itself with the trivialities of its cultural codes. Men turn their backs upon the midnight sky, whose immensity frightens them and dissipates their bombast, to the infantile task imposed by their culture of choosing the proper fork or frock for a formal banquet. Having familiarized themselves with the degrees of fashion in these respects, such little minds rest upon the oars of petty accomplishment until natural decay returns their ashes to the common mother. Fascinated by the insignificant and bewildered by the real, oblivious to the distant and terrified by the imminent, mortals live by the meanest of their codes and choose mediocrity as the path of ease. The value of present-day education is not to be discounted, but its superficiality is to be condemned. It may have value as a means, but it is wholly inadequate as an end, for it cannot supply that knowledge indispensable to right living. If permeated by a sort of philosophic optimism concerning the ultimates of knowledge, and leavened by the ancient procedures and disciplines, material education could prepare its votaries for those loftier forms of learning for lack of which the nations perish. So long as education assumes that knowledge beyond its own prescribed domain is unavailable, it is false to the great need of humanity. Unfortunately, this is the assumption prevalent in the bodies of so-called higher learning. Ridicule is heaped upon the ancients for their superstitions. The esoteric doctrines are declared to have been idle rumors generated in the perfervid imaginations of unbalanced fanatics who were consequently branded charlatans, adventurers, and impostors. Mindful of the claims of consistency, should we not condemn as impostors those schools which supply mere notions in lieu of actual knowledge and declare the individual to be educated, though totally ignorant of every vital issue of existence? Graduates of modern educational institutions are presented with impressive diplomas, which too often are the most tangible evidence of scholastic attainment. In his discourse on initiation, Hermes elucidates to his son, Tashian, the subject of spiritual education. The oration moves rhythmically and majestically upon the theme of appreciation, and may be summed up in a single thought that appreciation for universal good is the beginning of wisdom. Education is here revealed as the discipline whereby man is rendered capable of appreciating divine order and made susceptible to its redeeming impulses. Tashian is instructed by his immortal father in the discovery of God in these words. If thou wouldst contemplate the Creator even in perishable things, in things which are on the earth or in the deep, reflect, O my son, on the formation of man in his mother's womb. Contemplate carefully the skill of the workman. Learn to know him according to the divine beauty of the work. Who formed the orb of the eye? Who pierced the openings of the nostrils and of the ears? Who made the mouth to open? who traced out the channels of the veins, who made the bones hard, who covered the flesh with skin, who separated the fingers and the toes, who made the feet broad, who hollowed out the pores, who spread out the spleen, who formed the heart like a pyramid, who made the sides wide, who formed the caverns of the lungs, who made the honorable parts of the body conspicuous and concealed the others. See how much skill is bestowed in one species of matter, how much labor on one single work, Everywhere there is beauty, everywhere perfection, everywhere variety. Who made all these things? Who is the mother? Who is the father? If it be not the only and invisible God. Who is the mother? Who is the father? If it be not the only and invisible God, who has created all things by his will. 
Alcibiades, the Greek patrician who nursed within his breast senatorial aspirations, submitted to an inventory of his mental and ethical qualifications at the hands of Socrates, who thereupon demonstrated that the sole asset of the youth consisted of a vague proficiency in strumming the lyre, the ability to recite poetry not too badly, and an indifferent prowess in the gymnasium. Holding up the mirror of rationality before Alcibiades, Socrates convinced the would-be guardian of the sovereignty of Athens that he lacked sufficient intelligence to administer his own affairs, let alone those of the Athenian commonwealth. Times have changed since those golden days when skeptic and peripatetic roamed the Athenian byways, but the spirit of Alcibiades still lives. What matters it if his lyre has now become the saxophone? his quote, and javelin, the ball and bat, and his poetic fancies chiefly concerned with caroling the virtues of his alma mater. The 20th century Alcibiades still goes forth full of purpose, but woefully empty of knowledge, and for lack of a Socrates may actually become a senator, and tax the resources of providence to preserve the integrity of the commonwealth. The universalization of education opportunity is the exalted purpose of today. The body politic enthusiastically supports every issue which encourages and facilitates the promulgation of learning. Impressive institutions for the instruction of the young are the civic pride of every community, and like the cathedrals of medieval Europe, shadow the teeming city spread out around them. We have deified education and built temples to the spirit of wisdom, even as antiquity gilded shrines for the gods of yore. Nevertheless, to us, education is still but a word, a wonderful word, truly implying all that is noble, all that is beautiful, all that is true. Yet how far does the practice fall short on the premise? How vast the interval between the implication and the fact? The education for which men have even given their lives and which they have preserved at fearful cost through the world's dark ages. The education which the seekers of every age have sought with whole-souled longing. The education that was the very bounty of the gods and the evidence of their perfect covenant with men. This education has failed from the earth. Knowledge has retired again into that Stygian darkness from which the first philosophers called it forth by strange rite and sacrificial deed. We live in a day of material enlightenment. But profound indeed is our ethical and philosophic benightedness. There is a supreme educator, an all-knowing preceptor, an all-wise counselor, an all-sufficient guide, whose integrity dwarfs that of any mortal man, deep in the inner recesses of our own souls, but obscured by the hallucinations of the senses, is Mercury's inexhaustible pitcher, an infinite capacity which, though ever-flowing, is ever full. Man's only educator is this inner self, which alone is capable of sifting fact from fancy. The drawing forth of this inner knowledge and its establishment as the ever-sufficient and comprehending director of the outer life is the true office of education. Educo, then, signifies to draw forth, and education is that mental process of the outer mind by which is evoked as though by magic the mighty genius that, like a sleeping giant, is man's unsuspected strength. Truth, then, comes from within, fancies from without. And never will education fully solve the problems that are its peculiar province until it equips unfolding manhood and womanhood with the keys by which this treasure house of inner potentialities may be unlocked. As through a glass darkly can even now be glimpsed that tomorrow of education when, grasping with fuller realization the purpose of its own existence, the school assumes the fullness of its role by becoming the dispenser of those disciplines by which man may release the greater thinker within. How removed from the frenzied searcher after temporal knowledge is the calm and certain master of the hidden path? The philosopher does not gaze at the stars through man-made telescopes alone, but by the transcendency of his internal faculties he is lifted up and taken into the very soul of the star itself. He feels its life throbbing through him, and from his place within its very heart he learns its innermost secrets mingling through his inner self with the inner selves of all things. The truly educated one thus exchanges vain fancy and speculation for the perfect understanding. 
The soul in him communes with the soul in his world, and both share in a common felicity. He sees, he senses, and he feels, thus coming into possession of countless esoteric secrets, which, though his very own, he cannot impart to others, nor even explain to that inferior self which is in bondage to the sphere of ignorance. Chapter 15. Symbolism, the Universal Language A symbol is a form designed to portray some abstract quality. A symbol must convey an impression. It must cause the mind to see something which, though not actually in the symbol itself, is suggested by the symbol. Through the familiar is thus shadowed forth the unfamiliar. Through the commonplace, that which is not commonplace is made evident. Symbols are forms, but the principles for which they stand so transcend the boundaries of form that they can only be sensed by reading into the symbol certain abstract elements, or by grasping with internal comprehension that greater profundity, which the symbol does not contain, but whose existence it intimates. Symbols are forms, but the principles for which they stand so transcend the boundaries of form that they can only be sensed by reading into the symbol certain abstract elements, or by grasping with internal comprehension that greater profundity, which the symbol does not contain, but whose existence it intimates. Symbols are also employed to epitomize. A whole universe may be summarized in a single star, and vast issues by being reduced to their simple elements may be rendered intelligible. By clothing the unfamiliar in terms of the familiar, the mind is enabled to grasp with a certain measure of accuracy the significance of the unknown. We must re-emphasize the point stressed in our opening chapter, namely, that as symbols increase in complexity, they decrease in power. Thus, the simple figures set forth immensities, the compound figures, parvitudes. Increasing definition causes qualities to verge toward form. Hence, the more intricate the figure, the more it is concerned with particulars, and the narrower becomes the scope of its symbolism. One of the true purposes of symbols is to preserve ideas in an indefinite state, so that their lucidity shall not be obscured by unnecessary form involvement. Between symbolism and character, there is a slight fundamental difference, as a personality may often be most truthfully depicted by the exaggeration of certain characteristics. So symbols may convey an adequate likeness of a quality and still no appreciable way resemble the quality. In the last analysis, man is not simply a body, but rather a bundle of characteristics which confer upon his objective nature a certain temperament or individuality. By deftly accentuating the idiosyncrasies of character with a few heartless lines, the characterist exposes the deformities of rationality and thus portrays the man as he really is. The art of character follows certain cardinal principles in recognition, the impressions innate of forms and orders. Breadth, for example, is always associated with optimism, length with pessimism. Hence, to broaden the head gives the impression of mental sufficiency, or broad-mindedness. To broaden the body suggests a certain substantiality. To narrow the head causes the impression of intolerance or narrowness of outlook. To lengthen the body oppresses the mind with a feeling of melancholy. Angles convey the impression of strength, curves of beauty. Harmonious combination of angles and curves invoke concord. And harmonious combinations produce discord. Definite reactions are thus produced by simple lines or combinations of lines. Colors and sounds also possess similar powers of mental and emotional stimulation. Consciously or unconsciously, the shape and arrangement of bodies with which we come in close contact thus profoundly influence our dispositions. Definite mental reactions are caused by contemplation of the symmetrical Pythagorean solids. For all natural bodies contain a force generated by their own organization, which leaves its subtle record on the inner sensibilities of man. By accentuating this force according to a definite procedure, certain mental attitudes can be stimulated. And in recognition of this principle, the mysteries recommend that their initiates meditate upon certain emblems or figures prepared with this end in view. In common with the laws of character, symbolism secures emphasis by distortion, harmony by conventionalization, and force by simplicity. 
In great measure, art is the process of elimination. Symbolism reveals the necessary by eliminating the unnecessary, and emphasizes the real by discarding the superficial, which obscures the real. In this respect, symbolism verges towards the diagrammatic, for through diagrams, processes are made evident. Phenomena, when stripped of its outer part, reveals the laws by which it exists and manifests. Being chiefly concerned with those few primary principles which are the basis of infinite diversity, philosophy finds in symbolism not only a language singularly qualified to disseminate fundamental premises, but a method whereby universal ideas are communicated without passing them through the sphere of particulars. Symbolism thus embodies most fully the requisites of the perfect medium of education. Every symbol is a definite stimulus to the mind and has the delightful faculty of reflecting the moods of the mind, attempting to analyze its parts. In other words, a symbol always means what we think it means. Dealing with incorporeal substance, it takes on chameleon-like the interpretive attitudes of its interpreter. Through the symbols, the individual thus discovers not what symbols mean, but rather what he knows himself. In the effort to understand what the first symbolist concealed under his figures, the resources of the mind are stimulated to reveal their own fecundity. Thus, emblematic figures and fables draw out from the individual, analyzing them the sum and substance of his own understanding. By studying the symbols, men learn about themselves for they read into the figures their own hopes and aspirations, their own concepts of universal order, and their own understanding of divine agency. To some degree, is thus explained the diversity of codes by which the affairs of men are regulated. Life itself is a symbol, and each must interpret it according to the convictions of his own soul. As we look about, we see a universe which, whether we know it or not, is simply our inner convictions reflected back to us from the polished surface of nature. In Lazarus Laughed, Eugene O'Neill causes his hero to thus taunt Gaius Caligula, the heir of Tiberius Caesar. But what do you matter, O deathly important one? Put yourself that question as a gesture. Are you a speck of dust danced in the wind? Then laugh, dancing. Laugh, yes, to your insignificance. Thereby will be born your new greatness. Tragic is the plight of the tragedian, whose only audience is himself. Life is for each man a solitary cell whose walls are mirrors. Terrified is Caligula by the faces he makes. But I tell you to laugh in the mirror, that seeing your life gay, you may begin to live as a guest, and not as a condemned one. The non-philosophic suffer from a disease which may be termed superficiality. Man's thinking ever fails because of its shallowness. He often mistakes breadth for depth, believing that with but a hasty scrutiny, he can become familiar with any object. Superficiality generally springs from indifference and necessarily produces mediocrity. Our interests ever lie with the familiar, and for the unfamiliar we have no emotion save indifference. By stimulating interest, philosophy causes man to regard an ever-widening circle of incident as a proper field for his speculation. Thus the man, formerly oblivious to the wonders of the universe about him, suddenly comes to realize their existence, and with growing enthusiasm applies himself to the garnering of knowledge. The study of symbolism causes the mind to develop what may be defined as philosophic suspicion. Instead of accepting things at their face value, The symbolist searches for their hidden motives, those invisible agencies which are the animate cause of apparently inanimate objects. When the mind comes instinctively to regard forms as the outer garments of realities, great strides have been taken in the rationalization of the entire nature. Man begins to know as soon as he divests himself of the illusion that the universe is material and matter the divine reality. From this realization, it is but a step to the comprehension that truth does not exist in matter, but must be sought for behind the veil of matter. The physical or irrational mind is incapable of comprehending a single absolute fact, for abiding in the sphere of relative conclusions, it necessarily lacks the accuracy of exact procedure. Symbolism discloses the relationship of an intangible agent to its tangible subject. It renders conceivable that interval between the invisible which is the fact, and the visible, which is the fancy. Even a photograph is fanciful, 
and misleading when compared to a cleverly drawn character. For when the character may be slightly resemble the physical appearance, it is still more discerning than the camera's eye. Our physical personalities thus reveal us as we seem to be, but our intangible individualities continually reveal us as we are. Unfortunately for others, but comfortable for ourselves, the number able to read the intangible characteristics are few, otherwise our mortification would overwhelm us. Yet, in reality, our truest friend is the one who points out to us that which it is so difficult for us to estimate for ourselves, namely the quality and compatibility of our intangible parts. Symbolism should be employed throughout the process of education, for by it two definite ends are attainable. First, the student will instinctively reveal to the teacher the constitution of his reasoning part by the interpretation he places upon the symbols. Second, the student will be stimulated to originality and thereby preserve the peculiar technique of his own rational processes. The death of originality is the death of genius. Symbolism encourages originality and hence is productive of genius. Symbols can be devised to induce almost any desired phase of thought or emotion by the use of emblematic figures alone. Abnormality can be corrected and subnormality raised to a normal state. Paracelsus discovered that words written upon parchment when held up before animals produce as definite results as though the words were spoken, although it is evident that the animal cannot read. Combinations of letters, magical symbols, and curious figures radiate definite impressions, and from the realization of this fact must ultimately emerge a new form of corrective therapy in which the medicine will be administered through the channel of sight. The eyes are peculiarly responsive, and the process of visualization already borders upon the psychic. For the impressions transmitted by the eyes to the brain are exceedingly subtle and powerful beyond imagination. The reactions set up through the sight of definite forms or patterns have not yet been thoroughly catalogued. When this work is finished, we will understand far more intelligently the motives producing joy and sorrow, sickness and health, vice and virtue. The environments contacted by the individual through the medium of the eyes mold him profoundly, and even his status in the world itself is a key to the temperaments that surge within his breast. In his general introduction to psychoanalysis, Freud attempts to relate certain primitive motives of the soul with dreams, in this way disclosing a subconscious faculty of association in the human mind by which external objects through either appearance or use, become media for the expression of psychic impulses. Freud is dealing with what Plato would call the animal soul, that part of the psychic nature which has assumed the idea of generation, and which constitutes the ceaseless urge toward the establishment of forms. Obsessed with the idea of polarity, the generating soul causes to flow from itself those impulses which Freud analyzes under the general subject of sex psychology. He maintains that the peculiar soul power, which manifests while the functioning organism is asleep, is concerned primarily with the principles of generation, and the sleep symbols are largely of a phallic nature. This is incontestable evidence that the earliest religions of mankind were priapic cults, and based upon the generating urge of the soul, clothing itself in appropriate forms. This impulse resulted in strange fables and figures which are now almost disassociated from the primary impulses that inspired them. Though having but few interests, the animal soul often employs a diversity of symbols to signify its attitudes. Thousands of emblems and figures are used to represent a single idea. The animal soul is interested in neither religion nor philosophy, and our mental concepts are its playthings. The animal soul is primarily concerned with the laws of attraction and reproduction. Its duty is to perpetuate the species, and it knows no ethics beyond this limited field. Freud infers that dream symbols can be reduced to a very simple alphabet of symbolism. Clothing its urges in the familiar, the soul creates its alphabet during physical infancy and childhood, and retains it throughout life. As humanity thus preserves in its religion and philosophy the simple elements which dominated its attitudes during most primitive periods, so the adult man or woman clothes these soul impulses in those figures and similes, which were impressed upon the outer nature during adolescence. 
It is comparatively easy to understand how most symbols come to have a phallic import. All forms are generations, and all generations are emblematic of the processes by which they themselves come into being. To the individual who functions in the animal nature, that is, where the rational soul has not disengaged itself from the involvements of the corporeal senses, there is no sphere of interpretation above that of generation. To those who by the disciplines and procedures of the higher life have transmuted or regenerated their inferior natures, a loftier sphere of interpretation is rendered apprehensible. Transcending the idea of generation, the philosopher discovers in the symbol a meaning more exalted than that concerned with reproductive processes. Not only is there an animal soul which clings tenaciously to form, but there is also the divine, rational soul which verges ever toward reality. Above that part which conceives generation to be the supreme function, there is that which contemplates the deathlessness and permanence of the supreme good. Realizing that divinity is ungenerate and transcends in every respect the limitations of mortal procedure. Symbols consequently change their meanings according to the level of intelligence upon which their interpreter functions. The purpose of symbols is to uncover the limitations of mortal consciousness by continually emphasizing the insufficiency of the interpretations placed upon them. Confronted by a symbol, every man recognizes the uncertainties of his own nature. Being never sure that he is correct in his interpretation, he is made to realize his heritage in that common uncertainty, shared by all ages and all men. The insufficiency of modern so-called knowledge is evident the moment the mind is invited to reflect upon problems involving certitudes. Thus faced, the intellect hesitates and becomes confused. Our thinking is sufficient until it becomes necessary to trust ourselves to its mercy when it retires abashed, informing us unmistakably of its incapacity. The paradox of knowledge is that knowledge does not exist, for we claim already that which in reality we are searching. Modern knowledge is not a discovery of facts, but the effort to discover facts. And there are great moments when the truth of this apparent contradiction is brought home to us. There's a popular fallacy that we grow by change. Like the ironic method described and employed by Socrates, change is inseparable from the elements of pain and sorrow. We advance but slowly when every new discovery must contradict those gone before, when every new philosopher must give the lie to his predecessors, and every new order depends for its success upon the destruction of previous orders. A little apple tree does not change into a lemon tree while in the process of becoming a big apple tree nor does truth change its identity in the process of being understood. Every great mind evolves by a sequential process. It does not tear down previous conclusions to make room for a new. A growing tree increases from a single shoot to a miracle of branches and foliage. Yet nowhere is there any inconsistency or contradiction in the process. The trunk is not destroyed, that a new branch may come forth, nor is the tree uprooted to make room for its own fruit. Each manifestation depends upon that which preceded it, and in turn finds its consummation in that which issues from it. In the first quickening of its seed, the tree moves inevitably toward a single end. At every step of the way, its procedures complement each other and unite in the realization of that end. This perfect cooperation of parts results not only in the tree maintaining its homogeneity and attaining its end with the least expenditure of energy and time, but demonstrates the exactness of the power that willed it into being. Never will the world think well until men reason as trees grow, causing to issue from the single trunk of rational certainty the foliage of thoughts which, clustered symmetrically about their center, impart grace and dignity to the whole. In their ignorance men make laws, only later to find them faulty. Then, lest their infractions of these laws seem too flagrant, they amend their former errors with fresh errors in the effort to render their own conceits endurable. Various schisms in the body of religion seek to mollify their differences by resorting to condescension or modification. Their compromises, however, are a glaring confession that neither possesses enough fact to ensure survival. So age after age, man, who according to the pagan astrologers was fashioned under the influences of cancer, 
still demonstrates his kinship to the crab by making most of his progress in a backward fashion. It is more than a seven days wonder that institutions of importance have to be saved from extinction by periodic renovation or have their authority curbed lest their intolerance overshadow and endanger personal or national liberties. Philosophy declares that the first step in the development of rational powers is to establish them upon an immovable foundation so that the mind in its unfoldment will not be forced periodically to overthrow previous attitudes, but continually to supplement and justify them. To realize this ideal, it is necessary that the first postulations of the intellect shall be vast enough or sufficient in scope so that all subsequent thinking will not be forced to exceed the boundaries of these first assumptions. Men waste a lifetime devising new methods of thought, only to realize at the end that they have outgrown their own premises, that their building is top-heavy, and that the architectonics of intellect, their edifice of theories, is grotesque and inharmonious. As all the agencies of the tree conspire to consummate its purpose, namely fruitage, so all the agencies of thought conspire to produce the fruitage of the mind. Lacking the wisdom of the tree, man all too often finds his roots and trunks structurally too insecure to bear the weight of the ripening fruit. The eclectic spirit prevalent in this century is largely responsible for this condition. Men do not think their thoughts through. Viewing a fractional part of an idea, they are content with its apparent consistency, failing to realize that it may have no place at all in the greater picture composed of infinite ideas, combined in most complex patterns. We do not apply Immanuel Kant's critique by which he measured the justifiableness of assumptions. We might ask ourselves, if the whole universe were run by the same principles as my own little notions, would the world still be sufficient to meet the needs of the vast order which it maintains? If my little whim were elevated to the dignity of a divine reality, would it serve all men? If my thoughts were laws, would there be justice in creation? These are the questions which intrude their presence upon the mind seeking to think things through, often to their bitter end. It is not sufficient that an idea should tickle our sensibilities or give us a pleasant emotional thrill. It is necessary that the idea should stand the acid test of analysis. It must survive the heartless process of thinking through. We say heartless for a few notions, except that they proceed from rationalities so noble that notions have become permissible to them, can survive even the first stages of analysis. Symbolism re-emphasizes the necessity of approaching every issue with an adequate philosophic background. Confront the untrained mind with some symbol or fable, and it will construct a confused and meaningless explanation, usually far more complex than the figure warrants, and as useless as a macaw's chatter. Few of us have had the success of Samuel Johnson in protecting the intellect against the assault of words. In the preface to his dictionary, he writes, I am not yet so lost in lexicography as to forget that words are the daughters of the earth and that things are the sons of heaven. The superficial thinker reasons in terms of words alone. The profound thinker so venerates the meaning of words that he conserves his language. We must all realize that it is beyond man's province to comprehend one-third of what he says and sacrilegious to talk much with little understanding. Whereas the mediocre intellect is capable of ministering to physical needs, it is decreed that in the more exalted realms of rationality, the mediocre shall pass into the oblivion of the disqualified. Man can never hope to escape the limitations of his own irrationality. Whenever he attempts to transcend himself, his insufficiency blocks his way. The struggle must ever be to overcome insufficiency, to establish within the self an intellectual adequacy in which the mind acquires a competency for its problems. Symbolism stimulates the healthy mind that has been introduced to the disciplines of philosophy, but bewilders the unorganized thinker. No mind is really sufficient for its own needs until it has learned to act as a connective tissue between ideas. Isolated thoughts are comparatively valueless, for the probability of error is too imminent. An impractical thought, then, is one that can survive only in an isolated state. A practical thought, one that survives repeated contact with competitive ideas. To study symbols is dangerous for the immature mind. 
for the practice will only compound absurdities and establish more firmly irrational habits of thought. Hence, the ancient mysteries circulated among the masses definite interpretations of their symbols and allegories, encouraging the untrained thinker to accept these expositions and wonder no more on the subject. Had this not been done, a wild orgy of misinterpretation would have followed, and erroneous speculations without number would have found lodgment in minds, incapable of recognizing and protecting themselves against these incongruities. Thus, in symbolism, the profound investigator will discover that the real is ever concealed beneath the superficial. He who is contended with the superficial will consequently never discover the real. And so from age to age, the arcana of ancient philosophy have been preserved inviolate at the hands of the unprepared. These secrets are their own custodians, revealing themselves only to such as refuse to accept any substitute for truth or any part of knowledge less than all. Two oft-repeated questions are, why is it so easy to deceive people in matters pertaining to religion or philosophy? And why are the best educated the most gullible? The answer to the first is self-evident. Theology and philosophy are sciences dealing with intangibles. There is no criterion by which the integrity can be questioned or established, save that of a rational mind qualified by its own integrity to weigh and pass judgment upon the elements involved. These divine sciences so completely transcend the limitations of the sense perceptions by which mortal concerns are estimated that every code of physical integrity is inapplicable to them. There's nothing tangible and evident with which to associate these abstruse verities, and the investigator must appoint himself their inquisitor. As all life's great realities exist in this intangible sphere, which we like to term the invisible or causal universe, the problems of existence can never be actually solved except by the exploring faculties of the rationalized intellect. The second question is based upon the unfortunate fact that education, while in some instances increasing the tolerant attitude, all too often fails to increase the integrity so that it can properly direct tolerance. The educated man is usually one who has been instructed in the enormity of his own ignorance and is therefore inclined to believe that anything may be true. On the other hand, the uneducated man is generally very set in his opinions and hence difficult to convince even of demonstrable facts. A scientist is frequently a disillusioned man. He has been undeceived as to the sufficiency of knowledge and is correspondingly gullible. Camille Flammarion declared that there was but one attitude of the mind more dangerous than that which accepted everything. Namely, the attitude that accepted nothing. The materialist who understands practically nothing believes practically nothing. The ignorant must ultimately become his own executioner. Thus, the struggle for knowledge becomes identical with the struggle for survival. For only knowledge ensures survival. We are as permanent as the realities that have come to be established in our own natures. We are as impermanent as the fancies that incline us one way or another, only to eventually leave us as ignorant as before. The rational faculties are man's sole hope of ultimate accomplishment, and this accomplishment is identical with happiness. For the changes necessary to establish harmonious physical relationships must first descend from the rational sphere and come into the physical manifestation through minds specially trained in philosophic procedure. Every child that is born is a potential instrument for the salvation of the world and remains an unknown but all-powerful quantity until our physical cultural processes destroy these sensitive instruments of crudition by which the imperceptible verities of the rational sphere can be sensed. Humanity's most precious assets are those developing physical brains, which as focal centers of mental energy radiate thought throughout the substances of the inferior sphere. The answer to every problem, therefore, must be considered as existing in the rational sphere, awaiting the day when unfolding human brains shall be so disciplined in the procedures of rational thought as to become adequate vehicles for the manifestation of this superior knowledge in the physical world. Rendered prophetic by the luminosity of their inner natures, the sages of antiquity discoursed with rare acumen upon the fate of the sacred sciences at the hands of generations then unborn. 
In the Asclepian dialogue, has preserved a prophetic picture of the decadence of knowledge in baser ages to come. In those days, no one shall look up to heaven. The religious man shall be accounted insane. The irreligious shall be thought wise, the furious brave, and the worst of men shall be considered a good man, for the soul and all things about it by which it is either naturally immortal or conceives that it shall attain to immortality, conformably to what I have explained to you, shall not only be the subject of laughter, but shall be considered as vanity. Believe me, likewise, that a capital punishment shall be appointed for him who applies himself to the religion of intellect. New statutes and new laws shall be established, and nothing religious or which is worthy of heaven or celestial concerns shall be heard or believed by the mind. There will be a lamentable departure of the gods from men. Noxious angels will alone remain, who being mingled with human nature will violently impel the miserable men of that time to war, to repine, to fraud, and to everything contrary to the nature of the soul. Much of this prophecy has already been verified, for during the Dark Ages, capital punishment was meted out to those who dared apply themselves to the religion of intellect. Philosophy was swept from the face of Christendom, and the voices of the gods were drowned out by the hymns of the martyrs. Fleeing before theological fanaticism, the custodians of the Arcana Imperi took refuge in the Arabian desert, finding Islam more receptive to philosophic instruction. Accepting Greek philosophy as a sacred trust, the sons of the prophet, when carried into southern Europe on the high tides of their fortunes, established in Spain universities far excelling contemporary Christian institutions of learning. To the colleges of the Moors came scholars from every part of Europe, and the lips of men again taught the inspired doctrines of Plato and Aristotle. Islam realized that the teachings of Plato and his illustrious disciple assisted man to liberate his soul from the entanglements of idolatry. For the four caliphs had set for themselves the task of exterminating idolatry from the earth. Proclus declares that the philosophy of Plato was given to men for the benefit of their terrestrial souls that philosophy might be authority instead of statutes, rationality instead of temples, understanding instead of sacred institutions, truth instead of mortal leaders of salvation, that the men who are now, as well as those who shall exist hereafter, might not wander about the earth destitute of intelligence. The literalist is an inveterate profaner of the beautiful. His attitude is a supreme blasphemy, for his art is to limit all natures to the narrow confines of form. He sees nothing beyond appearance, mistaking the outward show for an inner quality in the dimensional as the only certainty, whereas the idealist ever strives to elevate man to the estate of gods. The literalist would drag the immortals from their Olympian heights and debase them with the similitude of man. The literalist emphasizes inconsequentials. To him, every jot and tittle is a fetish. To the literalist, symbolism is inscrutable, for he is incapable of distinguishing between principle as an abstract reality and form as the transitory vehicle of that principle. Religious stagnation is the wayward child of literalism. As long as theology clings to the blasphemous idea that to think is to usurp a divine prerogative, theologians are restrained from reasoning on the logic of the law and only the saints are accredited with sufficient sanctity to contemplate the scandal thongs of the Lord. Quaking under their cowls, the pious clergy read and reread the ominous lines from Revelation, wherein it is written, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Little wonder that the divine science of interpretation failed amid such hostile environment that symbols became fearful images of literal terrors, and the gods came to have as many hairs in their beards as some inspired artisan might carve into their Carrara features. Mamonides, the most learned of the rabbins, who devoted a lifetime to contemplation of the scriptures, writes thus of its hidden meaning and secret imports, We should not take literally that which is written in the book of creation, Genesis, nor entertain the same concepts of it as are common with the vulgar. If it were otherwise, our learned ancient sages would not have taken so much pains to conceal the sense, and to keep before the eyes of the uninstructed the veil of allegory, which conceals the truth which it contains. 
Taken literally, the work contains the most extravagant and absurd ideas of the deity. Whoever can guess at the true meaning should take care not to divulge it. This is a maxim inculcated by our wise men, especially in connection with the work of the six days. It is possible that by our own intelligence or by the aid of others, some may guess the true meaning, in which case they should be silent respecting it, or if they do speak of it, they should do so obscurely, as I myself do, leaving the rest to be guessed at by those who have sufficient ability to understand me. While the literalist may believe that he is defending the integrity of the gods, he is actually detracting from their magnificence by presuming them to be the speakers of words when in reality they are disseminators of ideas. Origen asks, What man of good sense will ever persuade himself that there had been a first, a second, and a third day, and that these days have each of them had their morning and their evening, when there was yet neither sun nor moon nor stars? Even the great St. Augustine admitted the scriptures to possess profound and unsuspected meanings, at the same time maintaining with characteristic inconsistency that both their literal and historical accuracy should be affirmed. We shall yet realize that man cannot live by history alone, even though that history be declared sacrosanct. To studious Christian and pagan alike, symbolism becomes a philosophic stone, whereby literal absurdities are transmuted into allegorical realities. While little minds may thus thread their way through religion, those of greater vision, recognizing in symbolism a golden key to the treasure house of the world's thought, studiously apply themselves to the principles according to which all fables, allegories, and emblematic figures are erected. Another phase of symbolism presents itself for consideration. The literalities of one generation become the allegories of the next. The changing customs, the periodic redirectionalizing of interest, and the reinterpretation of the meanings of words and figures make it most difficult for any generation to understand its forebears. Hence, to interpret the ideas of one century in terms of another is to lose a certain intangible atmosphere, which cannot survive the vicissitudes of time. Consequently, to secure an accurate translation of Greek philosophic writing does not necessarily imply that we possess the information embodied in those writings. It has been said that no philosophy can survive translation, for no sacred teaching can ever be actually understood except by one able to transport himself into the locale and time in which the material was originally indicted. Hence arose the practice of perpetuating the inner doctrines through oral tradition, for it was presumed that each generation would reclothe these basic ideas with proper vestments and thus preserve them free from distortion at the hands of time. To understand the mysteries, we must cease to live in America of the 20th century and assume the temperaments, attitudes, interests, and environments in which the mysteries were first established. To understand Greek philosophy, we must understand ancient Greece and its people. The secret teachings are always clothed in the terms of the familiar when revealed to the multitudes, and the familiar terms of yesterday are not the familiar terms of today. The same is true of the Bible. The archaic Hebrew of the pre-Christian period interpreted the ideals of the older people, of whom not one true vestige now remains. The Pentateuch is the living remnant of a world long dead, of interests which have outlived their time, of attitudes archaic and ethics extinct. If we would release the spirit of beauty locked within the ancient characters and make it serve this generation, we must divest it of its ancient robes and reclothe it in the familiar habiliments of today. With rare discrimination, we must separate the principle from its form, the living from the dead, the eternal from the temporal. Only the symbolist has developed that fine faculty of dividing the relevant from the irrelevant and prudently preserving that which is usable. As the archaeologist sifting the ashes of dead civilization recovers therefrom priceless evidence of things no longer evident, so the symbolist, studiously examining the intellectual remains of vanished orders, rescues from oblivion those fragments of rationality which will contribute to the right thinking of the world. As the earth is built up of geologic strata, the rot of millenniums, so the body of world thought is composed of an infinite number of layers, 
in each of which may be seen the half-disintegrated remains of vast institutions and noble intellectual procedures. In things of the mind, the past has not lived in vain. Those who live best today live by the world's first thoughts, and the foolish of today still commit the same grave errors that the first philosophers decried. There is no such thing as modernism in human thought, for minds have labored since the beginning, and the world's first thinker reasoned out the same problems which the world's last sage must ponder. The future will perpetuate the quest of the past, and tomorrow is but the knowledge of today plus an added period for contemplation. A few simple rules will be of value to those desirous of assuming the mantle of philosophy. There are many queer pockets in its ancient folds and only when they are investigated in order will their contents prove of highest value. It is well being said that there are tricks in every trade. These tricks are a certain knowing how by which accomplishment is facilitated. In accordance with the ancient Pythagorean law, it is first necessary to establish the triangle before the solution of any problem is possible. The science of symbolism is accordingly based upon a threefold premise. Once the mind is familiarized with this triangular foundation, Integrity and industry will discover the correct solution. First, every substance, object, element, and agent in the universe is capable of instructing man in those phases of divine order, which are involved in its own constitution. In other words, everything can teach us of itself, and as all natures differ from each other to greater or lesser degree, each performs a definite ministry of instruction. From an earnest consideration of their constitutions and procedures, man is enabled to familiarize himself with those laws of being, to which he himself is also subject. Second, the more fully an individual is acquainted with the operations of the inferior universe, the better qualified he is to contemplate the constitution of the causal spheres. This is a development of the hermetic axiom of analogy, namely, that the above is like the below and the below is like the above. The knowledge of inferiors is necessary to the knowledge of superiors. The danger arising, however, from the analysis of inferiors is that the mind may form an attachment for them and thus be rendered incapable of turning from them to the consideration of superiors. Third, all natures should be regarded as worthy of profound analysis, for the deadly enemy of all proficiency is a superficial attitude toward any phase of existence. The true source of man's education is not to be found in books, but lies in his observation of natural phenomena and his attempt to estimate its significance. Failure to regard any object as worthy of particular attention is to lose the opportunity to understand the superphysical function or characteristic which is intangible but all-powerful cause of the object itself. Symbolism, when thus regarded, is elevated to the dignity of a religion. Or more correctly, it becomes the means to that end of religion. To the philosophic atheist, symbolism occupies the middle ground between knowledge and ignorance. Becoming the divine instructor through whom the mysteries of the inner spheres are made apparent to the outer sense perceptions. Thus, instead of waiting for the heavens to open and permit an angelic visitant to deliver homilies from an ambo supported by some cumulus cloud, the symbolist liberates, through rational procedure, the ideas resident in form. These ideas thus freed preach their own silent but all informative sermons. To the one capable of discerning God, deity is omnipresent in his own handiworks. The philosopher is the continual recipient of divine revelation, and the gods are proximate indeed to that illumined sage who sees God in the fire and hears him in the wind. The Phrygian dactyls, physicians by magic, employed symbols because of the remarkable therapeutic powers they possessed. The figures drawn upon parchment and papyrus or carved into the forms of medallions or talismans were applied to the diseased members or attached to the persons of the sick, and thus by necromantic means dislodged the evil agencies conspiring to drive the spirit from its infected nature. Paracelsus, who secured from the Arabians many secrets of pagan theurgy, describes in detail the remedial agencies reposing in the ancient metals and their alloys, particularly electrum. Of the virtues of electrum, which he declared to be composed of the seven planetary metals, the great Swiss physician writes, Vessels fashioned from electrum render their contents safe from poison and from sorcery, for this alloy has great sympathy for the human race. 
The ancients fashioned from this mystical substance rings, bracelets, medals, seals, figures, bowls, and mirrors, all possessing most wonderful virtues. A ring formed of electrum and worn upon the finger will cure lameness, paralysis, and the epilepsy. I have seen a ring of electrum put on the ring or heart finger of a person afflicted with a secret disease. The ring immediately began to sweat and became spotted and even went out of shape with sympathy for the sufferer. Forms, declared the mysteries, possess strange virtues, and the tracing of these forms intensifies these virtues and renders them potent ministrants to human ills. The Idean fingers of the Samothracians and other curious effigies of human members were magnetized with medicinal virtues and possessed by a spirit whose strength was sufficient to avert plagues or pestilences and liberate the flesh from all manner of infirmity. Not only was it essential that these devices be made out of the proper substances, but they must be fashioned into definite shapes, commodious to the astral light which, flowing through the symbol, was conjured thereby to manifest as a preservative or curative agent. Manipulated by the Hierophant, the Patars, who received their wisdom through a keyhole, these models and figures became as though alive. They were charged as with an electric current, at times glowing or radiating showers of sparks and miniature lightning flashes. As forms are the projections of invisible forces, so their artificial construction invokes invisible natures adapted to their geometric patterns. These supermundanes ensoul the objects and lend their power to the magus, whose knowledge is sufficient to control them. This explains the strange phenomenon of the talking images, the vocal mechanisms of the ancients, the urns of prophecy, and the nature of oracles, or even openings in the earth, apertures and walls, and the concavities of vessels, became the abode of genie conformable to those cavities. Moving within their appointed vents and orifices, these spirits caused the phenomenon of winds and strange sounds in sealed amorphi and subterranean crypts. Such forces are too intangible, however, for mortal perception, unless by secret rituals the genie have been invested with a certain amount of terrestrial substance. We shall yet rediscover the secrets of the talking urns that spoke with the voice of ages and through whose lips issued the words of men long dead. By this the ancients did not infer that the dead spoke through these urns, but rather that the words spoken during the lifetime of these men had been preserved in the subtler ethers of cosmos and through specially patterned instruments could be rendered audible again after the lapse of centuries. Science, the necromancy of the 20th century, will yet accomplish by physical means that which the ancient hierophants performed by their rational knowledge of the inner construction of the universe. Symbols are oracular forms, mysterious patterns creating vortices in the substances of the invisible world. They are centers of a mighty force, figures pregnant with an awful power which, when properly fashioned, loose fiery whirlwinds upon the earth. Pythagoras foretold impending disasters by hydromancy, for he possessed a brazen bowl which, when filled with water, became strangely agitated, the surface of the water being continually moved as though a spirit were breathing upon it. Gazing upon the agitated water, the Samian sage foretold by the ripples in the water things which were to come. Pythagoras was also one of the veiled philosophers who revealed his instruction from behind a curtain, permitting only certain favored disciples to behold his face. Those desirous of receiving his words were instructed by an intermediary who stood without the door and heard the illumined discourses through the crevices in the locks. Hence the thought of the keyhole philosophers or hierophants who, never beholding the immortals, were the doorkeepers of the Arcanum Arcanorum. Of this order was the Apostle Peter, whose name P.T.R. was the common appellation bestowed upon the instructors in the sacred rites, who were indeed the living rock upon which the house of wisdom was raised. Christianity, as we have it today, is a philosophy revealed through a keyhole, a few mysterious words caught by an eavesdropper. This illusion, however, has a symbolic rather than a frivolous import. The eavesdropper was a privileged listener permitted to hear that which he could hear, or while he listened without the banquet of the gods was going on within. But only when the divinities shout most lustily do mortals catch even the faintest echo. 
Symbols are keyholes to doors in the walls of space, and through them man peers into eternity. Only to a few, however, is the privilege given to take the gold or silver key of the Kabbalistic light and with it draw back the bolts that hold securely the portals of the Domus Sancti Spiritus. Symbolism, then, is the divine language, and its figures are a celestial alphabet by which those upon the seats of the mighty trace their will in the fabric of the worlds. Though the patterns be infinite and man finite, still in the marvelous pageantry of emblems and figures human creatures may behold the workings of their heavenly masters. The meditating seer beholds strange figures in the sky. There are also signs upon the earth as well as in the heavens, and he who can read them is lifted up and transported into the sphere of reality. The Buddhist mendicant pays homage to the footprints of his lord. The Egyptians caught upon stone with mallet and chisel the shadows of the gods, and the rational soul gazing out into the universe of images beholds, as it were, a mirage hovering above the expanse of the earth. In this dream world dwell the luminous rishis of the Brahmin's contemplation. Here in a majestic file pass the mild-faced bodhisattvas in their pilgrimage through eternity. Gazing downward from this mystery above, the symbolist sees faintly shadowed on the plains of earth this passing pageantry of supermundane things. To the discerning few, the outlines of the gods may ever be traced in the flora and fauna of nature. Hovering above terrestrial concerns, the divine orders are sensed by the inner perceptions and rendered knowable by the forms which perpetuate their impulses. It is said that in the ancient days God walked in the garden, and the light that was with him illumined the parts thereof. Nor is deity today any more distant than yesterday, for the maker of things still blesses his creations with his proximity. The growing grain, the ripening fruit, the tender shoots rising from the dark brown mold, the soft-eyed kine grazing on the hillside, the laughter of men, all these bear evidence of the invisible but ever-present maker. God is in his world, and although men cannot gaze into his face and live, they may gaze upon his works, and if they look rightly, shall receive life more abundantly. The world is a symbol of the permanence of God, life a symbol of the presence of God, and love a symbol of the understanding of God. To those who are able to sense the inner life and things and read into forms even a small part of that great agency which actually ensouls them, the all-sufficiency of universal good is all-sufficing. Symbols are manifestors of a mysterious covenant by which the orderliness and consistency of all natures is decreed. Symbols are indeed the peculiar language of a transcendent agent. Men whose ears are unfitted to hear the profundities of the Torah are permitted to behold the law graven upon the battlements of space, flashing from the stars and inscribed upon every leaf and petal. The law thunders from the rocks, and in mournful cadence may be heard in the cry of the sea. All symbols are things standing for still greater things, the images of a transcendent perfectness, the witnesses of a sufficient truth, the evangelists of eternity. Chapter 16 Ancient Mystery Rituals the sophisticated Pharisees of the 20th century unceasingly give thanks that they have outgrown the fables and rituals of the ancients. The worldly wise love the evident and are exasperated by that which is not evident. Plutocrat and proletariat alike regard themselves as victimized by that person whose words or actions they do not understand. They love the obvious because it flatters them and hate the mysterious because it damns their intelligence with faint praise. Riddles are irksome. The modern cry is for facts, facts stripped of their verbal trappings and denuded of nonsense. Yet, with facts for their fetish, the modernists are more foolish than their forebears. Decrying superstition, they are most superstitious. Rejecting fancies, they are the fanciful product of a fictitious age. The modern world is bored with its importance. Life itself has become a botheration. Having passed the saturation point of realistic culture, satiety is eminent. Suffering from chronic ennui, how can a world ever become interested in anything but itself? Smothered in their self-complacency, these all-sufficient ones ask for facts. 
But what facts are there that fools can understand? How can the helplessly superficial grasp the hopelessly profound? For are not realities reserved for the wise? Or even those interested in philosophy today, we often hear the remark, We have outgrown rituals and symbols. They belong to another age, some previous cycle that has spun its time and long since vanished into the discard. But is it not more than passing strange that we should outgrow all that was beautiful in those worn-out ages and yet hug to ourselves the same vices that they served all too well? We have re-edited and considerably amplified the first books of iniquity. But what of the book of beauty and truth? Why have we torn it from its ancient covers and cast it aside? If we have not outgrown the evils of the past, how can we have outgrown its virtues? How can a man say, I live in a new age, and then steal more brazenly than the Spartans, intrigue more murderously than the Egyptians, kill more wantonly than the Romans, and oppress more heartlessly than the Brahmins. Apparently, ages do not entirely end, for the dregs of each dying era are dumped into the next to become the common heritage of new civilizations, while the best is all too likely to die or remain obscured, awaiting rediscovery by a philosophic few. There are times when memory is a carrier of carrion, and when committed to writing, this carrion becomes history. Not only have civilizations perished, but civilizations have also lived and exemplified some phases of the beautiful. We regard the past as having vanished like a dream. It seems to us unreal, but even as we say the past is dead, we ourselves die. The modernist cries, look to the future. We follow the direction of his finger, and behold, There is nothing. The future is an unfashioned quantity. It is the highly glorified now, the minute stepped up to infinity. The future is a great intangible capacity stuffed full with the same substances of which the past is made. In the last analysis, both now and then shall pass away. There is, however, a strange philosophic now which endures. But the now of fools is but an instant slipping into then. The past is more kindly than the future. It is rich with memories and redundant with accomplishments. Whereas the future is the abode of the unborn, the past is the dwelling place of the immortals. For when man passes from the little now to the great then, he either sinks into a kindly obscurity which covers his faults with the mantle of forgetfulness, or his memory grows until men raise altars to do him homage, and the ages resound with his name. The past is the security of the wise, the sure foundation upon which his feet are placed. The present is the slippery footing of the fool, for it passes away even while he stands thereon. We never outgrow the past any more than we outgrow our own childhood, for maturity is something added on. It is the complement, not the contradiction of that which preceded it. Remove the child from the man and he dies, for the child is the beginning the point of unity from which all the rest springs like the oak from the acorn. The past is the abiding place of tender memories, of wise experiences. It is the fountain of beauty, life, and truth. And although this fountain flows through all the ages to make fertile the distant corners of creation, yet shall it never be greater than its own source. It is fitting that every man should venerate his tutelaries with some expression of the beautiful. The gods of elder days required no solemn convocation or bloody sacrifice, but rather conjured man to more virtuous living by inclining his soul toward those perfect rhythms, which stream continually from the splendor of abiding destiny. The gods upon their eternal thrones rejoice not in the groveling, mendicant, mumbling, threadbare litanies, but in the free man, rich with the joy of living. Too long have the followers of a jealous and capricious lord trembled in fear of his displeasure. Too long have men supplicated deity to spare them yet a little while before the inevitable loosening of his wrath. Too long have men envisioned their creator as inhuman rather than superhuman. When the sanctuaries ceased to ring with the laughter of a happy humankind, the gods girded up their loins and departed. Too much of solemnity is an oppression of the spirit. He who venerates excessively neither loves nor understands the object of his veneration. 
To me, ritualism is essential to philosophy. Not the ritualism of a decadent church which had its inception after the decline of Greek aesthetics, but the ritualism of the ancient pagans who served God with joy. Today we serve our faith with sadness. And if all the dwellers of the seven heavens were to perish together, the sound of our lament could not be more piteous than those funeral hymns with which we herald the glad tidings of our salvation. Never should we forget the story of the simple-minded jester who, entering the cathedral and having nothing else to offer, performed his repertoire of tricks upon the altar before the statue of the Virgin. When indignant of the impious act, the priest sought to drive the youth from the church. A miracle happened. The stone figure of the Mother of God came to life and bestowed its blessings upon the adoring juggler. The substance of faith is not dignity but sincerity, not formality but naturalness. Ancient religion was devoid of sermonizing. The words of the gods were not made the subjects of ecclesiastical debate. Tiresome clerics did not drown their congregations with a flood of pointless argument. A local exponent of the old-time religion recently offering their prayers and hanging garlands on the Hermai chose for his subject the vital question, which of the twelve apostles was the first to drink from the holy cup at the Last Supper? After first intriguing his audience by a few anecdotes concerning his own childhood, the minister analyzed his text from every conceivable as well as inconceivable angle. At last, running short of time, he postponed his conclusions on this matter of pith and moment until the following Sunday. All the while, virtue continues to fail from the earth, crime waxes strong, and there are ominous mutterings of new wars. The priests of the ancient temples were merely the custodians of the treasures bestowed upon the sanctuaries by the wealthy. The temple devotees came when it pleased them, of the illustrious dead. In the presence of the images of the immortals, the thoughtful soul sought solitude. Into this inner silence there flowed a mysterious strength. Courage to dare, patience to wait, vision to hope, fortitude to die. No discordant choir interrupted the ecstasy of enraptured meditation. No smug-faced deacons doled out the pews. Sanctuary was a place holy and inviolate, a plot of earth separate from worldly concerns, where man might go to ponder the realities of life. Here all that was good seemed near, and all that was fearful far removed. We may brand him an idolater, who reverently stands in the presence of a great marble figure, carved by the hands of man, into the symbol of a formless power. We may say that no mortal sculpture could enliven an image or cut from marble a divinity. But imagine yourself standing within the temple portals. Upon its lofty pedestal before you looms the figure of Olympian Zeus. The face, many times life-sized, is carved from ivory as are the arms and a sandaled foot that extends beyond the folds of his golden robes. The noble brow is encircled by a wreath of gold, and the gilded sandals were pounded from the ornaments of worshippers. In one hand, great Zeus holds out the globe of earth, surmounted by the figure of Athena. In the other are his thunderbolts, symbolic of his might. Though you may disbelieve, yet will you be silent? For in the presence of great beauty the soul is stilled. What then do men worship? What calls forth their adoration? Is it the high thundering king upon his golden throne, or is it that subtle beauty caught in the ringlets of his ivory hair, or held as though petrified in each fold of his flowing robe? Where beauty is, there is a spirit in the air, and it is this spirit that men worship, and none who worships this spirit can be wholly bad. As a thirsty traveler drinks from the flowing fountain in the oasis, so the thirsty soul drinks life from the beautiful and is renewed by the sheen of a gilded globe or the majesty of a carved face. Remember, it is neither the face nor the stone. It is the something that is caught upon the stone as a sound caught by the breeze, as a ray of light reflected upon the ripples of the sea, or a smile given and returned in another's eyes. So high heaven in its grandeur is more than an image of stone to a tired and troubled humanity, which creeps away from its sorrow to gaze upon a noble brow, or contemplate the quality of a sculptor's skill. 
Thus, from that which is seemingly not real, there issues forth a beautiful reality. And God is never distant from that which is beautiful. Can we blame the ancient pagan if, feeling the force that emanates from a harmonious figure, he declared that a divinity had taken up its abode therein? Is that stone dead which can make strong men weep and give cowards courage to go forth and die? Is that stone dead which can hold the hearts of an entire nation and unite all factions in its presence? Is that stone dead before which the sick are healed, of the maladies and the sorrowful are given peace? Is that stone dead which can incline man's mind from the contemplation of earthly interest to the concerns of the spirit? Is that stone dead which can inspire man to cast off his natal ignorance and aspire to the beauty which he senses in a carven face? Nothing that is beautiful is dead, for beauty is life, and whenever beauty exists, life is more abundant, and when it departs, life flickers out like an expiring candle flame. Is all this idolatry? In fact, is there such thing as idolatry? Is not even the fetish a symbol of some standard, some beauty which ennobles life? From the primitive beauty of physical courage, men grow to the fuller beauty of integrity and from integrity still higher to pure aesthetics. We are all idolaters, not because we worship the lesser in lieu of the greater, but because we do not learn to understand what we worship and why we worship. Analyzing some microscopic creature, the scientist is not seeking simply to learn the habits of an order of minutiae. He is seeking knowledge, and the tiny organism is but the instrument by which he gratifies the desire to know. Kneeling before his household shrine, the Buddhist does not worship Buddha. The figure before him is but the instrument by which he seeks to know. It is a tangible nature about which, like some auric sheath, is a peculiar atmosphere of beauty. Because of the severity, the cold, gray churches of the modern world have failed to catch and hold the spirit of the beautiful. The God of our salvation will not be captured in hard-lined lectern or graceless pulpit. The chill of death is in the air, not the death of the body, but the death of the spirit. It may seem sacrilegious to affirm that there should be warmth in the house of God, that men coming to worship should find an edifice as ennobling as the text. The old cathedrals of Europe hide under their Gothic spans labyrinths of gloomy chambers, where in richly carved sarcophagi lie the princes of church and state sleeping the centuries away. Here also are dismal dungeons, where those who offended the laws of their gloomy god awaited death, their only liberator. Above the heads of the illustrious dead still file the solemn processionals of the faith. Still with awful solemnity the celebrant elevates the host, and the sun's rays striking some lightly tinted pane are reflected from the golden implements of the service. Again solemnity, again majesty, again faith muttering over mystic spells. But instead of man being lifted up into the beauty of God by all this pomp and spectacle, he is caused to cringe with bowed head. Oppressed by the memory of sin, the laity feel rather than see the processional pass by. We say feel, for they dare not look. The weight of their faith is so heavy upon them. The splendor of God does not raise the worshiper to union with itself, rather casts him down with a sense of his own insignificance. Whereas the gods of old, in gentle tones, bade all men come forward and receive their portion of universal good, the gods of today, pointing an accusing finger at each cringing sinner, ominously proclaim that if the quality of divine mercy were strained, long ere this the human race would have felt the fires of Tophet. Nothing is more meaningless than empty ceremonial. The service of forms and letters must pass away, for in themselves they are as ineffectual as the ivory face of Zeus. In the Christian mysteries it was declared that a spiritual being called the Angel of the Presence was invoked by the solemnizing of the Mass. Brooding over the congregation, the Spirit brought with it the benediction of the Father, so that the worshippers should not worship in vain. Is not this angel the same mysterious power which moved in the editum of pagan temples, whose proximity was perceptible even to the profane, and whose comings and goings were heralded by tinkling bells? 
This was the God whose presence was a covenant and whose departure presaged decay. The angel of the presence itself is fabricated from the very essences of worship. It is the atmosphere of sanctity which encloses the holy place as within an iridescent bubble. The contents of this bubble are actually breathed in by an assembled multitude whose bodies become charged with a certain ecstasy which defies analysis. The purpose of ritualism is to create this intangible atmosphere to incline men's lives at the quest of that inner peace and tranquility, which is temporarily conferred by the celestial visitant. Ritualism fails utterly if it does not induce rhythm in spectator and participant alike. The gods did not rejoice in rituals, but men in whom the higher emotions are latent find in pageantry an opportunity to express the beautiful, and thus mingle their lesser lives with the ebb and flow of universal order. Ritualism has no direct appeal to the rational faculties. In fact, the whole subject of religion lies wholly within the province of the emotions. So while in the day of great intellectual achievement, religion wanes, in the presence of calamity it waxes strong. Previous to the great earthquake of 1923, the Buddhist faith was not taken seriously by the body of the Japanese people. Even the national shrines wore a dilapidated air, for the empire of the rising sun was fast falling under the spell of finance. Then, concomitant with disaster, came religion. The morning multitudes again brought offerings to the temples and decked the shrines with flowers. In prosperity, man is sufficient for himself, but in adversity, he turns to his creator for strength. Religion is an instinct so deeply implanted within the human soul that it often remains unmanifested until misfortune sweeps away the superficial and bears the inner self. Thus, to the scientist, the intellectualist, and the sophisticated rituals are simply humbug with which a well-fed clergy ensure their own expectation of life by themselves eating the offerings and toasting the benefactors with the sacramental wine. But in the ordeals of the soul, of what comfort are stocks and bonds, what consolation can be extracted from the test tube, what condolence can be found in the postmortems of the literati, trying to make friends out of the printed page and engaging in vicarious romances with their own notions, Men of letters live lonely lives. In the great laboratory, there is no sound other than the beating of the scholar's heart. Yet there is a rhythm in the air, a slow, measured tempo which inclines the whole deportment to gravity of thought and conduct. As this rhythm infects the nature, a great cry issues from the depths of the tormented soul. There is so much to know, and I have such a little while to stay. Overshadowed by towering racks of books, the thoughts of lives unnumbered, the reason is confounded. Thus deprived of faith in the possibility of knowledge, the life that serves the mind recoils in despair before the impossible. The evangelists of the beautiful summon men to come out of their world of selfishness and thought, and to realize that men can die of excessive mentality, and that thoughts themselves can become the harbingers of great sorrow. Leave the rhythm a vast enterprise, they cry. Leave behind both your interests and your indifferences and enter into the presence of great beauty. Much thinking is a disease, and idle speculation leads to nothing. Only he who loves the beautiful is wise. Only he who serves the beautiful is good. Only he who shares the beautiful is happy. Beauty is in the heavens, and its power extends throughout all worlds. Beauty is upon the earth molding all forms into the likeness of God. Beauty is in the human soul, lifting man upward to ever nobler vistas of endeavor. Beauty is that abiding spirit which, hovering over creation, tinctures all being with its ineffable nature. Open your minds, therefore, that beauty may flow into them. Open your hearts that beauty may flow out of them. In one of the uncanonical Gospels, it is written that after Jesus and his apostles had celebrated the Passover together, they sang and danced, the Master himself dancing with them on the eve of his betrayal. Pan was regarded by the Greeks as the patron of harmony and rhythm, and his pipes were attuned to the harmony of the spheres. In a choral ode, Sophocles addresses Pan as the author and director of the dances of the gods and also as the author and disposer of the regular motions of the universe. 
of which these divine dances were symbols. Pan was the aspect of Zeus, as lord as the mundane sphere, and according to Athenius, grave Zeus himself bestowed his favor upon the Terpshorian art. Thus the Nosian dances sacred to the Demiurges, and also the Nisian, regarded as peculiar to Bacchus, revealed by their movements the various modes of the all-ruling principle. One of the Pythagoreans composed a complicated measure by which he was able to interpret, with the aid of gestures, the whole body of Pythagorean lore, and thus convey much of its esoteric meaning to the uninitiated. Aristotle classes dancing with the imitative arts, and Lucian calls it a science of imitation and exhibition which explain the conceptions of the mind, and certified to the organs of sense things naturally beyond their reach. Richard Payne Knight declares dancing to have been part of the ceremony of all mystic rites, and that persons of exemplary gravity condescended to cultivate it as a useful and respectable accomplishment. He further notes that dancing, being entirely imitative, was esteemed as honorable as the subject it was intended to express. In his Anacalypsis, Godfrey Higgins advances the theory that the three great elements of primitive ritualism, music, poetry, and the dance, existed before the discovery of writing and were employed in the perpetuation of religious knowledge and historical records. Mr. Higgins deplores the invention of writing, declaring that the decline of pagan virtue was largely due to the wane of the interpretive arts, which were considered unnecessary when more exact methods of perpetuating knowledge were originated. The exploits of all ancient peoples were perpetuated by epic poems. In every community dwelt bards who had committed these lengthy narratives to memory and recited them as feasts and celebrations. Poetry is the rhythm of words, music the harmony of sounds, and the dance the harmony and rhythm of motion. These higher octaves of ordinary endeavor were reserved for the worship of the gods and to immortalize the deeds of heroes. After the invention of writing, the most important records were either carved into the surface of stone or engraved upon golden plates. Thus deprived of their primal dignity, the interpretive arts became elements of amusement rather than instruction. Men loved the evident then as now, and it was easier to trace a motive in the written word than in some sad harmony or subtle gesture. The ancient poets lamented the decay of their resplendent ceremonials, ceasing to portray the beautiful and processional and pageantry, the saturnalia and bacchanalia degenerated into licentious orgies, wherein all that was base and depraved became the theme of interpretive expression. In this state of perversion, the fine arts preserved with pomp and show the outward form from which the inner spirit had fled. Music and the dance were extensively employed in the initiatory rites of the ancient mysteries. Some of the inner secrets were also perpetuated in archaic meter. Entering upon the path leading to self-liberation, the neophyte found the way beset with rhythms of diverse kinds. Temptation rendered exquisite by a seductive tempo lured him from his austerities. The figures swaying about him in the gloom interpreted the candidate's every thought and feeling. Through the darkness of subterranean crypts resounded the mournful cadences of an infernal music. The rocks re-echoed the doleful sound until it seemed that all creation wept together. The miseries of unrighteous living, the inevitable anguish of uncurbed desire, the hopelessness of irrationality, all these and many other grave realizations were impressed upon the consciousness of the wandering neophyte. When from the dark chamber of earthly horror he passed into the abode of fire, the candidate beheld upon the altar before him a lurid and flickering flame whose eerie light cast vague specters upon the cavern walls. These specters seemed to dance, to some fantastic measure ordered by the erratic fire. Then the music changed. The low monotony gave place to a slight, almost discordant consonance. The tones vibrated with a wild abandon, and invisible fingers strove to tear the human nature from the firm grasp of its will. Dim forms in crimson draperies blended their motions with the gyrations of the altar fire, bearing in their hands golden platters of grapes and with vine leaves twisted in their hair. 
These hours of a rhythmic dream besought the candidate to partake of their illusions. Half frenzied with the exotic harmonies and holding his hands before his face, the searcher after the greater realities of life staggered from the chamber of desire, seeking escape from the haunted rhythms that sought to hold him to the sphere of sense. Again there was silence and darkness, but even the silence seemed to throb, and with brain still whirling the neophyte pressed on to find him in another chamber lit with a strange twilight, which apparently coming from nowhere was diffused throughout the whole apartment. About the walls upon stone seats sat a row of grave and pensive figures like the senators pondering the problems of the state. The music began again, this time soft and plaintive, like a cry from the very depths of the soul. The faces of the silent assemblage were fixed in a melancholy stare as though each man gazed into eternity but saw nothing. The invisible musicians continued their faint and tragic theme, which seemed to whisper that all was vanity that life was hopeless span, and that all these assembled thinkers thought in vain. The air was sodden with despair. Disillusionment filled the cavern like some noxious fume, and in spite of himself the candidate bent his head before its insidious power. Slowly the circle of seated figures began to sway. Without rising they inclined their bodies and heads in unison. The silent but concerted motion breathed a hopeless negation which seemed to say, there is no use. Life is a span of useless suffering when birth and death, the inescapable tragedies of entrance and exit. If only one of these swaying figures would speak, even though his words were prophetic of naught but ill, it would at least break the terrible tension. But no word was spoken. The disciple felt his courage slowly oozing from him as the chill of despair entered his soul. Barely able to stand, tormented by the wailing cadence, and half-hypnotized by the measured swing of the old men's heads, the neophyte staggered from the hall of learning back into the dark passageways of the labyrinth. Sobbing and unable to stand, he crawled along the stones, seeking some escape from that cold hopelessness which made all life appear useless and all effort vain. Once out of hearing of the music, his courage returned, and recovering his former poise, he continued his quest for light. At last, he reached the bottom of the flight of steps, and ascending them in the gloom came to two large doors with golden knobs, whereupon a voice bade him open them and enter. As the candidate swung the massive portals wide, he was almost blinded by the shaft of light that struck his eyes, so long accustomed to somber shadows and gloom. At length his vision cleared and he found himself in a high-domed chamber brilliantly illumined by a massive globe of golden light placed in the center of the vaulted ceiling. The dome was supported by twelve pillars of very colored marble, and the floor was a checkerboard design with alternate blocks of gold and ivory. In the center of this chamber upon a marble base stood the great veiled figure of the Mother of Mysteries, the Keeper of the Royal Secret. In a circle about the statue knelt four and twenty priests in flowing robes of white, whose inspired faces were turned upward in contemplation and adoration of the great mystery. Again the orchestral music began, but this time it was serene, triumphant, victorious. The anthem of praise echoed and re-echoed throughout the vaulted dome, and the four and twenty priests, as with but a single voice, sang praises to the seven-lettered one by whose graciousness the way of light had been established upon the earth. As the victorious mode thundered through the chamber, it caused the very walls to quiver. Overwhelmed by the solemnity of the spectacle, the neophyte fell to his knees in adoration of the power that, descending from heaven, had taken up its dwelling in the temple. Then from among the kneeling figures came forth one more glorious than all the rest upon whose brow was a golden wreath, and in whose hand was a great staff with hieroglyphic figures, deeply carved into its surface. Gazing into the face of the hierophant, the neophyte could not but ask the question, Is this great Zeus himself? Taking the new initiate by the hand, the high priest opened a small door in the pedestal of Ceres's statue, beckoning the youth to follow him, disappeared into the darkness. The secrets revealed in this inner room it is not lawful to disclose.
for they are concerned with the spirit and the end of that long quest, which is man's pilgrimage of life. Here the inner meanings of the rituals were revealed. Here the purpose of the symbol and allegory was made known. Here the initiate learned why the great truths of life cannot be imparted by word alone, but must flow through the whole nature, to be sensed as a rhythm in the air, a gesture in the darkness, a power unseen. Here the robes of the mysteries were conferred. Invested in the outer symbols of an inner power, the new initiate re-entered the great chamber to discover the priests, as though swayed by some mysterious power, encircling the statue with a motion expressive of grace and rhythm. The harmonies pervaded the air could not be resisted, and the new initiate found himself a participant in the circumambulations of the sacred rite. He was moving to an exalted tempo and knew that the rhythm which flowed through his body was the same that moves the planets in their orbits and maintains all creation in its appointed place. The rituals of the mysteries were first fabricated by the priests in an effort to establish ceremonials which would reveal to the inner perceptions the principle of universal order. These ceremonials, however, gradually assumed an aspect so vast that they became the very backbone of the state. The mysteries made the gods seem very near to man. Prince and commoner alike feared the retribution of outraged deities and sought to propitiate by word and deed the celestials, who were so proximate to them as to lend their presence to the mystic rites. It is difficult for us to conceive of a day when the gods walked with men, for in this generation the divinities have retired before the ridicule of a disbelieving world. But those who have lived in the Orient know what it means to be ever in the presence of the Shining Ones. For in India the immortals still wander the earth in disguise, and every mendicant may be Shiva incognito testing the generosity of the pious Brahman. It is sad indeed that human souls should be stuck with terror by the proximity of the immortals. That instead of glorying in the nearness of his creator, man should be overcome with foreboding linking heroes with ill tidings and gods with cataclysms. The guilt that sits heavy on conscience is usually responsible for such uneasiness. Men regard their fellows as fools, and as one mortal to another can satisfactorily explain away their vices. The gods, however, are indefinite quantities with most acute perceptions, and accredited with the power of convicting man by his own words. When Nero brutally caused the murder of Agrippina, his own mother, he faced the world unafraid and drowned his small measure of remorse in his cups. But from that day on, he dared not join the processionals of the mysteries or take part in any solemn rite. He feared to approach the gods, for the blood he had shed cried out for vengeance. It is said that upon one occasion when entering the house of a great patrician, Nero beheld a statue of the goddess Ceres. As he looked, The goddess caused her carven face to take on the features of Agrippina. With a hoarse cry, Caesar covered his face with a fold of his cape and was carried half senseless from the house. Pythagoras was accused by his enemies of being theatrical and purposely creating an atmosphere of mystery about his person. Even after the lapse of nearly 25 centuries, the great sage is still regarded as an impostor simply because he employed dramatic situations for purposes of instruction. Not long ago, when discussing with a rather eminent scholar the strange personality of the Samian martyr, the learned doctor exclaimed, But why did Pythagoras insist upon speaking behind a curtain, so that only his feet were visible, when anyone knows that such a procedure is utterly ridiculous? Did he for an instance believe that a few yards of blue silk improved the quality of his thoughts or rendered his erudition more comprehensible to his auditors? All these things were simply a vain show and are enough to convince any educated person that Pythagoras was in reality a philosophic mountebank, who dressed up a little knowledge in gilt and tinsel so that it appeared stupendous to a group of gullible followers already convinced that their master was a god. When men really have something to say and are conversant with the subject, they simply indefinitely set forth their premises and require no such stage props. The man undoubtedly knew something of mathematics and a little of music. He also had an acquaintance with several other arts, but in all things he was simply a superficial observer, dependent for his influence and power 
upon the magnetism of his own personality and carefully staged miracles. We early discovered that the so-called learned of today are incapable of appreciating ancient standards of culture, that they are far too brusque to sense or respond to the subtleties employed by the greater exponents of Greek metaphysics. The veil of Pythagoras is a constant reminder of the fact that if the senses are united in the contemplation of externals, the nature is not free for the rational digestion of internals. He who saw Pythagoras could never know Pythagoras, for he was not to be recognized by the outer senses, but rather to be realized by the inner perceptions. If those listening to his words had seen the master, they would have believed the words to have been his own, and to have issued from mortal mouth. But unable to watch the movements of the man's lips, the words seemingly issued from behind a mystery and could thus be totally disassociated from the personality of the speaker. The human mind skips lightly over what it does not see. And although all who gathered there realized that Pythagoras was speaking the words, the fact that they could not actually see him do this caused them to regard the words almost as unspoken. The veil itself was the symbol of Pythagoras, the man for the human nature is but a drape concealing an inner and most transcendent part. When men desire to isolate themselves from all external stimuli, they have but to still by the power of the will the action of the outer senses. Close your eyes, and the world of forms disappears. Close your ears, and the world of sounds ceases to be. Veil an object, and the object itself is no longer there. For the mind then creates and endows as fancy dictates that which the sense perceptions have not dimensionalized. Pythagoras desired his disciples to realize that the words issued not from him, but from the great mystery which he had penetrated in part. He was but an oracular vase, a sounding urn, or a tinkling symbol, his mouth but a vent in which a spirit dwelt. It was this inner and invisible agent that spoke. Hence the words that issued therefrom should be regarded as having their origin not in the man, but in the rational soul that is above the limitations of the flesh, and superior to the dimensionalizing influence of the external senses. Freed from the hypnosis of a personal idolatry, the disciples might thus receive instruction without learning to love the teacher, might understand without seeking to estimate personality, might come to know the truth and not simply the measure of a man. Why then did he permit them to see his feet below the veil? The symbolism is again evident. Man's whole nature is a mystery of which only the feet are visible. For the physical body which we perceive and regard as the whole of man is really but the pedal extremities of the soul. He who sees but the visible man sees only the feet of a vast superphysical agent, whose head is of spiritual gold but whose base is of clay. The feet extending beyond the veil reminded the disciple of nature the visible part of God, whereas the rational and illumined parts that dwells behind the veil, separating the visible from the invisible, may be known only through the products of the reason. He who saw the feet of the master had seen Pythagoras, for Pythagoras himself was but the physical extremity of a resplendent and visible nature. According to an ancient adage, men are called by the names given to their feet. The visible physical man to which we assign various nomenclatures is but an insignificant appendage of a nameless reality which, dwelling behind a veil, may never be known until we have learned to esteem the invisible above the visible and consciousness above form. After successfully passing the tests of the lesser rites, the Pythagorean neophyte was permitted to step behind the veil and behold the face of the master. For it was presumed that having completed his preparatory instruction, the advanced disciple could look upon the inferior nature without mistaking it for the rational power dwelling within and behind it. Pythagoras was not only philosophic, he was also scientific in his use of symbols and rituals. He attained ends which modern education utterly fails to attain, because he employed not dramatic but divine procedures in the accomplishment of spiritual education. Today, the value of an idea is determined by the relative culture and prestige of its author. In antiquity, however, the culture and prestige of a thinker was measured solely by the quality of his ideas. In other words, a man's thoughts were not considered good because he was great. He was considered great because his thoughts were good. 
the highest authority of the modern world is the modern world itself. And by that criterion, the modern world justifies its works. The highest authority of the ancient world was truth. And antiquity justified its survival by expending its energy in the quest for truth. No man can learn the truth unless he has the correct rationale of approach. In great measure, this attitude is the outgrowth of atmosphere, and atmosphere can sometimes be created by a dramatic flourish. Yet, is there not a science of atmospheres? Do we not declare that the color of wallpaper affects our moods? Do we not instinctively feel more optimistic when the sun shines than when it rains? Are we not at one time elated and at another time cast down by environmental trivialities? Does not our entire mental constitution reflect the state of our disposition? And are we not more susceptible to instruction when in one state than in another? Is it not therefore legitimate to increase our efficiency by creating those mental atmospheres which most effectively stimulate and directionalize our rationality? From this point of view, a veil of blue silk, though to the superficial and absurdity, might become, when employed by one versed in the profounder aspects of the mind, a definite aid to the student's understanding, and consequently serve a justifiable end. What has been said of the blue veil applies equally to all forms of the ritualism. When rituals are designed and executed by the uninformed, they are meaningless and grotesque. When created according to definite philosophic principles and performed with the knowledge of the transcendental arts, these very rites become alive and have resident within their own natures, a virtue capable of being transmitted to an assemblage. We have lost the art of ritualism, the science of divine dramatics. Yet, in the dissemination of philosophic verities, it is often necessary to resort to figures and symbols to convey those subtle facts, incommunicable by any literal method. The only reason men demand that the statement be direct and simple is that they ignore those elements of life which cannot be stated directly. The great arcanum perpetuated through the ages by diverse means depended upon ceremonial and processional for the exposition of certain principles particularly those concerned with aesthetics. The crassness of our present attitude is largely responsible for the disregard for ritualism that exists in our national life. We do not necessarily refer to the somber rituals of the church, which are all too often depressing and inhibiting, but rather to those racial ceremonies and processionals with which ancient nations were wont to express the composite ideals of an entire nation through exhibitions of grace, rhythm, and beauty. Niebuhr observes that the ancients never founded their tragedies on real, but on mythical history only. What were the myths? Simply the outer veils of the mysteries, that part which, though revealed, remained comparatively meaningless, until the allegories were unlocked in the philosophic keys. It remained for Christendom to inextricably confuse the issues of mythology and history causing the former to take on the substance of the latter, and thereby lose all semblance to its own true nature. The early church recognized, however, the peculiar efficacy of the pagan ceremonials as evidenced by the introduction of the mystery plays. For on the steps of the cathedrals, even during the Middle Ages, it was customary to enact episodes from the lives of Jesus and the Twelve Apostles. These pageantries ostensibly were to assist the ignorant in understanding the profundities of the faith. In reality, however, they were perpetuations of the ancient Gnostic practices which the Church Fathers outwardly opposed but inwardly accepted. At this point, a subject germane for discussion is the destruction of the pagan mysteries, or the death of Great Pan, as it was enigmatically called. The Church affirms that the Gentiles, in their frantic eagerness to embrace the new Christian faith, deserted to a man their heathen altars. Those familiar, however, with the lengthy pleadings and arguments employed by the early church fathers to convert unbelievers will realize that the accounts of the pagan stampede toward Christianity are more of a rhetorical display than a true statement of the actual facts. As more than one author has observed, the pagan mysteries actually fell from the combined effect of treachery and profanation. Great Pan, like Caesar, drew his cloak about his faith and fell from the thrust of his dearest friend. Yet Brutus was an honorable man. He did not slay for personal gain or because he loved Caesar less, but because he loved Rome more. 
so with the mysteries. The rending of the temple veil symbolized the abolition of the mysteries and the birth of that new dispensation which sought to liberate mankind from bondage to a despotic priestcraft by making the way of salvation equally accessible to all men, irrespective of their intellectual, spiritual, or ethical status. Carried away by the blandishments of worthy ideals such as these, Christian zealots persuaded pagan proselytes to commit the most impious crime imaginable, namely to divulge the secrets of the mysteries. On the assumption that the end justifies the means, many initiates broke their holy obligations and thus wrought the destruction of those sacred institutions, which for unaccounted centuries had been the custodians of the secret doctrine. It was but a few hundred years, however, before the Church awoke from its disillusionment, recognizing that spiritual equality was but a figure of speech. It straightway reversed its position and proceeded to retrench itself behind the very mysteries and rituals of the pagan institutions it had overthrown. Thus, pagandom died to no good end, and the new faith rose upon broken vows and the sincere but misguided efforts of pagan initiates. Upon the desecration of their sanctuaries, the masters of the greater secrets retired therefrom and adopted secret means for the perpetuation of their knowledge. The oaths broken for the glory of God produced no tangible results, for the power of the priestcraft was not destroyed but merely shifted from one organization to another. Through their first spokesman, the Christian church admitted the possession of certain mysteries and spiritual secrets, and these are still preserved in its ritualism and ceremonials. But for lack of certain august mysteries which had not been entrusted to such initiates as might break their vows, the whole body of an inner work is not now and never was in the possession of the Christian church. For lack of these elements of knowledge, mystagogues could not interpret the symbols which were accepted solely for their apparent virtues, and hence rituals lost the name of action. So from an outward figure and an unquickened form, the science of sacraments and ceremonials was established the virtues of which Samuel Butler, in his Hudibras, thus describes, with crosses, relics, crucifixes, beads, pictures, rosaries, and pyxes, the tools of working out salvation by mere mechanic operation. Upon vain ceremonial and empty rite, the anti-ritualist vents his spleen. All too keenly he senses the superficiality, the tawdriness of outer show, but most of all the absence of the inner spirit. But in common with all extremists, because he does not like a part, he would sweep away the whole with imperious gesture. Because he is dissatisfied with the rituals with which he is familiar, he declares the whole science of dramatic instruction to be composed of stuff and nonsense. Estimating things as they should be by the rule of things they are, the modernist rejects all in the efforts to escape an objectional fraction. In the ancient mysteries, it was declared that broken oaths induce their own punishment. Religion in the hands of the rabble bears terrible evidence to vows and obligations turned recreant. In time, however, these things will pass away, and the beauty now deeply hidden within each deed and thought will again come into its own. For error is mortal, but truth is immortal, and though crushed to earth shall rise again. For thousands of years the ancients perpetuated by dramatic instruction these secrets of the inner life, which formed the substance of every mythos. The New Testament of the Christian Church is itself a book of rituals, for it is filled with allegories and parables which inspire by virtue of their dramatic power. Although drama was employed by the priests, it is not essentially a priestly art, for it is an instinct present among even the most primitive types and serves the innate desire of every creature for self-expression. Though in a certain sense a reproductive or imitative art, it is more than this, for it provides an adequate channel of expression for the surging impulses of the soul. We must therefore fight to preserve those arts by which the nobler moods of man can be interpreted. Without such means of self-expression, the individual is a locked soul, whose inhibitions must ultimately canker the whole nature. We might very properly ask ourselves, however, if we can preserve the beauty in ritual and allegory, when we have rejected both the religious and ethical systems of which ritualism was the natural expression. 
Is it possible to live crass and material lives, worshipping our own industrialism while still maintaining the integrity of mystic rites and pageantries? The answer is obviously in the negative, for we cannot serve the God of beauty and the spirit of selfishness at the same time. Man must choose the gods he will serve and abide by his decision. The sorrows of this century are abundant proof of the folly of his choice. Yet, ridiculous as it may seem, the day is not far distant when the world, tired of its modern gods, will revert to the pantheons of earlier days. Already, a suffering humanity is turning from a god of gloom to seek the god of joy. Within the ever-narrowing confines of its commercial endeavor, humankind is seeking to escape and raise again its altars among the hills. The gods of the terminals have grown intolerable. The human soul desires again to fraternize with the rustic spirits and know the carefree life of the fawn and satyr. Great Pan is not wholly dead. Some day he will burst the bonds that chain him in the dark abyss, and returning to his rushes by the stream, will again play glad tunes upon the pastoral pipes. Pan is the patron of the rites and rituals, lord keeper of the dance, and peculiar spirit of the depictive arts. A hundred years ago, it was predicted that within a few centuries man would revert to the gods of Plato and Aristotle, and tired of a distant spirit would rejoice in the proximity of kindlier gods and daemons. We may all look forward with eager anticipation to that nobler day when the gods of philosophy once more shall rule the world, when all will be right in the heavens above and upon the earth beneath. We are weary of our somber codes and dismal doctrines, creeds that hurl men at each other's throats in the frenzy of selfishness and passion. We desire to again make the acquaintance of those laughing spirits that speak from the waterfall and inspire all men to a rational camaraderie. The scientist may scoff, the modernist deride, and the theologian shriek blasphemy from the pulpit. All these things are merely incidental, for it is the soul of man that endures, and it is the soul of man that must be satisfied. Mortal institutes rise and fall, but the urge of self-expression never dies because that urge issues from divinity itself. Men can be ensnared for a little while and their purposes temporarily turned aside. Ultimately, however, they will be themselves. And this being like self involves the expression of the inner motives through the medium of the arts. A new age of beauty is dawning, and a race long servant to its greeds and baser desires is turning toward the contemplation of a nobler purpose and a more exalted destiny. Chapter 17 A Philosophic Consideration of Man Considered philosophically, man is the microcosm, or little universe, the miniature creation in whose composite nature are epitomized the various orders of life, divine, supermundane, and terrestrial. Like a fetus, writes H. P. Blavatsky, he is suspended by all his three spirits in the matrix of the macrocosmos. Humanity, then, is still in an embryonic state, and dwelling within the darkness of the sidereal womb, is suspended from cause by a threefold umbilical cord, the cable toe of the Freemason and the braided cord of the Brahman initiate. Of the threefold spirit, Paracelsus writes that the first has its seat in the elements, the second in the spirits of the stars, and the third in the divine nature itself. Centuries before, Proclus had defined the triune nature of man as three monads, which are one monad, being suspended from unimaginable unity. The first monad is the eternal God, the second, eternity in its own nature, and the third, the paradigm or pattern of the universe. A similar doctrine was promulgated by the ancient Kabbalists, whose profound investigation of transubstantial natures revealed that man's superior nature verges toward God, his inferior part toward the earth, and his intermediate part toward the spheres whose radiant energies flow through that intangible atmosphere called the astral light, or anima mundi. It should be borne in mind that even body is primarily a spirit, form being merely the objectification of the formless, monadic, physical principle. Soul is likewise an astral spirit. Hippolytus declared that the Assyrians considered the soul to be a triple unity, 
soul, signifying the causal nature, the threefold monad of Proclus. At this point, we may with profit consider a few lines from the famous Chaldean oracles. The mind of the father uttered that all should be divided into three. His will nodded assent, and at once all things were so divided. In response to the decree of the fourth thinker, he who governs all things with the mind of the eternal, the root division was thus ordered. In every cosmos there shineth a triad, of which a monad is the source. And further, from this triad the father mixed every spirit, arming both mind and soul with triple might. Issuing from the paternal foundation and established in the generations, man thus possesses three moving spirits which collectively are one spirit, the prime mover, the unmoved yet all-moving agent. It is natural, therefore, that each part of man should incline toward its own essential nature, being drawn thereto by a subtle gravity, that spirit which is from God, since it is the most subtle, consequently escapes back into God, the thrice beyond. That spirit which is of the soul inclines toward the celestial spheres, since it finds its affinity in the stars of whose substances it is composed, while that spirit which is of the body is drawn downward to mingle its agencies with the dark earth, its common parent. Thus, while these three agencies are combined in the making of man, they still preserve certain individual characteristics, and pursuant to the line of expression indigenous to each, seek to move the soul nature in one direction or another. The salt of the alchemists is but the terrestrial nature, the sulfur, the celestial, and the mercury, the sidereal. From the blending of these three spirits, the hermetists brought into existence the philosopher's stone. In our analysis of man, we first regard him as a threefold being, epitomizing in a single nature the whole order of universals. The three powers or monads enthroned within his nature become vortices of force, around which move respectively the substances of the supreme, the superior, and the inferior spheres. Objectifying environments from their own constitution, these monads surround themselves with spheres of consciousness that have their analogy in the universal planes or worlds. Thus, the supreme world outside of man exists within man as the environment of his divine spirit, the superior world in the environment of the soul spirit, and the inferior world in the environment of the body spirit. The three monads are also included within each other. The first includes the second and third. The second is included in the first, but includes the third, while the third, including within its nature neither of the others, is included within them both. Hence, spirit includes both soul and body. Soul includes body, but is included within spirit, and body, being the least of the parts, includes neither spirit nor soul, but is included within both. The sphere of man's divine spirit is consequently his heaven world and his inferior nature exists within this heaven even as the earth floats within the constitution of the sidereal organism. The sphere of the soul is man's human world, where suspended between the superior and the inferior, the rational judgment may be inclined by the will to contemplation of either extreme. The sphere of the body is the inferior world, which, analogous to the vast organism of the elements, seeks to swallow up consciousness and hold the innate life within the dark embrace of form. Thus, the universal man is mirrored in the individual man, in whose parts and members are revealed the laws and processes of cosmic procedure. The mysteries instructed man in the nature of his own invisible constitution, revealing to him the structure of the microcosmos of which his spirit was the guiding part. They first informed the disciple that the physical organism, devoid of permanence and rationality, and far from being the master of the life, was simply a whimsical gesture, as it were, of the soul. To the initiated, the very death of the body was proof of the immortality of the soul, for it signified that separation in which a stronger nature deserted the weaker. The body and the soul were likened to two runners, the first being subject to fatigue, but the second tireless. For a while they keep abreast of each other. The body, however, having exhausted the vitality that had been loaned to it, soon lagged behind. But the soul, being tireless because its vitality was inherent, rapidly outdistanced the body, which was eventually forced to discontinue the unequal struggle because of exhaustion. 
Thus, while it is natural for forms to perish, it is also natural for the soul to continue in a vital state for a long period of time. By rational unfoldment, it gradually inclines towards spirit, until it finally mingles its own essences with those of immortality. In Platonism, we find the soul continually engendering forms, and after having accomplished the purpose for which the forms were designed, casting them aside to redirectionalize its own energies. The Greeks held that both life and death were administered by the soul, declaring that so-called acts of providence were but the will of the soul for the body which it had fashioned, and of those destiny it was the arbiter. On his treatise on suicide, Plotinus describes the difference between natural and violent death thus. But it is requisite to remain in life until the whole body is separated from the soul, and when it does not require migration, but is entirely external to the body. After what manner, therefore, is the body separated from the soul? When no longer anything pertaining to the soul is bound in the body? For when this takes place, the body can no longer bind the soul. The harmony of it no longer exists which the soul possessing is also possessed. What then shall we say if someone should endeavor to separate the body from the soul? May we not say that in this case he must employ violence and that he departs, but the body does not depart from him? To which may be added that he who effects this separation is not liberated from passion, but is under the influence of some molestation or pain or anger. If also a fated time is allotted to each individual of the human race, a separation of the body from the soul cannot be prosperous prior to this period, unless, as we have said, this becomes necessary. In the quotation, it is arcanely hinted that under certain conditions, the soul, which is, as it were, mixed throughout the substances of the body, is caused to pass out therefrom and hover about the body, proximate to it but not entangled by the physical organism. When the concerns of the soul are liberated from the concerns of the body, the whole nature of the soul inclines away from form, gradually severing its connection therewith until at last having nothing in common with bodies, it retires from them into itself. This is in truth the philosophic death in which there is not a violent but a gradual segregation of interests. Under normal conditions, the complete separation of the soul from the body is not achieved during a single lifetime. But the soul voluntarily withdraws itself from a decrepit or depleted body because that body is no longer an instrument of rational liberation. Thus, in natural death, the soul simply casts off a worn-out organism to continue its function in some newer and more adequate vehicle. Suicide was considered by the ancients to be a misdirection of power. For whereas natural death is a gesture of the body... In natural death, the soul casts off the body, but in suicide, the body casts off the soul. Hence, such an end is termed violent, for the soul is forcibly ejected from its form without the liberation granted by rational procedure. In his Scolia on the Phaedo of Plato, Olympiodorus declares suicide to be permissible to the wise under five conditions which specifies the circumstances under which pollution of the divine nature might not be countenanced by the individual. He epitomizes his argument in these words, Suicide is unlawful when committed for the sake of the body, but rational when committed for the sake of the soul. Here we have to a certain degree the fundamental tenet of the samurai, death before dishonor. Suicide is therefore unjustifiable to escape misfortune and affliction or to evade responsibilities, but a legitimate end when it represents the sacrifice of life for the good of the nation or the service of the gods. Under justifiable suicide, the ancients would have classed the deeds of heroes who faced death in the service of the state, as well as the heroism of illustrious men and women of modern times who have willingly given their lives for the cause of science. Notables among such contemporaneous martyrs are those who have died from experimentation with the X-ray and radium. The first philosophers declared the rational soul to be the spirit's most precious attribute, that it should be reverenced as a god and its dictates never consciously transgressed by will or deed. There is a god within the soul of man, a god which blesses by its approach and curses by its departure. 
This most exalted spirit quickens the life and renders real the whole purpose of existence. When man serves the inner power, it is strengthened, and through the soul, its mediator, approaches the inferior man and lends its glory to terrestrial achievements. Conversely, if the life be ill, the spirit withdraws to the point of greatest isolation. Whereupon the soul, overcome by the noxious fumes of materiality, is said to die. Thus a man may actually be dead in his inner nature while still alive in his outer. After the disintegration of his own soul, he becomes a slave to the daemons or spirits residing in the astral light. These agitate his internal parts, causing them to assume the appearance of normal functioning. Such a person, however, is severed from all relations with his divine part. Sorcerers, vampires, and werewolves are thus declared to have lost their souls. But being outer shells from which the inner life has fled, or more correctly, decayed. Materiality hardens the nature, and we frequently hear the expression that this or that person has no soul. This does not mean philosophically that the soul is necessarily dead, but that the eyes of the soul have been blinded by the concerns of the body. It is not sufficient that man should live physically and exist in the divine sphere as a vortex of reality. It is also necessary that his soul, composed of the astral light, should be caused to verge toward reality and thus impregnate the entire organism with those virtues which are resident in the seven spheres. Here a most vital question is introduced, namely, why should a man be virtuous? According to the materialist, a certain measure of personal integrity is necessary for the success of the physical community life of the race. From the theological outlook, a little virtue coupled with the plentitude of belief is sufficient to preserve the immortal spirit from the pits of hell. Considered from the philosophic point of view, virtues, being resident in the soul, must serve as the bridge across which human consciousness passes to be united with its spiritual cause. When we elevate the concerns of the body above those of the inner nature, we threaten the integrity of our soul life and thereby endanger our rationality. The second death of theology is the death of the soul, at which time the individual's astral light body is disintegrated back into the anima mundi, which is the soul of God. These, then, are the major elements in the occult constitution of man. One, the spirit, which is the eternal foundation and the abiding reality, by virtue of which man is immortal, superior to both beginnings and ends, and eternal in his own heavenly nature. Two, the soul, which is the intermediary by which the life in each is mingled with the starry life in all, and the qualities of the sidereal bodies are communicated to each individual, who thus manifests, through vices and virtues, the state of excess and temperance existent in the sidereal nature. Three, the body, which, being of the earth earthy, is the outer framework wherein the higher nature is imprisoned, as within a cage during the period of its exile in the material universe. As the constitution of man is suspended from spiritual wholeness by three monads called unities, so in the secret religions of antiquity the orders of the priesthood were patterned from this holy mystery. The temple itself was the human body, and the priests who officiated at the various rites signified the spiritual agencies by which the mortal structure was sustained. In the sacerdotal orders of the pagan Roman Empire, for example, the abiding unity was represented by the Pontifex Maximus, the chief of the Pontifical College and supreme monad of the Order of Spiritual Dispensation. This august person was served by three flamens, whose duties consisted of lending their sacred presence to the ceremonials of certain gods. Are not these flamens the breaths or flames that bear witness to the hidden and unknowable light dwelling thrice concealed in their midst? These flamines of the first rank were designated the Flamen Dialis, the Flamen Martialis, and the Flamen Quirinalis, and were chosen from the patrician class to signify that they were of the race of heroes. Later the number of flamines was increased to fifteen, and their order divided into the Flamen Majors and the Flamen Minors, the first consisting of the Holy Three and the second of the Lesser Twelve. The twelve lesser flamins are the monads or powers of the twelve holy animals, which collectively form the physical body of man and which are represented in the almanac by the signs of the zodiac, distributed throughout the human body. 
The Flamen Majors in Freemasonry are the three grand masters of the Lodge of Jerusalem, who are united together in the service of the hidden king, the Pontifex Maximum Universalis. The Flamens Minors have their analogy in the twelve fellow craftsmen who, venturing forth in parties of three, seek the body of their murdered master. Thus man, the microcosm, becomes the pattern after which all the procedures in the inferior universe are ordered, and whose parts are combined in a profound and mystical arrangement. Among the gods of the Kiberian Rite were several diminutive figures with curiously distorted bodies and bearing the marks of advanced age. These monstrosities provoked the ridicule of Cambyses, who could not conceive them objects worthy of veneration. In the mystery rituals, reference is made repeatedly to a strange dwarf, equal in size to the human thumb, who, dwelling alone in the Sanctum Sanctorum, is never visible to man, but hides himself amid the furnishings of the sanctuary. According to Paracelsus, the rational knower dwells in the auric radiances of the heart, being a flame-like body equal to size to the last joint of a man's thumb. In the Kathopanishads of the Brahmins, it is also written that there is a man the size of the thumb who dwells in the ether of the heart and who is called the mystery flame. From these sources is thus established the nature of the Kiberian dwarf, whose physical proportions were inconsiderable, but who was yet greater than all the universe. For when Krishna in the Vamuna avatar assumed a diminutive stature, he was yet able to cross the earth in three strides. The mysteries held the rational part of man to be inconsequential from the standpoint of physical measure, but in its superphysical magnitude great enough to include all existence within its scope. Thus was emphasized the spiritual reality that quality and not bulk is the true measure of size. The little man in the heart rules the great man in the world, for the body structure is like some huge machine whose complexity, while far eclipsing the insignificant proportions of its operator, is powerless without the conscious mind and guiding hand which controls all its parts and functions. Though the subject of reincarnation has been touched upon elsewhere in this work, it is nevertheless appropriate when considering the relationship of man as a spiritual entity to man as a physical personality to discuss more at length the bonds which unite the superphysical consciousness to its physical environment. The spiritual agencies conspiring to produce the creature which we designate man are thus described by Plato. Indeed, it is necessary to understand man, denominated according to species, as a being proceeding from the information of many senses to a perception contracted into one reasoning power. G.R.S. Mead translates the latter part of Plato's statement to read, and collected into a unit by means of ratiocination. From this definition, we are to infer that the objective man is founded in the reaction of the senses and that, after emerging from sensations, man attains stability by organizing these sensations, with the aid of his rational nature. If these sense stimulations are not analyzed with respect to cause and mutual relationship, it is impossible for unity to exist within the nature, and for lack of such unity man must continue to exist as a bundle of contradictions held together only by instinct. It has already been stated that man does not actually enter into his immortality until he becomes conscious of that immortality. The instinctive man is consequently not immortal because in his consciousness there is still a vast preponderance of mortal elements. The eternal ebb and flow of cosmic processes contribute instability to the whole temperament, and in response to this inconstant action the soul abides in a state of untranquility. Spirit is the supreme power. And only when through initiation into the mysteries of the spiritual spheres he is moved to unite his soul and body with his spiritual part does man actually achieve immortality. Noble aspirations incline the soul toward the great king, and only by absorbing his inferior constitution into the substances of this first of immortals does man actually annihilate the interval between his temporal existence and his eternal endurance. The problem of metempsychosis was one that profoundly occupied the attention of the Platonist, Neoplatonist, and Gnostic alike. 
The Pythagorean doctrine of transmigration, as expounded by Empedocles, was admitted to contain an arcane rather than a literal meaning. While apparently accepting the doctrine of the literal transmigration of human souls into the bodies of animals, Plotinus undoubtedly possessed a knowledge of the esoteric interpretation of the doctrine, for nowhere else in his writings does he so freely employ irony and ridicule. Proclus, Chalcidius, and Hermes all maintained that it was unphilosophic to affirm that the human soul could ever return in the body of an animal. For the very will of the gods forever preserves so noble a creature as the soul from such a disgrace. Proclus enters the list in Plato's defense setting for himself the task of interpreting Plato's allusions to the return of man in a brutish constitution. Proclus reminds the reader that when, in the Republic, Plato declares that the soul of Thersites assumed the life of an ape, a world life, and not body, was very explicitly used, thus signifying that the soul assumed the irrational appearance, though not necessarily taking on the physical form of an ape. Again, in the Phaedrus, Plato describes the descent of souls into a brutish life, but nowhere does he state that they assumed brutish bodies, for in Platonic philosophy life is not synonymous with form. By all this commentary, Proclus attempts to show that Plato referred solely to the invisible constitution, describing the various changes occurring therein when it is molded by the diversity of human moods. Through living a bestial life, man causes his inner nature to assume the appearance of a beast, and is known to the wise not according to the contour of his physical body, but according to the visage of his soul. When so completely possessed by animalistic traits that the soul takes on the similitude of a beast, he is classified according to the species of his soul, and hence may reasonably be termed an animal. Pythagoras delved even more deeply into the occult conditions resulting from a depraved life, circulating among a selected group of disciples a conclusion still more profound concerning the condition of the unrighteous dead. He declared that as like attracts like, and man by common impulse verges toward natures most closely resembling his own, it was natural for the virtuous to incline toward God, and for the vice-ridden to incline toward the beast. Pythagoras did not intend to liken a bad man to a good animal, but rather employed the animal as a symbol of a nature in which rationality is dormant and the impulsive nature supreme. He stated that under certain circumstances a depraved human soul might attach itself to an animal, even as a daemon might attach itself to a man. The human soul did not actually enter into the constitution of the animal, but rather verged toward the instinctive nature of the animal in an effort to gratify its own uncurbed desires. Hence, an animal may be moved or influenced by a human soul even as Socrates was influenced by his daemon. A certain animal exhibiting almost human intelligence may owe that quality to some human soul that has attached itself to the superphysical nature of that animal. In ancient theology, Hermes was called the psychopomp, the lord of souls, and shepherd of men, of whom Proclus writes, Hermes governs the different herds of souls and disperses the sleep and oblivion with which they are oppressed. He is likewise the supplier of recollections, the end of which is a genuine intellectual apprehension of divine natures. Hermes is, consequently, the divinity presiding over metempsychosis administering the laws which cause men to return to mortal existence periodically until the generating soul has liberated itself from the idea of form. The herd of souls are the life waves gathered into groups by certain common motives, which cause similar nature to incline toward each other. Moving in a circle, as it were, about the central life, these herds are represented in mythology by Ixion bound to the wheel of generation. As the dispenser of sleep and oblivion, Hermes controls the moods by which men are entangled and held to form, or rather released therefrom. It is Hermes also who governs the memories and closes the doors of the past for those as yet not rationally awakened, and therefore unfit to contemplate the record of past actions. He is likewise denominated the supplier of recollections, and in this office is true to his great role of universal instructor. 
As the god of wisdom, Hermes instructs men by revealing to each individual the record of his own experiences. In the Egyptian myths, Hermes is the scribe of the gods, and his writings are traced upon the tables of memory. With a gesture, Hermes veils these records from the uninitiated, but reveals them to such as have awakened their inner consciousness. On the widespread acceptance of the doctrine of metempsychosis among the ancients, Godfrey Higgins, in 1836, wrote, It was held by the Pharisees, or Perses, as they ought to be called, among the Jews, and among the Christians by Origen. Chalcidius, if he were a Christian, Synesius, and by the Simonians, Basilidians, Valentinians, Marcionites, and the Gnostics in general. Thus, this doctrine was believed by nearly all the great and good of nearly every religion, and of every nation and age. And though the present race has not the smallest information more than its ancestors on this subject, yet the doctrine has not now a single votary in the western part of the world. The theory of reincarnation was frequently employed by the ancient historians and philosophers in the interpretation of their fables. Plutarch declares the account of Bacchus being attacked and dismembered by the Titans to be a sacred narrative concerning reincarnation, while Sallust and the gods of the world explains the rape of Persephone as an ancient allegory signifying the descent of the soul into birth. Several Greeks declared themselves to be aware of the previous bodies which their generating soul had precipitated into material existence. Pythagoras discourses at some length on his previous lives, and the descriptions of five of these will be found in my large book on symbolism. Empedocles also remembered when his rational soul had occupied the body of a young girl. The Emperor Julian believed his soul to have manifested in former life as Alexander the Great, and Proclus, according to Marinus, unhesitatingly declared that his rational nature had achieved its high dignity while in the body of Nicomachus, the Pythagorean. It should be particularly noted that, unlike the present popular concept of reincarnation, the ancients did not affirm themselves to have been some other person in a previous life, but rather that the rational principle dwelling in them had previously dwelt in other forms. Plotinus writes, It is a universally admitted belief that the soul commits sins, expiates them, undergoes punishment in the invisible world, and passes into new bodies. He might have also added that it was a universally admitted belief that the mysteries, by assisting the rational soul in its procedures, shortened the number of reincarnations and released the inner nature to return to the felicity of its father star. Here then we have the whole purpose of the mysteries, which existed as institutions of liberation, serving the invisible part of man and surviving only in civilizations where the rational nature was regarded as worthy of culture and education. Plato also affirms that when the soul fails to achieve liberation and willfully follows perversity, it passes into the body of a woman. This enigmatic statement is generally interpreted to signify that the soul takes up its residence in the matrix awaiting rebirth. In the profundities of Platonic philosophy, however, a truth far more recondite was inferred. General Pleasanton discovered that when man degenerates himself through vice of excess, his whole constitution is electrically repolarized, and electrically he becomes a woman. This does not mean that women are degenerate men, but rather that man in a virtuous state is a negative in his vital or etheric body, while woman is positive. When through excessive emphasis on physical propensities and sensibilities man moves his center of consciousness into his physical nature, the latter is rendered positive, and therefore technically feminine. Although its manifestations are totally dissimilar to the natural feminine organism which is positive by divine decree, why do we persist in accusing the ancients of ridiculous fancies when our own generation has proved conclusively the correctness of their deductions? There is but one answer. We have arrived at our findings through what are termed scientific means of procedures, and hence are foolish enough to presume that they could not possibly have been discovered in any other way. In reality, philosophy armed only with the instruments of reason has penetrated the rational sphere where science fears to tread, and has left a record of glorious accomplishment in every division of learning. 
One other thought before we pass to the consideration of another phase of man's philosophic constitution, namely the incarnation of deeds and the buildings of bodies composed of actions. Plato has already affirmed that man as a form proceeded from the sensations. It is equally important to bear in mind that all thought, feeling, and action, having their origin in the superphysical nature, descend like monads from their generating sphere, and clothing themselves in appropriate vehicles manifest as entities upon the planes of the inferior universe. In a symbolical sense, insects were regarded by the ancients as the incarnations of human attitudes. Butterflies, for example, were said to be an expression of the beautiful thoughts of men while evil insects that torment man and beast were the offspring of destructive impulses of the soul. Plagues were attributed to a similar origin. For the basilis, caucus, and spirulum, now subject of so much scientific disputation, were regarded simply as minute organisms evidenced by the various emotions of men. In the invisible world, therefore, exist manifold orders of life that are actually the mental and emotional progeny of human beings. Paracelsus recognized this fact when he describes the incubus and the succubus. The demons, male and female respectively, fashioned from the stuff of emotional and temperaments. Man may yet come to realize that he possesses the power to create living things, and in great measure thus fashion the instruments for his own torment. When Christian theologians substituted hell for the pagan wheel of existence, They evidently sensed the import of Plato's intimation that physical existence was the death of the spirit. The material universe, in whose substances our emotions find vehicles of expression and our actions forge weapons to cause us suffering, is indeed a sphere of recompense, a world of retribution, a place of punishment wherein nature's perforce must linger until their own innate perversity has been mastered. In the Sefer HaZohar, Attributed to Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai, it is written, Woe to the man who says that the doctrine delivers common stories in daily words. For if this were so, then we also in our time would compose a doctrine in daily words, which would deserve far more praise. If it delivered usual words, then we should only have to follow the lawgivers of the earth, among whom we find far loftier words to be able to compose a doctrine. Therefore, we must believe that every word of the doctrine contains in it a loftier sense and a higher mystery. The narratives of the doctrine are its cloak. Woe to him who takes the covering for the doctrine itself. A simple look only at a garment, that is, upon the narratives of the doctrine. More they know not. The instructed, initiated, however, see not merely the cloak, but what the cloak covers. As the written law, thus likened to a garment, conceals within it that unwritten law, which is the very first mystery, so must the body of man be regarded as a vestment within which a most hidden doctrine is preserved. Moralizing upon the issues of Scripture, theology fails utterly to comprehend the hidden meaning of the sacred books. It cannot conceive of Scriptures as writings concerned with philosophic anatomy. Yet such is necessarily the case. For the regeneration by which man's salvation is wrought must take place within his own constitution. To this mystery Socrates alludes when in the first Alcibiades he observes that when the soul enters into herself she will behold all other things. Proclus further adds that when she, the soul, proceeds into her inner recesses and into the editum of her own nature, she perceives with her eye closed the genus of the gods and the unities of things. The rites and symbols so carefully preserved against the ravages of time and unenlightened ages have been saved for such as can realize that human body itself, the house of hidden places, the tabernacle of the Most High God, the place of initiation, the sanctum sanctorum, where in properly consecrated chambers the deities abide and accept the sacrifices offered by the sensible natures. Turning inward from the concerns of the outer life, man enters an area dedicated to the immortals. His own interior constitution is holy ground, and here the gods, so distanced from his material concerns, mingle their personalities with his rational endeavors. Man indeed may be likened to some highly glorified snail carrying his own refuge with him, 
and in moments of danger retiring into that stronghold, which is his real self. The analogies between the house of God in the world and the house of God in the soul have been very carefully drawn. To those unfamiliar with the concept, the likeness is unsuspected. But the moment the mind ponders the problem, the analogy becomes obvious. The secrets of the mysteries have always been safe from the profane because the average individual applies the principles of ancient philosophy to everything except himself. The modern student of rounds and races, for example, while dividing the whole social order into numberless subdivisions, never applies the principle to the inner part of his own being. The gods are in the heavens and their powers felt to the most distant parts of the earth. Yet man has not discovered that, most important of all, they are sitting upon their golden thrones within his own nature. There's a reason why the ancient temples were patterned after the human body, and why every ritual finds its correspondence in some function of man's composite constitution. The studious seeker after the keys to the hidden work will do well to take the whole body of symbolism and ritualism and attempt to discover their correspondences in the workings of his own parts and members. Salvation is not alone a matter of theology, nor yet a matter of philosophy. It is a matter of science and of sciences, particularly the concern of biology. Biological salvation is a formidable term, yet it underlies the whole theory of religion. For the redemption of the human race cannot be achieved spiritually until each individual has come to understand the relationship between all his parts and is instructed in the proper manner of combining his forces and resources. Man is therefore the quintessence of all the elements, writes Paracelsus, and a son of the universe or a copy and miniature of its soul, and everything that exists or takes place in the universe exists or may take place in the constitution of man. The conjuries of forces and essences making up the constitution of what we call man is the same as the conjuries of forces and powers that on an infinitely larger scale is called the universe. And everything in the universe reflects itself in man and may come to his consciousness. And this circumstance enables a man who knows himself to know the universe and to perceive not only that which exists invisibly in the universe, but to foresee and prophesy future events. On this intimate relationship between the universe and man depends the harmony by which the infinite becomes intimately connected with the finite, the immeasurably great with the small. It is the golden chain of Homer or the platonic ring. Concerning the spiritual agencies which actuate the vast side of real order, we are still comparatively ignorant. In its quest, science classifies phenomena but senses few of the motives of which phenomena are but the transitory expression. We recognize an infinite life manifesting through an all-powerful urge which, communicated to universal bodies, hurls them with great violence through the definitionless vistas of space. We sense, yet cannot fully comprehend the stupendous agency which orders the infinite diversity of existence. Still, it profits us nothing to contemplate this infinite magnificence. For recoiling from the unimaginable, the mind is sickened by the awesomeness of cosmic magnitudes. Each new discovery but complicates the issue. Men grow tired of the vain quest for ultimates, and with a certain measure of relief draw their shrouds about them and turn from the whole uncertainty. Life becomes a period of vain searching in which the mind, certain beforehand that it shall not achieve its goal, struggles against its own convictions for a little while. The materialist is not really disappointed when failure rewards his efforts. For down in his very heart he really expected disappointment, and would have been genuinely surprised with any other result. The most the uninitiated can hope to accomplish is a certain classification of the problems of the unknown, whereby futurity may receive the answerless queries of the past in orderly form. The astronomer is equipped with the finest instrument that genius of man can produce. Gazing into the starry night through a forty inch refractor, the pageantry of the stars that moves across his field of vision is brought a little nearer, but their mystery is only compounded by their proximity. How can a man, even though long tutored in the science of the heavens, sense the motives of these distant spheres when the very blades of grass outside his observatory door and within the grasp of his hand are a mystery equally unsolvable? 
If a philosopher should enter that observatory and say to the aged astronomer, Your quest is in vain. No lens ever ground by mortal hand can discover the souls of the stars. The scientist would answer, I know that, but how else can I seek? I am born of a race that desires to know, and I must search. For only by this vain endeavor can I satisfy that inner urge. Scientists are men of a race apart, a definite mental species. We are eternal questioners, servants to an unfulfillable desire. The philosopher might smile and make reply. The urge to know is proof of the power to know, for the mind does not seek that which is incomprehensible, but is ever attempting to manifest in its outer functions that knowledge which is inseparable from its inner nature. The knowledge you desire is achievable and you divide it from it only by your method of approach. Imagine that instead of this telescope, the inanimate product of mechanical skill, you possessed a living lens by which the stars could be brought closer to you than your very self. Do you not realize that you yourself are a telescope and that by looking through your own being you can discover the secrets that lurk upon the very boundaries of space? Your own composite nature is a living instrument by whose virtues you partake of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Your soul is the very stuff which lights the stars, and by virtue of these in you, and yourself in them, their secrets are comprehensible to you. The life that actuates your own parts is a measure of that universal life, and the form that renders all these intangible agents perceptible to the outer senses is one with the spirit of form, whether it exists in the earth or in the sky. If you would understand universal mysteries, you must realize that only through the living instruments that have united to form your own being are the divisions of cosmic life rendered perceptible. Turn from your telescope, which now can show you little more than your own unaided eye and will but confuse your already tired brain. Turn to the analysis of your own nature, the manifold parts which unite to form your wholeness. For by learning to know the mysteries of your own being, you will come to understand the wonders of the all. Man's only hope of knowing is vested in himself. The creative ingenuity which continually manifests in the development of the arts and sciences discloses, in some measure, man's indwelling divinity. Though comparatively insignificant, the individual is nevertheless a creature with awareness and the capacity for infinite realization and understanding. While in magnitude he verges toward the inconsequential, in potentiality he inclines toward universal immensities. It is irrational, therefore, to judge humanity by the measure of its outward structure. Rather, we must sense through unfolding superphysical faculties the spiritual sufficiency of that inward part, from which the visible man is suspended. Man is the magnificent atom, which baffles estimation and defies analysis. The universe, in turn, is the magnificent man, one of that race of giants by whose assembly space is rendered populous. Mortals congregate to form communities. These universal beings congregate to form clusters and galaxies of stars. It has been said that men are the shadows of the gods. The simile is most poetic. But man is more than this, for the shadow is substantial, and to it divinity has imparted something of itself, that the likeness may share the virtues of the original. The life of the aspiring disciple is forever flowing toward his father God, that radiant star whose light shines clearly and steadily throughout eternity. Man is forever seeking to escape from his own littleness and return to that greatness which abides in space. The soul springs from a race of giants and yearns for the strength of its progenitors. Man's throne is in the heavens, and he longs for the day when entering into his own right, he shall seat himself with the immortals. All this we must remember when, gazing upon the mortal stature, we are led erroneously to conceive man to be a creature of flesh and bone, and ignore his reality as a vast being fashioned from the stuff of aspiration. Man may be likened to a walled city standing on the edge of a desert. In the midst of the city is a well, and from it lead the roads which pass through the gates of the city and become the routes for caravans. The walled city finds its analogue in the body, the gates with their dusty rails are the senses, and the well springing up in the midst of the city is the ever-flowing life, which both the community itself and the wandering caravans are nourished and sustained. 
Man's personality conceals his inner life as effectively as the cold, gray battlements of a fortified town conceal the bustling community that lies behind it. When we see only the physical nature of the individual, we behold that which least adequately expresses and often most misinterprets the internal qualities. Hence, the disciple of the ancient wisdom is taught to realize that man is not essentially a personality but a spirit. His outer parts are not the measure of his inner virtues, but contribute that weakness of the flesh, which all too often brings to naught the willingness of the spirit. The body can never know the noble ideals which impel the spirit toward accomplishment. Digestion and assimilation are the concerns of the body. To such homely ends, it concerns its endeavors. Above the provinces of instinct and sensation come the concerns of the rational life. The Greeks glorified in their ability to become rational animals, for man is a rational animal. However, that which is rational and that which is animal are actually two definitely divided natures. Rationality is natural to transubstantial organisms, but is contrary to the moods of matter. Unless the rational part retires from its own body and meditates alone, it cannot escape the chidings of the flesh. Now this separation was accomplished by means of the fourth dimensional, or qualitative interval. Seated in the midst of his disciples, the ancient philosopher, unheeding the nagging demands of the body that disturbed the equilibrium of the rational soul, discoursed at length upon the verities of the intellectual life, regarding his physical vehicle as an organ of expression, a temperament suitable for communication, a structure which focused intellect and thus rendered its findings communicable. The true philosopher maintains the efficiency of his interior nature, not because he is a servant to its dictates, but because his own creative expression is dependent upon the physical nature for concrete organization and tangibility. Thought is the compensation of the original thinker. In matters of the mind, as in matters of finance, man is paid for what he gives and owes for what he gets. No creative mind can be underpaid, for thought is its own reward and comes as adequate compensation for rational endeavor. Enriched by his own activities, the philosopher soon becomes fabulously wealthy in that most priceless of all possessions, reason. On the other hand, he who listens to the thoughts of the wise is daily contracting new debts, and the longer he listens, the poorer he becomes. This may explain why disciples seldom surpass their masters, unless, as Aristotle, they depart from the master's premises. Men eagerly frequent the assemblages of the wise, hoping to pick up the stray bits of knowledge that may fall like crumbs from the banquet table. Those who feed upon the crusts of wisdom, however, become more impoverished even as they eat. And he who listens long enough will eventually become bankrupt from his listening. When the day of payment arrives, the unfortunate debtor has nothing which to pay but his own life. Most of those who now suffer from spiritual and intellectual ailments suffer from the listener's disease. Men who seek masters shall be rewarded by becoming slaves, for it is the free man who speaks and the bondsman who listens. The modern school child is impoverished through the act of remembering and starts life hopelessly in debt. To a certain extent, the great minds of the world have rendered humanity mentally indigent. By being a great philosopher, Plato has rendered innumerable other minds unsound, and thus contributed to the ethical delinquency of millions. In a similar sense, Christianity is in bankruptcy to its founder, and the Orient will never be able to pay Buddha the interest of its indebtedness. Instead of stimulating the body of thought, the philosopher all too often paralyzes it. The great teachers of the world have ever drawn to themselves a coterie of mental corpses, which, like dead planets, take on a semblance of life by reflecting the radiance of the central orb about which they revolve. Followers, to use the words of Shakespeare, have a lean and hungry look. Though totally unmindful of the fact, they are actually economizing in an effort to liquidate. Disciples owe so much that they dare look no man in the face, but feel duty-bound to spend their days and nights hemming their instructors with proper glorias. Philosophy today is overwhelmed by a deluge of nondescript ites. We have the Hegelites, the Bergesonites, the Bethamonites, the Millerites, the Watsonites, cum multi-allies. 
This ait is the significator of approbation and agreement, a fervent so mote it be, as it were, from the amen corner. Individuals incapable of formulating even a notion of their own frantically search for someone to agree with, thereby entering upon the path of mental deterioration in which the intellect descends from the simple state of not knowing to the actual inability to know. An individual who becomes an it consequently pleads intellectual bankruptcy and assumes what must ultimately prove to be the odious role of serf. From all this, it becomes evident that thought is its own reward, that no man can actually profit from the labors of others, but must work out his own mental salvation with untiring diligence. The purpose of a great mind is to inspire to accomplishment, but this end is usually frustrated by an adoring multitude who cannot preserve inspiration as an indefinite quality, but must become letter worshippers by prostrating their own minds before a superior intellect. It has always been a serious question to me whether Jesus ever actually spoke the words, If ye love me, keep my commandments. For the statement is clearly out of accord with both divine and human reason, and reeks to high heaven with the sanctified odor of pious interpolation. Truth personified might well cry out, Let him who loves me seek me himself and discover me in his own way, and I will reward him with myself. In an old alchemical figure is depicted an aged alchemist out with a lantern at night following in the footsteps of wisdom, while in another part of the picture is a group of worldly wise men huddled together exchanging their notions with each other, totally oblivious to the spirit of truth, but a few feet distant from them. You who would discover the inner mysteries of life depart from the concepts of the many. Be not followers of strange gods, but seek reality according to the impulses of your own higher rationality. Become creative thinkers, not simply followers of blind cults. Admit enslavement to no mind. Read the words of the wise, but think for yourself. Attend to the conversations of the learned, but let your conclusions be your own. Be not hasty to condemn, but accept only that which you are capable of reasoning through with the aid of that divine power resident within. And finally, remember the words of Buddha. I will not believe a thing because any man says it, not even if it be the reputed word of God. I will only believe it when, to me, it is true. Chapter 18 The Ladder of the Gods With his opened eye, the Dongma, or initiated disciple, beholds as a grand staircase the concatenated order of worlds that extends upward from the material darkness which is the mundane sphere, and disappears into that impenetrable spiritual darkness, which is the abiding state of the first divinity. The midmost portion of this staircase is illumined by the light of reason, but its extremities are rendered incomprehensible by Stygian gloom. This flight of worlds rests upon the earth's lurid base, and the first steps are slimy with the fetid rot of matter. Rising in many levels from this ignoble footing, the staircase of spheres vanishes into the very presence of transcendent cause, whose blinding radiance ill-conceived by seven thousand veils is to man's unordered vision and utter lightlessness. This is the mystic ladder of Jacob's vision upon which the patriarch beheld the angelic choirs. Two great streams of souls move upon this symbolic staircase, one ascending and the other descending, impelled by the rhythm of generation. Virgin spirits, eternal with the fullness of God, emerge from behind the veils that cover the threefold darkness above, and swooping downward with bird-like speed are enveloped in the noxious vapors of mortality. Of this descent, Plotinus writes, And thus the soul, though of divine origin and proceeding from the regions on high, becomes merged in the dark receptacle of body and being naturally a posterior god, it descends higher through a certain voluntary inclination, for the sake of power and of adorning inferior concerns. Hence, if it swiftly flies from hence, it will suffer no injury from its revolt, since by this means it receives a knowledge of evil, unfolds its latent powers, and exhibits a variety of operations peculiar to its nature which by perpetually abiding in an incorporeal habit and never proceeding into energy would have been bestowed in vain. 
entering the inferior gloom, these souls are swallowed up in the living death of the body. This mystery was revealed by the secret rites of the Phrygians, as evidenced by Hippolytus. Hence, Heraclitus declares that we live the death of the soul and die the life of the soul, thus arcanely intimating that when the rational nature agitates the irrational nature, bestowing upon it the semblance of life, it sacrifices its own life and only regains liberty by retiring from the concerns of the outer organism. Lamenting the unaccustomed state in which the soul found itself in form, Empedocles declares that the process of generation causes the living to pass into the dead. From below mount upward the redeemed, whose natures increasingly luminous shine like stars in a Sumerian night. From the dismal underworld, the abode of vain fears and terrible regrets moves an endless file, climbing steadily toward God up the steps, or worlds of its salvation. Thus, the illustrious ones who are approaching the summit of their tedious climb are, in the terms of Plato, raised above all inferior good. Concerning the return of the liberated soul to its virgin nature, H. P. Blavatsky writes, This is the state which such seers as Plotinus and Apollinus term the union to the deity, which the ancient yogins called Isvara, and the modern call Samadhi. But this state is as far above modern clairvoyance as the stars above glowworms. Plotinus, as is well known, was a clairvoyant seer during his whole and daily life, and yet he had been united to his god but six times during the sixty-six years of his existence, as he himself confessed to Porphyry. From the foregoing, it is evident that the soul for many ages alternately retires from and approaches divinity, only stabilizing its nature after being completely disentangled from the concerns of the flesh. It is not intended that mortal man should as yet be constant in his power to behold the perfect face, but that strengthened by intermittent vision he shall strive with greater temerity to establish the continuity of the spiritual perceptions. From the many levels, which together form the vast staircase, pour forth lives in quest of forms and forms in quest of life. From the pits of mortal slime crawl repulsive creatures whose sightless eyes are unresponsive to the light. Slowly, painfully, awkwardly, these half-animate monstrosities obey the deep-hidden urge of an imprisoned soul and grope their way toward truth. From the dark fastnesses of the mist-reeking jungle come forth the slinking horrors whose claws are death and whose bared fangs were fashioned to rend and tear. And from the broad plains come the patient, sad-eyed, serving brutes, which see and feel but cannot understand. From the dark caves of earth's primal day emerges the dim progenitor of man, who, beating his hairy breast with crude misshapen hands, emitted the first war cry of his kind. The distant places also give up their savage hordes, for slayer and savior alike are marching on through the ages toward inevitable perfection. Breaking the shackles that bind them to the grindstones of the mighty, the slaves join the great processional as do the merchants who barter and sell, and the thieves who scheme and steal. From their marble tombs rise up the spirits of the hero dead, the Caesars and the Alexanders, and from their honored crypts come forth prince and potentate, bearing orb and scepter, and gathering their ermine robes about them. They solemnly climb the stairs of space. Higher upon the great flight are the scientists and philosophers, who in pensive mood plod their weary way, at the very point where the staircase disappears into the mysterious presence of the ineffable stand, the radiant saviors, the great teachers of humanity, who dimly, visible for a moment, pass into the darkness of God. Awesome is the spectacle of this grand march, souls moving toward their maker, passing from form to form in the endless quest for the formless, approaching ever nearer to that greatness which is the virtue of perfection. Though an infinite diversity confronts the eye, yet the whole mystery may be summed up in three short words. God seeking God. Philosophy does not give the soul freedom from universal law. In the doctrine of the mean it is written, The heavenly appointment of life is called nature, and accordance with human nature is called the way, and the regulation of the way is called religion. 
from the Confucian ethics as revealed in the four books, the power exercised by Buddhism is largely due to the magnificent concept promulgated by its concerning the march of the self to perfection. Oppressed by the irksomeness of their tasks and rendered hopeless by the ignobility of their station, the Sudras of India were victimized by a decadent Brahmanism. Following the letter and not the spirit of Manu's law, the holy born sedulously avoided contact with inferiors, lest the pollution of promiscuous relationships endanger that state of sanctity in which their Brahmin souls reposed. That golden age had passed when rich in royal worth and valor, rich in holy Vedic lore, the head born, were the virtuous stewards of the gods. In the Sita Swayamvar of the Ramayana is described a noble Brahmin king who ruled the righteous city. Oyodhya, like the ancient monarch Manu, father of the human race, Dasaratha ruled his people with his father's loving grace. Truth and justice swayed each action and each baser motive quelled. People's love and monarch's duty every thought and deed impelled. A superfluity of laws often proves more detrimental than an insufficiency of laws. In the service of their countless statutes, the Brahmins become oppressors of life themselves subservient to the cumbersome regulations which they had prescribed for others. The Brahmins also suffered from a plentitude of codes which regulated thought and action until life was reduced to a mere span of forms and conventions. But while the holy Brahmin enjoyed a certain uncomfortable security, the Sudra, bereft even of hope, found his lot little better than that of the beast. The gods presumably were too busily engaged in answering the unceasing prayers of the twice-born, pious to lend an ear to the supplications of the lowly. To these victims of a misinterpreted caste system, Buddhism brought the inspiring doctrine of freedom and bondage. While the Sudra could not throw off the metaphorical shackles that bound his physical members, he did free his inner and immortal self from the concepts of limitation and despair. Buddhism revealed the stairway of the immortals. And through this doctrine, which verges on metaphysical evolution, gave hope of ultimate accomplishment to those millions for whom present accomplishment was impossible. Inspired by this new hope, those who previously had cursed their tragic lot sang at their tasks. Those who looked forward to a life of pain smiled through their tears, and those who had faced eternity with fear and trembling were rendered strong by the knowledge of life's purpose. The miseries of the today were forgotten, and men dwelt together in a glorious tomorrow. The lowly uncast sensed the Brahmin within his frame, for to the sinner had been revealed the hidden saint within. Indra's city vanished from the sky. The gods were dissipated like mist before the dawn of reason. Only self remained, the glorious, universal self, the one who is in all, the all which is in each. Rising up against their heavenly despots and emancipating themselves from the hierarchies of fears they had worshipped, the Sudras declared themselves free men of the universe. Thus the letter gave place again to the spirit, and human beings faced their own thoughts and actions unafraid. Armed with the tools of the noble path, each true believer hewed an appropriate destiny from the eternal substances of being. Recognizing his state to signify that of greatest separateness, the Sudra began to ascend the ladder of diversity, finally raising himself to unity upon its several rungs. True philosophy inspires with the courage to accomplish, and equips with the patience to wait. It reveals not only the end, but also the means to that end. Philosophy is indeed a mystical ladder up which men climb from ignorance to reason. Its rungs are the arts and sciences, and he who ascends the whole of the way finds that its upper extremity rests in the substances of an invisible but most substantial world. The proper abode of the wise. Here are the groves of learning where the sages sit together musing upon consequentials. This is a sphere of peace. For with depth of learning wrangling ceases and the thoughtful mind to solitude retires. This is indeed the place of the Isarim, or blessed souls, of which the rabbins dreamed and where the Kedeshim pondered over the great sod, for it is written in the Proverbs, and his sod are for the Isarim. Fear not, admonished Pythagoras in the golden verses, 
Men come from a heavenly race and are taught by a diviner nature that which they should accept and that which they should reject. Philo Judaeus describes the allegorical ladder which is raised from earth to heaven, showing its macrocosmic analogies and its application to the microcosm or man. This ladder, according to Philo, is of the world its astral part and of man the soul, the foot of which is, as it were, its earthly part, namely sensation while its head is, as it were, its heavenly part, the purest mind. Upon this ladder move what Philo terms the Logi, which may be interpreted as either the words, or more generally, the gods. To these words or gods is ascribed a very secret and wonderful meaning. In the chapter on the annihilation of the sense of diversity, we have already described the spheres of realization, or consciousness, which man causes to manifest out of its own potentialities. The level of integrity upon which the individual functions is his sphere or level of consciousness, and each of these levels or spheres, when considered as a whole, is a god or word of power moving upon the ladder. Thus Philo declares that when the Logi ascend, they draw the ladder or soul up with them, which arcanely intimates two things. One, that the gods or words cannot descend other than by the soul, and having once perfected the soul, lose contact with the world. Two, that the soul in its ascent absorbs inferior natures into itself, so that as it rises there is nothing left beneath it. The golden verses conclude, Thy mind's reins let reason guide, then strip the flesh up to free ether soar, a deathless god divine, mortal no more. In his dream, Jacob beheld a mysterious ladder with its foot upon the earth and its top extending upward into the divine sphere. In the mysteries, it is declared that 72 aeons, or angels, moved upon the ladder. These angels are the 72 names or powers that emanate from Shem Ham Foresh, the separate and ineffable deity. Ibn Ezra, writing in the 12th century, states on the authority of Ibn Geberal, that the latter which Jacob saw in his dreams signified the superior or rational soul, and that the angels of Elohim which ascend and descend thereon are the abstract thoughts of wisdom, which attach themselves at the same time both to a spiritual or superior subject, and also to the corporeal and inferior. The word which has been rendered latter is solemn, which means that which is piled into a heap, raised up or lifted, and it is upon this raised or exalted place that the Malachi Elohim moved up and down. We cannot do better than consider the meaning of the word salam as here employed. Albert Pike states that in archaic Hebrew there was no word to designate a pyramid. In the word Jerusalem, for example, salam, is generally interpreted to mean peace, and Melchizedek, the prince of Salem, was called the Lord of Peace. It might be more accurate, however, to replace the word peace with exalted or lifted, in which event Jerusalem could be interpreted to mean the city of the latter. In this connection, the fact should not be overlooked that Muhammad, in his night journey to heaven, after arriving at Jerusalem and Albarak, beheld a ladder formed of golden rope descending from heaven. The lower end of this ladder rested upon Mount Moriah. And climbing the swaying stair, the prophet of Islam entered into the very presence of the living but many-veiled God. In the ancient wisdom, it was also declared that the sacred mountains of the world rose in seven steps or stages, as the Meru of the Hindus, and it was from the high place or the seventh step that offerings were made to the Lord whose name is blessed. Not only did the holy place rise in seven platforms or levels, but upon its topmost level was usually erected a triform symbol of the divine nature itself. Thus, the seven steps, complemented by this threefold figure, became the mysterious Pythagorean decad, or the symbol of the tenfold order of the universe. Jacob's ladder then actually becomes the symbolic mountain or pyramid. Pyramids wherever found are symbolic of the axis mountain of the world. The Olympus, Asgard, and Meru of the pagans, and possibly the rock Moriah upon which the temple stood at Jerusalem. In his Pagan Idolatry, Faber describes the Mithraic ladder used in the initiatory rites of the Persian mysteries, which he affirms was in reality a pyramid of seven steps, further declaring that on each step was a door. In the ceremonials, the neophyte climbed the pyramid, passing through the seven doors, 
and then through similar portals descending on the opposite side. This pyramid was symbolic of both the world and the sidereal system. Nearly all great buildings of antiquity were symbolic of the universe, and according to Cicero, the conquering Xerxes destroyed the temples of the Greeks, declaring that the entire world was the proper house of God, and that deity was profaned when man prepared for him a house less dignified than his own solar mansion. Celsus gives a certain key to the ceremonies of the Mithraic rite, but of those mysteries comparatively little is known. Having passed successfully through the dangers imposed by his initiators, the candidate was invested with a great cape, either embroidered or painted with stars, and with the constellations of the zodiac ornamenting the hem. Like the starry hat of Attis, these star-strewn cloaks signified the soul in its highest and most causal aspect. Thus, by the mysteries, a heavenly nature was conferred, and men who were formerly dwelt about the earth itself were raised to a heavenly abode, and their whole natures invested with celestial raiment. A corporeal body was transmuted by the mysteries into a celestial body, for men who had previously enveloped themselves in the dark garments of form now put on a more luminous garb resplendent with the heavenly light. Above the earth are the planets, above the planets are the stars. Uninitiated mortals exist in physical natures limited to the concerns of the earth and are termed material because their rational natures are in servitude to a mortal constitution. Disciples are those who take upon themselves the striped garments of the planets, the cloak of many colors whose shades denote the aspects of the astral soul. When the aspirant has transcended the concerns of the planets and risen through their orbits to liberation, he then assumes the starry clothing of the firmament. Thus the stars are symbols of spirit, the planets of soul, and the elements of body. Herein lies the explanation for the three-runged ladder which unites heaven and earth. The rungs of this ladder are the three mysteries perpetuated in Freemasonry as the Blue Lodge. The lowest round is physical, the second emotional, and the third mental. For it was written in the ancient work, Our thoughts are from the stars, our emotions from the planets, and our forms from the earth. Entering the chamber of the Mithraic rites, the candidate found himself in a great cavern, either formed by natural means or hewn from solid rock by the priests. In the center of the cavern stood a pyramid rising in seven steps, each of its levels painted a different color. In some cases, the pyramid was divided into definite platforms. In others, a narrow spiral pathway wound from its base to summit, as in the Chaldean ziggurats, or astronomical towers. From the flight of steps leading up to the face of the pyramid, access to the various planes or levels was had through low gates, each composed of a different metal. The description given by Celsus of these metals is probably a blind, for the ancients followed a definite system which he has deviated from. Conducted by the Hierophant, who discoursed to him concerning the mysteries as he progressed, the neophyte ascended the steps of the pyramid first entering through a silver gate onto the platform of the moon. Beyond was another gate resembling brass, which was that of Mercury, and still farther on a third gate of copper, sacred to Venus. The fourth gate was of gold, the fifth of iron, the sixth of tin, and the seventh and last of lead. After passing through these gates, the neophyte found himself on a flat square area, and before him a triangular altar upon which burned three fires. The master of the rite then explained that by this ascent was revealed the felicity of liberated souls, the joyous upward motion of lives toward their sovereign cause, that passing from one plane to another, the candidate had recapitulated the after-death process by which his superphysical constitution verged away from matter and inclined itself towards the immaterial foundation, which is in the heavens and concealed from the profane by the leaden ramparts of Saturn. In his climb, the aspirant had actually stepped from planet to planet, leaving behind him the inferior spheres, finally to approach proximity to that threefold fire, the triform flame of unimaginable being that burns forever and a day upon the glorious altar of universal reality. Learn, O oh my son, the master continued, the mystery of the ever-burning fire, whose triple wick dipped in an inexhaustible fuel burns with steady luminosity throughout all the aeons. 
The first flame is universal life. The second, universal light. And the third, universal motion. And these together are one flame. God is a blinding light and a consuming fire, for his light is eternal reason which renders all things visible and comprehensible. Light the lamp of your own mind upon this altar of eternal mind, that the reason which is in all things may call forth the reason that is in you. When the lamp of your reason is lighted, all things become evident. The dark mysteries of life are dissipated, and the glow of realization causes all secrets to reveal themselves, and all hidden works to be made manifest. The base of this pyramid is square. It is your body. Its four elements combine to produce the mystic cube called man. The seven steps are your senses, by which the within comes to know the without, and which the without climbs, even as a ladder. To discover the within. Consciousness, ascending the ladder of the senses, finally brings its message to the inner nature. The threefold flame here is the one, the beautiful, and the good, which together are the light of equality, the torch of reason, and the magical fire the magician must carry if he would invoke the dread person of deity. Upon the other side of this pyramid, the stairs descend into the darkness of the cavern below. The candidate follows his initiator down again into the darkness of the subterranean room. Having passed through the metallic gates and standing once more at the base of the pyramid, the initiator resumes. This descent signifies the soul departing from its state of felicity, and after passing downward through the gates of the seven spheres, taking upon itself the sorrows of birth. In the gloomy cavern of the world, uninitiated men and women struggle vainly against the inevitable reactions of their own ignorance. Seeking permanence in an impermanent sphere, they suffer without respite, and their lot is indeed desperate. But those who by rational procedure have discovered the pyramidal nature of creation, and learn to know the order of divine procedure, whereby man ascends and descends the steps of destiny, such can no longer be bound to the untranquil sphere but abiding therein a little while and tolerating its sorrows, prepare themselves for a more auspicious day by inclining their minds to reason. By these mysteries, then, is arcanely revealed the order of life, and by this pyramid the procedure of life. He who accepts the mystery into himself and ponders its meanings will be rewarded for his industry by the realization of sidereal order. We are ever walking up and down the steps of space, descending either from a more blissful state into one of uncertainty or ascending from an uncertain state into one of blessed felicity. He who comprehends the wisdom of this divine motion will realize that God is ever drawing lives to himself, and they may partake of the fullness of his inspiration, and then casting them from him again, that through great need they may learn to value the fullness of that inspiration. From the presence of the unchanging one there pours ever downward through the substances of the invisible world a host of souls moving inevitably into birth, while from the world of visible and tangible physical things there comes a host of souls pouring into death. Those coming into life descend the ladder, and those coming into death ascend the ladder, for death brings the soul nearer to God than does birth. Through the mysteries there pours still another stream, that exalted order which ascends the great pyramid to descend no more who upon reaching the fiery altar upon its summit, cast themselves into the eternal flame, and from their own natures feed its eternal hunger. In his Chemical Marriage, Christian Rosenkreutz describes the vision of CRC as he slept, shackled in the antechamber of the House of Initiation. In his dream, CRC beheld the strange sight of a multitude of persons suspended from heaven by cords. In an early Rosicrucian book, which I examined some years ago, the subject of these hanging men was elucidated in detail. The dangling figures are the sophists, those false learners who ever seek to climb to heaven upon their own suppositions. We are all supported by our beliefs, held up, as it were, by the strength of our premises and the sufficiency of our postulations. Yet, in all too many instances, how slender and inadequate is the thread of mortal reason to which we trust our weight. Among the sons of Islam, there is an ancient fable to the effect that there shall come forth a prophet who will stretch a hair from the Mount of Olives to the Golden Gate of Jerusalem, and using it for a bridge will walk across the Valley of Jehoshaphat, or the place of death. The hair, according to the Kabbalah, is the symbol of the glory of God. 
and the countless diversity of his mercy. Taking this fable in its literal sense, a Mohammedan fanatic wove a rope of human hair and essayed the feet, but was killed. In the legend of Christian Rosencruz, it is further stated that an aged man, who represents Kronos or Time, the justifier of all actions, flew in and out among the hanging sophists. Wearing an hourglass tied to the top of his head and carrying in his hand a pair of sharp shears, the divine iconoclast would fly up behind any of the worldly wise men who climbed too ambitiously up their swaying ropes and cut away their slender support. Another observation by the author of The Chemical Marriage is to the effect that the higher these false learners climbed, the harder and more disastrous was their fall, so that many were dashed to pieces. The more prudent ones, however, realizing the insecurity of their position, remained close to the earth and suffered comparatively little harm when their cords were cut, often alighting uninjured upon their feet. We all share in common the desire to climb to heaven up the ladder of our own convictions, and believing ourselves to be infallible, we set out to storm the gates of the eternal. No spectacle is more pathetic than that of the individual who, led to false and dizzy heights by his egotism, has been dashed therefrom into the depths of misery and disillusionment. The more we depend upon the false, the more we suffer when the falseness is exposed. The story of the hanging man is evidently concerned with the effort to ridicule those Aristotelian schoolmen, whose fallacies were already apparent at the beginning of the 17th century. Elevated above their fellow men by vain assertions and maintaining themselves by subterfuge and equivocation, these pedants preyed upon the credulity of an illiterate age. But time was finding them out, for science, rising out of this protest against intellectual pedophagy, furnished Kronos with the shears wherewith to cut down the scholastic befogger of issues. In this allegory, heaven is used to signify the sphere of the truly learned, for it was presumed that those whose knowledge was sufficient dwelt in a state of tranquility, far above the abode of ordinary mortals, tormented by doubt and rendered impotent by ignorance. The light of tranquility, as the followers of Bohm might call it, radiates from the paradisiac sphere of the contented. Humanity moves instinctively toward that tranquil state of the philosophic blessed. For we incline toward that person or condition which radiates happiness. This instinct has been shamelessly exploited in the name of religion. But the age of empty promises is closed. Having vainly sought happiness among the dictums of faith and in the company of the so called holy, the individual is coming to realize that peace lies only within himself. In Dryden's translation of the Aenid are found several significant copper engravings one particularly showing a genius cutting the slender thread of life, connecting mortal man with his divine origin. A small plate also showing this thread issuing from the crown of the head and disappearing upward into a cloud of divine radiance is to be found in Michael Mayer's Scrutinium Chimesum. Various modifications of this idea constituted a favorite theme of the medieval emblem writers especially such as were in touch with the Rosicrucian activities. This thread rising from the head is the platonic cord, a fine hypothetical line which unites the personality to its own causal part. According to the hermetic axiom of analogy, as the spirit and body of man are connected by a thread, so heaven and earth, the spirit and body of the solar man, are united by this swaying ladder which, lowering from above, becomes the way of souls descending into life. Kronos, with his reaping scythe, is the guardian of this rope, and at his will the line is severed and all the objective nature disassociated from its causal principle. This thread, then, is Bifrost, the bridge of the gods over the immortals, like the Aesir of Scandinavia, crossed before its final severance when returning to the sacred castle. Like the builders of the fated Tower of Babel, the worldly wise men of CRC's vision sought to elevate personality above principle and draw the body above its own source. Hence their ultimate discomfiture, by attempting to elevate an impermanent nature to a divine state, they attempted the impossible and so death, 
the master of processes, cut down each one in turn. For that man does not exist who shall be empowered to reach heaven in his physical nature. The cords are the faith and power that sustain the individual during the prime of his life. But like life itself, power is a physical uncertainty, and neither wealth, position, nor physical knowledge can support the soul in that dread extremity which men are pleased to term death. In his vision of the Apocalypse, the initiate, known to the Christians as St. John the Divine, experienced in his ascent to heaven the spiritual mystery of climbing upward through the seven congregations or churches, which are in Asia, finally coming to the door in the heavenly vault and passing through into the Empyrean to find himself in the presence of the Lord of the Cherubim and the Paschal Lamb. St. John is described as being in the Spirit, a good old Neoplatonic term. From this we are to infer that the Gnostic initiate had learned the mystery of the rope, swinging from heaven, for according to tradition, he had climbed his way hand over hand in approved nautical fashion. Mohammed, a prudent man of more portly build, overtaxed the meager facilities of a knotted rope, and consequently employed, if we are to believe the accounts, a safer and more commodious rope ladder in his ascent. In substance, however, the experiences of the two initiates were practically identical. And though slight differences exist in the terminology of the symbolism, nevertheless the principle involved demonstrates that both men had been initiated. St. John, presumably by the Gnostics, and Mohammed by the Nestorian Christians. St. John the Divine employed seven great Asiatic cities to symbolize the spiritual knots or ganglia which placed at intervals along the rope assisted the climber in his difficult task. Mohammed's rope ladder was of golden cords, and its rungs presumably were fashioned from the substances of the seven worlds. He was forced, it is said, to stop at each of the seven gates to receive the adoration of the patriarchs, who had apparently waited since their demise for his coming. There is also an East Indian fable of the goddess Kundalini, who, being of an inquisitive mind and seeing a rope hanging from heaven with its lower end concealed in impenetrable gloom, decided to climb down this rope and investigate the unknown darkness below. Having descended the rope for an incalculable period, Kundalini discovered that its lower end rested upon an island that seemed to float in the midst of a great sea of darkness. While exploring this strange island, the rope was cut from above and Kundalini was left floating in the midst of a vast ocean. In terror, the goddess ran and hid herself in a cave and refused to come out. In the secret teachings, it is revealed that she could be induced to come forth from her asylum only by an aggregation of wise men, who with offerings, supplications, and grave discoursings finally persuaded her to leave her gloomy retreat. The goddess Kundalini is the spirit fire that descends the mysterious ladder, which is here emblematic of the umbilical cord. When this cord is cut, the goddess is left stranded in the underworld. Alarmed, she hides in the great cavern of the sacral plexus, there to remain coiled up as a serpent, as her name implies, until the sage can lure her forth again by holy observances. Never should we lose sight of the relationship between the processes of the physical body and the universal orders. The umbilical cord is not only the divine ladder in the case of the goddess Kundalini, but is symbolic also of that spiritual cord by which man is ever suspended from his divine parent. While man's outer nature is nourished by physical food and drink, his inner nature receives life from the universal parent, transmitted by means of ethereal cords, analogous to the Umbilicus. In the Shinto mysteries of Japan, the luring of an obstinate goddess from her pout was a grave problem. The goddess of the sun, Amaterasu Omakami, had quarreled with the other celestials, and giving vent to her anger, hid herself, light and all, into a dark cavern, thus leaving the heavenly world in a condition of deplorable gloom. Realizing that the temperament of the goddess was endangering the whole order of creation, the immortals finally lured her forth by a stratagem which appealed to her vanity. They fashioned a great mirror, even as the titans polished the surface of the universe, that Bacchus might see his face therein. Standing this mirror in front of the cavern, they made a great ado as though in celebration of some fortuitous circumstance. 
chagrined at the thought that the gods could be happy without her. Amaterasu came to the cavern entrance and peered out to discover the cause of their merriment. As she looked, she saw her own face, surrounded by a halo of light reflected in the mirror. Wondering who this radiant person could be, and terrified by the possibility that the gods had somewhere discovered a new sun goddess, Amaterasu slowly approached the entrance of the cave, only to see the radiant figure in the mirror also increasing in splendor. At last, overcome by her jealousy, she dashed from the cave to discomfit the rival sun goddess. Whereupon the other celestials who had gathered above the cavern entrance dropped a net over the irate goddess as she rushed forth, thereby preventing her escape and ensuring that the sun should again light the world. Amaterasu and her mirror are household words in every Shinto home, and even the august imperial line regards the sun goddess as its founder, and her mirror is carried in the coronation ceremonials. The luring of the light out of the darkness is an allegory frequently employed by many ancient writers on mysticism. It represents the effort of material man to evoke, by discipline and fetish, that lucid or rational part of himself which, for some temperamental reason, refuses to make itself known. Offended by the crassness of the outer life, the aesthetic and superphysical attributes of the soul retire into the uttermost recesses of the nature there to await that more auspicious day when the awakening individual will concern himself with the nobler issues of life. The sages who ponder the problem of enticing the goddess from retirement signify the rational mind, the gods, and the intuitive instincts, while the priest represents the regenerated emotions. All these, holding solemn conclave together, finally lure the rational soul from its dark abode that its radiance may benefit the whole life. The invoking of the soul is possible only to those who have assumed the great work and resolved to live with the concerns of the spirit paramount. Through virtue, integrity, and aesthetics, the soul life is thus caused to diffuse its power throughout the nature, thereby quickening the parts and rendering the whole more responsive to divine impulse. From a consideration of these various allegories, it becomes evident that the latter signifies the thread or cord from which the generating soul is suspended, from its monadic or ungenerated part. The god of the philosophic elect is not technically a being, but rather this monad, a universal self. Approach to deity is consequently the elevation of the life to unity with its monadic cause. The abode of this monad is the true heaven world for heaven merely signifies the state of the one divorced from all quality or condition whatsoever and abiding in the felicity of its own nature, without beginning and without end. Thus the ascent of the ladder and the climbing of the knotted cord are both emblematic of man's ceaseless climb toward self. It is the retirement of life along the lines of its own first emanation. The natural ascent of the wise to wisdom, the virtuous to virtue, the beautiful to beauty, and the good to the enduring state of good. The latter, then, bridges that mysterious fourth-dimensional interval of quality described in chapter 10. It is the symbolic figure under which are concealed the tedious processes of crossing that vast interval between diversity and unity. The latter is the bridge of reason, the way of the gods. The stepped pyramid is significant of man's instinctive urge to build toward cause, and all action which tends to elevate, ennoble, or perfect may be conceived of as pyramidal, diagrammatically considered. Thus, in his discourse to his son on initiation, Hermes declares that the heart was built like a pyramid, in that the heart is the seat of aspiration, and aspiration is the universal building power. As the unknown God dwelt within the deepest recesses of the Great Pyramid, so a mysterious spirit dwells within the heart, man's house of the hidden places. The pyramid builders differed from all the other architects because of the purpose for which their edifices were constructed. All men are builders, a few in permanent things, the many in impermanent things. St. Paul calls himself a master builder by which he intimated that he had been initiated into that body of elect artisans banded together to the erection of everlasting houses. 
The pyramid thus became a symbol of those called together by an inner rationality who, moved by a divine intelligence, heaped up realities that they might form mountains, as it were, up where the aspiring soul could climb in its search for heaven. While many were cutters of stone, hewers of wood, and carriers of water, they were but apprentices of the noble art, not having heard as yet the call that inclines the soul away from temporal accomplishments to the building of those enduring monuments to qualities and convictions. The mystic masons, so we are told, built their lodges either upon the mountaintops or deep in the valleys, thus obscuring, intimating that the mysteries while in their own nature lofty institutions in the service of mankind descended into the depths of matter to effect the redemption of the human soul. God appeared to the patriarchs as a cloud over some lofty mountaintop, and his voice thundered among the summits. These sacred mountains, hovering places of the Most High, are the sanctified pyramids. These pyramids, in turn, are rationalized natures, the chief accomplishment of the master builders. They are altars set up in the wilderness to signify that integrity that has been established in a sphere to which integrity was once foreign. An ancient fable in describing the stature of one whom God has thus anointed and lifted up into the assemblage of the illumined declares that his face shone like the sun and all the brightness of the stars was in his eyes. The flow of his hair was like the rippling waves of great rivers and even his breath was as the soft breeze of spring sighing among the trees. Though his body was that of a man, his inner nature was as vast as the world, and his integrity rose like a mighty mountain, whose summit is forever hidden by the clouds of meditation. The laughter of this perfected one sounded like the song of the waterfall, yet his sorrow was like the cool of evening among the shelter of the trees. All the beauties of the universe were invoked to define his virtues and the immensities of space belittled his greatness. It follows that when such an illumined nature heaps together the stones of its accomplishments and forms therefrom the altar of its God, a high and holy place suitable for the reception of the eternal, the rational soul invoked by these accomplishments lends its power to the convocation of perfected faculties. Then, like the awful hierophant of Revelation, the rational self stands in splendid majesty in the midst of the flaming candles. Thus, all natures are symbolic ladders, for by ascending the concatenated orders of his own intelligence, man comes proximate to his own rational and enduring part. The allegory of Jack and the Beanstalk, which, like so many others' children's fables, had its origin in primitive folklore, well describes the mystery of the ladder. The beanstalk, which in a single night grew up to heaven, reminds one of the fabled mango tree of the elusive Hindu Mahatma, or the rope thrown into the air which does not fall. The miraculous growth of the magician's plant signifies the culturing of the soul. Every philosopher is a magician, for by the aid of his unfolded intellect, he accomplishes that which to the ignorant appears impossible. The rope, suspended from nothing, up to which the naked Hindu boy scampers out of sight, teaches a valuable lesson to such as will inquire into its meaning. The question is often asked by the incredulous, but how can the rope stay there with nothing to hold it? The magician may answer, it is well supported, only you do not see the support. The unenlightened behold the accomplishments of the wise, but the methods by which such ends are attained are incomprehensible. The great truths of life are like the magician's rope, held in their proper place by an unseen agent. Those unable to pierce the magician's subterfuge have eyes, but see not. The millions to whom the concerns of the spirit are of no importance. Who, though continually surrounded by manifestations of universal intelligence, are still oblivious to the whole pageantry? These are the truly blind, and their affliction is most grievous. In the allegory of the beanstalk, Jack is the initiate climbing upward toward perfection. The beanstalk has two significances. First, it is the secret doctrine which may grow up to its fullness in a single night, if that night be regarded as the duration of a soul in the mortal state. The beanstalk is further symbolic of the soul itself, up which consciousness must climb to discover the divine sphere from which it was exiled. 
It is noteworthy that when Jack reaches the upper world, where one would naturally expect beauty and tranquility to reign, he finds instead that his newly discovered sphere is the dwelling place of a fierce ogre, who has the distressing proclivity of using strangers to supply the requirements of his menu. This giant is the ancient Demiurgus, the lord of the world, the royal autocrat, the vast tyrant who opposes all who would climb out of their materiality. He is the selfishness, egotism, lust, and hate. He is the epitome of all physical attachment and the appetites by which man is inclined toward the corporeal state. He is the giant of form, the hero of little minds, the fetish of the materialist, the god of those who worship through the senses alone the supreme genius of the physical-minded, the magnificence to which fools bow down. Those who would escape the clutches of this giant must be wise indeed, for they must outwit themselves. In the ancient writings it is said that all will fail except a fortuitous destiny move with them, for skill will not suffice, prayers will be unavailing, and only the graciousness of the gods can ensure success. The subject of providence, or fortuitous destiny, is worthy of application at this point. One of the symbolic aphorisms of Pythagoras enjoined the disciple to abstain from the eating of beans. In its literal sense, there is seemingly no reason whatsoever for the admonition. Among the Greeks, however, beans were used in gambling and various games of chance, and the esoteric purpose of the admonition was to discharge man's reliance upon auspicious fortune. For he who consigns himself to the vagaries of chance in reality rests his fate upon his own integrity. This point is well made by Mephistopheles in Goeth's Faust. How closely linked are luck and merit! Doth never to these fools occur. Had they the philosopher's stone, I swear it, the stone would lack the philosopher. Man eternally struggles against the littleness that is himself, seeking to increase thereby the virtue of his own destiny. By such effort, he frequently is able to maintain a higher footing than would otherwise be his natural right. For effort shall not be left unrewarded. If, however, man seizes his struggle and doing nothing, trusts to providence for an auspicious throw, that which is his own will know his face, and his reward shall be according to the insufficiency of himself. He who trusts himself to himself is brave indeed. Luck is not what it seems, for it connives with law to bring about the undoing of the foolish. The bit and bridle which Nemesis carries, she slips over the head of the unwary. With blinders, she takes away his vision. With Shekrain, lifts his head so high that he can no longer see the road. And then with loose rein, drives him to destruction. But if the gods throw dice, they cannot lose for by reason of the very nature they are predestined to be the victors in every contest. Being as yet imperfect, however man may never relax his vigilance or seize his struggle, lest the imperfections which he seeks to outdistance overtake him and humiliate him. What, then, is providence? It is like flowing into like, a quality reproducing its kind. Providence is not what we desire, but what we actually are. And when we open the floodgates of fortune, we shall simply be inundated by the torrents of similars, drowned in the substances of ourselves. By confronting destiny with effort, we aspire to reach the ideal state of the higher self. But by appealing to fortune, we place ourselves in the keeping of an impersonal fate that tortures us with our every defect and decrees us to abide by the measure of our smallest virtue. Thus, only in the truly great is the appeal to fortune to be relied upon. For the rest, the law of labor is the only certain way. When it is written that man can succeed only when the gods are auspicious, it merely signifies that accomplishment depends upon the perfect mastery of self and the development of all parts, so that the flow of destiny brings to the disciple a propitious end to enterprise. Good fortune is not good to the foolish, nor is evil fortune evil to the wise. The foolish are incapable of benefiting from that which may in its own nature be good. Conversely, the wise are incapable of being injured by evil, for understanding renders all things usable. Thus, the identical so-called evil serves the philosopher while it undoes the thoughtless. 
The theory of evolution, as expounded by the ancient sages, does not agree with the Darwinian concept that life moves from one form or kind to another, but rather that life continually moves through the various states of itself. For example, plants do not move toward the perfection of man, nor does man incline toward the perfection of daemons. Each of these orders is complete in itself, moving inevitably toward its own perfection in the perfect unfoldment of its own intrinsic characteristics. Growth, then, is that eternal procession of qualities marching to unity with themselves. Man, the personality, approaches man, the idea, and achieves perfection by unity with his own paradigm. Man reaches completion when he perfectly fills the mold or pattern that exists in the transcendental spheres. Evolution, then, is the fitting of a nature into its own archetype, and its end is attained when no longer any point of difference remains between the object as a transitory body and the object as a permanent idea. By growth, we learn to become our essential selves, ordered after the precise image of our own divine prototype. That growth should be the process whereby man becomes reconciled to his own transcendental being may seem a strange thought, but to those who ponder the mystery, this truth becomes evident. Our path is rendered plain. We are destined by eternal providence to become the fullness of ourselves. Inclining to neither side nor departing from our persons, we shall find perfection in the consummation of the destiny for which we were first conceived. The imitator must fail because departing from self, he would assume the virtues of another rather than his own. Each individual is allotted an end peculiar to himself, and through uncounted millenniums moves inevitably toward that archetypal ideal patterned for him prior to his departure from universal self in quest of individuality. All creatures of a similar kind share a common origin and destiny. It is the peculiar purpose of men that they should become man and united in one nature constitute a complete being. That glorious assemblage of parts possessing three virtues, of which the first is completeness, and the other two are the poles of this completeness, namely rationality and permanence. Chapter 19. Rosicrucian and Masonic Orders Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect. Before it is possible to intelligently discuss the origin of the craft, it is necessary to establish the existence of these two separate yet interdependent orders, the one visible and the other invisible. The visible society is a splendid camaraderie of free and accepted men enjoined to devote themselves to ethical, educational, fraternal, patriotic, and humanitarian concerns. The Invisible Society is a secret and most august fraternity, whose members are dedicated to the service of a mysterious Arcanum Arcanorum. Those brethren who have essayed to write the history of their craft have not included in their disquisitions the story of that truly secret inner society, which is to the body Freemasonic what the heart is to the human body. In each generation, only a few are accepted into the inner sanctuary of the work. But these are veritable princes of truth, and their sainted names shall be remembered in future ages together with the seers and prophets of the elder world. Though the great initiate philosophers of Freemasonry can be counted upon one's fingers, yet their power is not to be measured by the achievements of ordinary men. They are dwellers upon the threshold of the innermost, masters of that secret doctrine which forms the invisible foundation of every great theological and rational institution. The outer history of the Masonic Order is one of noble endeavor, altruism, and splendid enterprise. The inner history, one of silent conquest, persecution, and heroic martyrdom. The body of Masonry rose from the guilds of workmen who wandered the face of medieval Europe but the spirit of masonry walked with God before the universe was spread out or the scroll of the heavens unrolled. The enthusiasm of the young mason is the effervescence of a pardonable pride. Let him extol the merits of his craft, reciting its steady growth, its fraternal spirit, and its worthy undertakings. Let him boast of splendid buildings and an ever-increasing sphere of influence. 
These are the tangible evidence of power and should rightly set a flutter the heart of the apprentice who does not fully comprehend as yet that great strength which abides in silence or that unutterable dignity to be sensed only by those who have been raised into the contemplation of the inner mystery. An obstacle well nigh insurmountable is to convince the mason that the secrets of his craft are worthy of his profound consideration. As St. Paul, so we are told, kicked against the pricks of conversion, so the rank and file of present-day Masons strenuously oppose any effort put forth to interpret Masonic symbols in the light of philosophy. They are seemingly obsessed by the fear that, from their ritualism, may be extracted a meaning more profound than is actually contained therein. For years it has been a moot question whether Freemasonry is actually a religious organization. Masonry, writes Pike in the Legenda for the 19th degree, has and always had a religious creed. It teaches what it deems to be the truth in respect to the nature and attributes of God. The more studious-minded Mason regards the craft as an aggregation of thinkers concerned with the deeper mysteries of life. The all-too-prominent young members of the fraternity, however, if not openly skeptical, are at least indifferent to these weightier issues. The champions of philosophic masonry, alas, are a weak, small voice which grows weaker and smaller as time goes by. In fact, There are actual blocks among the brethren who would divorce masonry from both philosophy and religion at any and all cost. If, however, we search the writings of eminent masons, we find a unanimity of viewpoint, namely that masonry is a religious and philosophic body. Every effort initiated to elevate masonic thought to its true position has thus invariably emphasized the metaphysical and ethical aspects of the craft. But a superficial perusal of available documents will demonstrate that the modern Masonic order is not united respecting the true purpose for its own existence. Nor will this factor of doubt be dispelled until the origin of the craft is established beyond all quibbling. The elements of Masonic history are strangely elusive. There are gaps which apparently cannot be bridged. Who the early Freemasons really were, states Gould in a concise history of Freemasonry, and whence they came, may afford a tempting theme for inquiry to the speculative antiquary. But it is enveloped in obscurity and lies far outside the domain of authentic history. Between modern Freemasonry with its vast body of ancient symbolism and those original mysteries which first employed these symbols, there is a dark interval of centuries. To the conservative Masonic historian, the deductions of such writers as Higgins, Churchward, Veil and weight, though ingenious and fascinating, actually prove nothing. That masonry is a body of ancient lore is self evident, but the tangible link necessary to convince the recalcitrant brethren that their order is the direct successor of the pagan mysteries has unfortunately not been adduced to date. Of such problems as these is composed the angel with which the Masonic Jacob must wrestle throughout the night. It is possible to trace masonry back a few centuries with comparative ease, but then the thread suddenly vanishes from sight in a maze of secret societies and political enterprises. Dimly silhouetted in the mists that becloud these tangled issues are such figures as Cagliostro, Comte de Saint Germain, and Saint Martin. But even the connection between these individuals and the craft has never been clearly defined. Writings of early Masonic history is involved in such obvious hazard as to provoke the widespread conclusion that further search is futile. The average Masonic student is content, therefore, to trace his craft back to the workmen who chipped and chiseled the cathedrals and public buildings of medieval Europe. While such men as Albert Pike have realized this attitude to be ridiculous, it is one thing to declare it insufficient and quite another to prove the fallacy to an adamantine mind. So much has been lost and forgotten, so much ruled in and out by those unfitted for such legislative revision, that the modern rituals do not in every case represent the original rites of the craft. In his symbolism, Pike, who spent a lifetime in the quest for Masonic secrets, declares that few of the original meanings of the symbols are known to the modern order, 
nearly all the so-called interpretations now given being superficial. Pike confessed that the original meanings of the very symbols he himself was attempting to interpret were irretrievably lost, that even such familiar emblems as the apron and the pillars were locked mysteries whose keys had been thrown away by the uninformed. The initiated, writes John Fellows, as well as those without the pale of the order, are equally ignorant of their derivation and import. Preston, Gould, Mackey, Oliver, and Pike, in fact, nearly every great historian of Freemasonry, have all admitted the possibility of the modern society being connected, indirectly at least, with the ancient mysteries. And their descriptions of the modern society are prefaced by excerpts from ancient writings descriptive of primitive ceremonials. These eminent Masonic scholars have recognized in the legend of Hiram Abiff an adaptation of the Osiris myth, nor do they deny that the major part of the symbolism of the craft is derived from the pagan institutions of antiquity, when the gods were venerated in secret places with strange figures and appropriate rituals. Though cognizant of the exalted origin of their order, these historians, either through fear or uncertainty, have failed to drive home the one point necessary to establish the true purpose of Freemasonry. They did not realize that the mysteries whose rituals Freemasonry perpetuates were the custodians of a secret philosophy of life, of such transcendent nature that it can be entrusted to only an individual tested and proved beyond any possibility of human frailty. The secret schools of Greece and Egypt were neither fraternal nor political fundamentally, nor were their ideals similar to those of the modern craft. They were essentially philosophic and religious institutions, and all admitted into them were consecrated to the service of the sovereign good. Modern Freemasons, however, regard their craft as neither primarily philosophic nor religious, but rather as ethical. Strange as it may seem, the majority openly ridicule the very supernatural powers and agencies for which their symbols stand. The secret doctrine that flows through Freemasonic symbols, and to whose perpetuation the invisible Masonic body is consecrated, has its source in three ancient and exalted orders. The first is the Dionysiac artificers, the second the Roman Collegia, and the third the Arabian Rosicrucians. The Dionysians were the master builders of the ancient world, originally founded to design and erect the theaters of Dionysus, wherein were enacted the tragic dramas of the rituals. This order was repeatedly elevated by popular acclaim to greater dignity, until at last it was entrusted with the planning and construction of all public edifices concerned with the commonwealth, or the worship of the gods and heroes. Hiram, king of Tyre, was the patron of the Dionysians, who flourished in Tyre and Sidon, and Hiram Abiff, if we may believe the sacred account, was himself a grand master of this most noble order of pagan builders. King Solomon, in his wisdom, accepted the services of this famous craftsman, and thus, at the instigation of Hiram, king of Tyre, Hiram Abiff, though himself a member of a different faith, journeyed from his own country to design and supervise the erection of the everlasting house to the true God on Mount Moriah. The tools of the builder's craft were first employed by the Dionysian as symbols under which to conceal the mysteries of the soul and the secrets of human regeneration. The Dionysians also first likened man to a rough ashlar, which, trued into a finished block through the instrument of reason, could be fitted into the structure of that living and eternal temple, built without the sound of hammer, the voice of workmen, or any tool of contention. The Roman Collegia was a branch of the Dionysiacs, and to it belonged those initiated artisans who fashioned the impressive monuments whose ruins still lend their immortal glory to the eternal city. In his Ten Books on Architecture, Vitruvius, the initiate of the Collegia, has revealed that which was permissible concerning the secrets of his holy order. Of the inner mysteries, however, he could not write, for these were reserved for such as had donned the leather apron of the craft. In his consideration of the books now available concerning the mysteries, the thoughtful reader should note the following words appearing in a 12th century volume entitled Artifil Liber Secretus. Is not this an art full of secrets? 
And believest thou, O fool, that we plainly teach this secret of secrets, taking our words according to their literal interpretation? Into the stones they trude. The adepts of the collegia deeply carved their Gnostic symbols. From earliest times, the initiated stone cutters marked their perfected works with the secret emblems of their crafts and degrees, that unborn generations might realize that the master builders of the first ages also labored for the same ends sought by men today. The mysteries of Egypt and Persia, that had found a haven in the Arabian desert, reached Europe by the way of the Knights Templars and the Rosicrucians. The Temple of the Rose Cross at Damascus had preserved the secret philosophy of the Rose of Sharon. The Druses of the Lebanon mountains still retained the mysticism of ancient Syria. And the dervishes, as they lean on their carved and crotchet sticks, still meditate upon the secret instruction perpetuated from the days of the four caliphs. From the far places of Iraq and the hidden retreats of the Sufi mystics, the ancient wisdom found its way into Europe. Was Jacques de Molay burned by the Holy Inquisition merely because he wore the Red Cross of the Templar? What were those secrets to which he was true even in death? Did his companion knights perish with him merely because they had amassed a fortune and exercised an unusual degree of temporal power? To the thoughtless these may constitute ample grounds, but to those who can pierce the film of the specious and the superficial, they are assuredly insufficient was not the physical power of the Templars, but the knowledge which they had brought with them from the East, that the Church feared. The Templars had discovered part of the great Arcanum. They had become wise in those mysteries which had been celebrated in Mecca thousands of years before the advent of Muhammad. They had read a few pages from the dread book of the Anthropos, and for this knowledge they were doomed to die. What was the black magic of which the Templars were accused? What was Baphomet, the goat of Mendes, whose mysteries they were declared to have celebrated? All these are questions worthy of thoughtful consideration by every studious mason. Truth is eternal. The so-called revelations of truth that come in different religions are actually but a re-emphasis of the ever-existing doctrine. Moses did not originate a new religion for Israel. He simply adapted the mysteries of Egypt to the needs of Israel. The Ark, triumphantly borne by the twelve tribes through the wilderness, was copied after the Isaac Ark, which may be still traced in faint bas-relief upon the ruins of the Temple of Philae. Even the two brooding cherubim over the mercy seat are visible in the Egyptian carving, furnishing indubitable evidence that the secret doctrine of Egypt was the prototype of Israel's mystery religion. In his reformation of Indian philosophy, Buddha likewise did not reject the esotericism of the Brahmins, but rather adapted this esotericism to the needs of the masses in India. The mystic secrets locked within the holy Vedas were disclosed in order that all men, irrespective of caste, might partake of wisdom and share in a common heritage of good. Jesus was a rabbi of the Jews, a teacher of the holy law who discoursed in the synagogue interpreting the Torah according to the teachings of his sect. He brought no new message, nor were his reformations radical. He merely tore away the veil from the temple in order that not only Pharisee and Sadducee, but also publican and sinner might together behold the glory of an ageless faith. In his cavern on Mount Hira, Muhammad prayed not for new truths, but for old truths to be restated in their original purity and simplicity in order that men might understand again the primitive religion, God's clear revelation to the first patriarchs. The mysteries of Islam have been celebrated in the sanctuary of the Kaaba centuries before the holy pilgrimage. The prophet was but the reformer of a decadent pagandom, the smasher of idols, the purifier of defiled mysteries. The dervishes who patterned their garments after those of the prophet still preserve that inner teaching of the elect. And for them, the axis of the earth, the supreme hierophant, visible only to the faith, still sits in meditation upon the flat roof of the Kaaba. Neither carpenter nor camel driver, as Abu Baha might have said, can fashion a world religion from the substances of his own mind. Neither prophet nor savior, 
preached a doctrine which was his own, but in language suitable to his time and race retold that ancient wisdom, which had been preserved within the mysteries since the dawning of human consciousness. So with the Masonic mysteries of today, each Mason has at hand those lofty principles of universal order upon whose certainties the faiths of mankind have ever been established. Father C.R.C., the Master of the Rosy Cross, was initiated into the great work at Damkar. Later at Fez, further information was given him relating to the sorcery of the Arabians. From these wizards of the desert, he also secured the sacred book M, which is declared to have contained the accumulated knowledge of the world. He translated this volume into Latin for the edification of his order, but only the initiates know the present hidden repository of the Rosicrucian manuscripts, charters, and manifestos. From the Arabians, CRC also learned of the elemental peoples and how, with their aid, it was possible to gain admission to the ethereal world, where dwelt the genie and nature spirits. He thus discovered that the magical creatures of the Arabian Nights entertainment actually existed though invisible to the ordinary mortal. From astrologers living in the desert far from the concourse of the marketplace, he was further instructed concerning the mysteries of the stars, the virtues resident in the astral light, the rituals of magic and invocation, the preparation of therapeutic talismans, and the binding of the genie. He became an adept in the gathering of medicinal herbs, the transmutation of metals, and the manufacture of precious gems by artificial means. Even the secrets of the elixir of life and the universal panacea were communicated to him. Enriched beyond the dreams of Croesus, the Holy Master returned to Europe and there established a house of wisdom which he called Domus Sancti Spiritus. This house he enveloped in clouds, it is said, so that men could not discover it. What are these clouds? But the rituals and symbols under which is concealed the great arcanum, that unspeakable mystery which every true mason must seek if he would become in reality a prince of the royal secret. Paracelsus, the Swiss Hermes, was initiated into the secrets of alchemy in Constantinople, and there beheld the consummation of the magnum opus. He is consequently entitled to be mentioned among those initiated by the Arabians into the Rosicrucian work. Cagliostro was also initiated by the Arabians, and because of the knowledge he has thus secured and incurred the displeasure of the Holy See. From the unprobed depths of Arabian Rosicrucianism issued the illustrious Comte de Saint Germain, over whose Masonic activities the veil of impenetrable mystery still hangs. The exalted body of initiates whom he represented, as well as the mission he came to accomplish, have both been concealed from the members of the craft at large, and are apparent only to those few discerning Masons who sense the supernal philosophic destiny of their fraternity. The modern Masonic order can be traced back to a period in European history famous for its intrigue both political and sociological. Between the years 1600 and 1800, mysterious agents moved across the face of the continent. The forerunner of modern thought was beginning to make its appearance, and all Europe was passing through the throes of internal dissension and reconstruction. Democracy was in its infancy, yet its potential power was already being felt. Thrones were beginning to totter. The aristocracy of Europe was like the old man and Sinbad's back. It was becoming more unbearable with every passing day. Although upon the surface national governments were seemingly able to cope with the situation, there was a definite undercurrent of impending change. Out of the masses, long patient under the yoke oppression, were rising up the champions of religious, philosophic, and political liberty. These led the factions of the dissatisfied, people with legitimate grievances against the intolerance of the church and the oppression of the crown, out of this struggle for expression, certain definite ideals materialized, which have now come to be considered peculiarly Masonic. The divine prerogatives of humanity were being crushed out by the three great powers of ignorance, superstition, and fear. Ignorance, the power of the mob. Superstition, the power of the church. And fear, the power of the despot. 
Between the thinker and personal liberty loomed the three ruffians, or personifications of impediment, the torch, the crown, and the tiara. Brute force, kingly power, and ecclesiastical persuasion became the agents of a great oppression, the motive of a deep unrest, the deterrent to all progress. It was unlawful to think, well-nigh fatal to philosophize, rank heresy to doubt. The question the infallibility of the existing order was to invite the persecution of the church and the state. Together they incited the populace, which thereupon played the role of executioner for those arch-enemies of human liberty. Thus the ideal of democracy assumed a definite form during these stormy periods of European history. This democracy was not only a vision but a retrospection, not only a looking forward but a gazing backward upon better days and the effort to project those better days into the unborn tomorrow. The ethical, political, and philosophical institutions of antiquity, with their constructive effect upon the whole structure of the state, were noble examples of possible conditions. It became the dream of the oppressed to re-establish a golden age upon the earth, an age in which the thinker could think in safety and the dreamer dream in peace, when the wise should lead and the simple follow, yet all dwell together in fraternity and industry. During this period several books were in circulation, which to a certain degree registered the pulse of the time. One of these documents, Moore's Utopia, was the picture of a new age when heavenly conditions should prevail upon the earth. This ideal of establishing good in the world savored of blasphemy, for in that day it was assumed that heaven alone could be good. Men did not seek to establish heavenly conditions upon earth, but rather earthly conditions in heaven. According to popular concept, the more the individual suffered the torments of the damned upon earth, the more he would enjoy the blessedness in heaven. Life was a period of chastisement, an earthly happiness and unattainable mirage. Moore's utopia thus came as a definite blow to autocratic pretensions and attitudes, giving impulse to the material emphasis which was to follow in succeeding centuries. Another prominent figure of this period was Sir Walter Raleigh, who paid with his life for high treason against the crown. Raleigh was tried, and though the charge was never proved, he was executed. Before he went to trial, it was known that he must die, and that no defense could save him. His treason against the crown was of a character very different, however, from that which history records. Raleigh was a member of a secret society, or body of men, which was already moving irresistibly forward under the banner of democracy, and for that affiliation he died a felon's death. The actual reason for his death sentence was his refusal to reveal the identity of that great political organization of which he was a member, or his confrères who were fighting the dogma of faith and the divine right of kings. On the title page of the first edition of Raleigh's History of the World, we accordingly find a mass of intricate emblems framed between two columns. When the executioner sealed his lips forever, Raleigh's silence, while it added to the discomfiture of his persecutors, assured the safety of his colleagues. One of the truly great minds of that secret fraternity, in fact, the moving spirit of the whole enterprise, was Sir Francis Bacon, whose prophecy of the coming age forms the theme of his new Atlantis, and whose vision of the reformation of knowledge finds expression in the Novum Organum. In the engraving at the beginning of the latter volume may be seen the little ship of progressivism sailing out between the pillars of Galenic and Avicennian philosophy, venturing forth beyond the imaginary pillars of church and state upon the unknown sea of human liberty. It is significant that Bacon was appointed by the British crown to protect its interests in the new American colonies beyond the sea. We find him writing of this new land, dreaming of the day when a new world and a new government of the philosophic elect should be established there, and scheming to consummate that end when the right time came. Upon the title page of the 1640 edition of Bacon's Advancement of Learning is a Latin motto to the effect that he was the third great mind since Plato. Bacon was a member of the same group to which Sir Walter Raleigh belonged but Bacon's position as Lord Chancellor protected him from Raleigh's fate. 
Every effort was made, however, to humiliate and discredit him. At last, in the 66th year of his life, he completed the work which held him in England. He feigned death and passed over into Germany, there to guide the destinies of his philosophic and political fraternity for nearly 25 years before his actual demise. Other notable characters of the period are Montaigne, Ben Jonson, Marlowe, and the great Franz Joseph of Transylvania, the latter one of the most important as well as active figures in all this drama, a man who seized fighting Austria and retired to a monastery in Transylvania from where he directed the activities of his secret society. One political upheaval followed another. The grand climax culminated in the French Revolution which was directly precipitated by the attacks upon the person of Alessandro Cagliostro, the divine Cagliostro, by far the most picturesque character of the time, has the distinction of being more maligned than any other person of history. Tried by the Inquisition for founding a Masonic lodge in the city of Rome, he was sentenced to die, a sentence later commuted by the Pope to life imprisonment in the old castle of San Leo, Shortly after his incarceration, Cagliostro disappeared, and the story was circulated that he had been strangled in an attempt to escape from prison. In reality, he was liberated and returned to his masters in the East. But Cagliostro, the idol of France, surnamed the Father of the Poor, who never received anything from anyone and gave everything to everyone, was most adequately revenged. Though the people little understood this inexhaustible picture of bounty which poured forth benefits that never required replenishment, they remembered him in the day of their power. Cagliostro founded the Egyptian Rite of Freemasonry, which received into its mysteries many of the French nobility, and was regarded favorably by the most learned minds of Europe. Having established the Egyptian rite, Cagliostro declared himself to be an agent of the Order of the Knights Templars, and to have received initiation from them on the Isle of Malta. See Morals and Dogma, in which Albert Pike quotes Eliphas Levi on Cagliostro's affiliation with the Templars. Called upon the carpet by the Supreme Council of France, it was demanded of Cagliostro that he prove by what authority he had founded a Masonic lodge in Paris, independent of the Grand Orient. Of such surpassing mentality was Cagliostro that the Supreme Council found it difficult to secure an advocate qualified to discuss with him philosophic masonry and the ancient mysteries he claimed to represent. Court de Gabelin, the greatest Egyptologist of his day and an authority on ancient philosophies, was chosen as the outstanding scholar. A time was set and the brethren convened. Attired in an oriental coat and a pair of violet-colored breeches, Cagliostro was hailed before this council of his peers. Court Gabelin asked three questions, and then sat down, admitting himself disqualified to interrogate a man so much his superior in every branch of learning. Cagliostro then took the floor, revealing to the assembled masons not only his personal qualifications, but prophesying the future of France. He foretold the fall of the French throne, the reign of terror, and the fall of the Bastille. At a later time, he revealed the dates of the death of Marie Antoinette and the king, and also the advent of Napoleon. Having finished his address, he made a spectacular exit, leaving the French Masonic Lodge in consternation and utterly incapable of coping with the profundity of his reasoning. Though no longer regarded as a ritual in Freemasonry, the Egyptian rite is available, and all who read it will recognize its author to have been no more than a charlatan than was Plato. Then appears that charming first American gentleman, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, who together with the Marquis de Lafayette played an important role in this drama of empires. While in France, Dr. Franklin was privileged to receive definite esoteric instruction. It is noteworthy that he was the first in America to reprint Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons, which is a most prized work on the subject, though its accuracy is disputed. Through all this stormy period, these impressive figures come and go, part of a definite organization of political and religious thought, 
a functioning body of philosophers represented in Spain by no less an individual than Cervantes, in France by Cagliostro and Saint Germain, in Germany by Gichtel and Andre, in England by Bacon, Moore, and Raleigh, and in America by Washington and Franklin. Coincident with the Baconian agitation in England, the Fama Fraternatus and Confessio Fraternatus appeared in Germany, both of these works being contributions to the establishment of a philosophic government upon the earth. One of the outstanding links between the Rosicrucian mysteries of the Middle Ages and modern masonry is Elias Ashmole, the historian of the Order of the Garter, and the first Englishman to compile the alchemical writings of the English chemists. The foregoing may seem to be a useless recital of inanities, but its purpose is to impress upon the reader's mind the philosophical and political situation in Europe at the time of the inception of the Masonic Order. A philosophic clan, as it were, which had moved across the face of Europe under such names as the Illuminati and the Rosicrucians, had undermined in a subtle manner the entire structure of regal and sacerdotal supremacy. The founders of Freemasonry were all men who were more or less identified with the progressive tendencies of their day. Mystics, philosophers, and alchemists were all bound together with a secret tie and dedicated to the emancipation of humanity from ignorance and oppression. In my researches among ancient books and manuscripts, I have pieced together a little story of probabilities which has a direct bearing upon the subject. Long before the establishment of Freemasonry as a fraternity, a group of mystics founded in Europe that was called the Society of Unknown Philosophers. Prominent among the profound thinkers who formed the membership of this society were the alchemists who were engaged in transmuting the political and religious base metal of Europe into ethical and spiritual gold, the Kabbalists, who as investigators of the superior orders of nature sought to discover a stable foundation for human government, and lastly the astrologers who, from a study of the procession of the heavenly bodies, hoped to find therein the rational archetype for all mundane procedure. Here and there is to be found a character who contacted this society. By some it is believed that both Martin Luther and that great mystic Philip Melanchthon were connected with it. The first edition of the King James Bible, which was edited by Francis Bacon and prepared under Masonic supervision, bears more Masons' marks than the Cathedral of Strasbourg. The same is true respecting the Masonic symbolism found in the first English edition of Flavius Josephus's The Antiquities of the Jews. For some time, the Society of Unknown Philosophers moved extraneous to the Church. Among the fathers of the church, however, were a great number of scholarly and intelligent men who were keenly interested in philosophy and ethics, prominent among them being the German Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, who was recognized as one of the great scholars of his day, a Rosicrucian and also a member of the Society of Unknown Philosophers, as revealed by the cryptograms in his writings. Kircher was in harmony with the program of philosophic reconstruction. Since learning was largely limited to churchmen, the body of philosophers soon developed an overwhelming preponderance of ecclesiastics in its membership. The original anti-ecclesiastical ideals of the society were speedily reduced to an innocuous state, and the organization gradually became an actual auxiliary of the church. A small portion of the membership, however, maintained an aloofness from the literati of the faith or it represented an unorthodox class, the alchemists, Rosicrucians, Kabbalists, and magicians. This latter group accordingly retired from the outer body of the society that had become to known as the Order of the Golden and Rose Cross, and whose adepts were elevated to the dignity of Knights of the Golden Stone. Upon the withdrawal of these initiated adepts, a powerful clerical body remained, which possessed considerable of the ancient lore, but in many instances lacked the keys by which this symbolism could be interpreted. As this body continued to increase in temporal power, its philosophical power grew correspondingly less. A smaller group of adepts that had withdrawn from the order apparently remained inactive, having retired to what they termed the House of the Holy Spirit where they were enveloped by certain mists impenetrable to the eyes of the profane. 
Among these reclusive adepts must be included such well-known Rosicrucians as Robert Flood, Eugenius Philalethes, John Hayden, Michael Mayer, and Henry Kunrath. These adepts in their retirement constituted a loosely organized society which, though lacking the solidarity of a definite fraternity, occasionally initiated a candidate and met annually at a specified place. It was the Comte de Chazelle, an initiate of this order, who raised Dr. Sigismund Backstrom while the latter was on the Isle of Mauritius. In due time, the original members of the order passed on, after first entrusting their secrets to carefully chosen successors. In the meantime, a group of men in England, under the leadership of such mystics as Ashmole and Flood, had resolved upon repopularizing the ancient learning and reclassifying philosophy in accordance with Bacon's plan for a world encyclopedia. These men had undertaken to reconstruct ancient Platonic and Gnostic mysticism, but were unable to attain their objective for lack of information. Elias Ashmole may have been a member of the European order of Rosicrucians and as such evidently knew that in various parts of Europe there were isolated individuals who were in possession of the secret doctrine handed down an unbroken line from the ancient Greeks and Egyptians through Boethius, the early Christian church, and the Arabians. The efforts of the English group to contact such individuals were evidently successful. Several initiated Rosicrucians were brought from the mainland to England, where they remained for a considerable time designing the symbolism of Freemasonry and incorporating into the rituals of the order the same divine principles and philosophy that had formed the inner doctrine of all great secret societies. From the time of the Eleusinia in Greece. In fact, the Eleusinian mysteries themselves continued in the custody of the Arabians, as attested by the presence of Masonic symbols and figures upon early Mohammedan monuments. The adepts who were brought over from the continent to sit in council with the English philosophers were initiates of the Arabian rites and through them the mysteries were ultimately returned to Christendom. Upon completion of the bylaws of the new fraternity, the initiates retired again to Central Europe, leaving a group of disciples to develop the outer organization which was to function as a sort of screen to conceal the activities of the esoteric order. Such in brief is the story which we are able to piece together from the fragmentary bits of evidence available. The whole structure of Freemasonry is founded upon the activities of this secret society of Central European adepts, whom the studious Mason will find to be the definite link between the modern craft and the ancient wisdom. The outer body of Masonic philosophy was merely the veil of this Kabbalistic order, whose members were the custodians of the true arcanum. Does this inner and secret brotherhood of initiates still exist independent of the Freemasonic order? Evidence points to the fact that it does, for these august adepts are the actual preservers of those secret operative processes of the Greeks, whereby the illumination and completion of the individual is effected. They are the veritable guardians of the lost word, the keepers of the inner mystery, and the mason who searches for and discovers them is rewarded beyond all mortal estimation. In the preface to a book entitled Long Livers, published in 1772, Eugenius Philalethes, the Rosicrucian initiate, thus addressed his brethren of the most ancient and most honorable fraternity of the Freemasons. Remember that you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and the fire of the universe. You are living stones built upon a spiritual house, who believe and rely on the chief lapis angularis, which the refractory and disobedient builders disallowed. You are called from darkness to light. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This makes you, my dear brethren, fit companions for the greatest kings, and no wonder, since the king of kings hath condescended to make you so to himself, compared to whom the mightiest and most haughty princes of the earth are but as worms. And that not so much as we are all sons of the same one eternal father, by whom all things were made, but inasmuch as we do the will of his and our father which is in heaven. You see now your high dignity, you see what you are, act accordingly, and show yourselves what you are, men, and walk worthy the high profession to which you are called. Remember, then, what the great end we all aim at is. Is it not to be happy here and hereafter?
for they both depend on each other. The seeds of that eternal peace and tranquility and everlasting repose must be sown in this life. And he that would glorify and enjoy the sovereign good then must learn to do it now, and from contemplating the creature gradually ascend to adore the Creator. Of all obstacles to surmount in matters of rationality, the most difficult is that of prejudice. Even the casual observer must realize that the true wealth of Freemasonry lies in its mysticism. The average Masonic scholar is fundamentally opposed to a mystical interpretation of his symbols, for he shares the attitude of the modern mind in its general antipathy towards transcendentalism. A most significant fact, however, is that those Masons who have won signal honors for their contributions to the craft have been transcendentalists almost without exception. It is quite incredible that any initiated brother, when presented with a copy of Morals and Dogma upon the conferment of his 14th degree, can read that volume and yet maintain that his order is not identical with the mystery schools of the First Ages. Much of the writings of Albert Pike are extracted from the books of the French magician Eliphas Levi, one of the greatest transcendentalists of modern times. Levi was an occultist, a metaphysician, a Platonic philosopher, who by the rituals of magic invoked even the spirit of Apollonius of Tyana, and yet Pike has inserted in his Morals and Dogma whole pages and even chapters, practically verbatim. To Pike, the following remarkable tribute was paid by Sterling Kerr, Jr., 33rd degree, Deputy Inspector General for the District of Columbia, upon crowning with laurel the bust of Pike in the House of the Temple. Pike was an oracle greater than that of Delphi. He was truth's minister and priest. His victories were those of peace. Long may his memory live in the hearts of the brethren. Affectionately termed Albertus Magnus by his admirers, Pike wrote of hermeticism and alchemy and hinted at the mysteries of the temple. Through his zeal and unflagging energy, American Freemasonry was raised from comparative obscurity to become the most powerful organization in the land. Though Pike, a transcendental thinker, was the recipient of every honor that the Freemasonic bodies of the world could confer, the modern Mason is loath to admit that transcendentalism has any place in Freemasonry. This is an attitude filled with embarrassment and inconsistency, for whichever way the Mason turns, he is confronted by these inescapable issues of philosophy and the mysteries. Yet, with all he dismisses, the entire subject as being more or less a survival of primitive superstitions. The Mason who had discovered the lost word must remember that in the first ages every neophyte was a man of profound learning and unimpeachable character, who for the sake of wisdom and virtue had faced death unafraid, and had triumphed over those limitations of the flesh, which bind most mortals to the sphere of mediocrity. In those days, the rituals were not put on by degree teams who handled candidates as though they were perishable commodities, but by priests deeply versed in the lore of their cults. Not one Freemason out of a thousand could have survived the initiations of the pagan rites, for the tests were given in those strenuous days when men were men and death the reward of failure. The neophyte of the Druid mysteries was set adrift in a small boat to battle the stormy sea, and unless his knowledge of natural law enabled him to quell the storm as did Jesus upon the Sea of Galilee, he returned no more. In the Egyptian rites of Serapis, it was required of the neophyte that he cross an unbridged chasm in the temple floor. In other words, if unable by magic to sustain himself in the air without visible support, he fell headlong into a volcanic crevice, there to die of heat and suffocation. In one of the Mithraic rites, the candidate seeking admission to the inner sanctuary was required to pass through a closed door by dematerialization. A philosopher who has authenticated the reality of ordeals such as these no longer entertains the popular error that the performance of miracles is confined solely to biblical characters. Do you still ask, writes Pike, if it has its secrets and mysteries? It is certain that something in the ancient initiations was regarded as of immense value. By such intellects as Herodotus, Plutarch, and Cicero, the magicians of Egypt were able to imitate several of the miracles wrought by Moses. 
and the science of the hierophants of the mysteries produced effects that, to the initiated, seemed mysterious and supernatural. It is self-evident that he who passed successively through these arduous tests involving both natural and also supernatural hazards was a man apart in his community. Such an initiate was deemed to be more than human, for he had achieved where countless ordinary mortals, having failed, had returned no more. Let us hear the words of Apuleius, when admitted into the Temple of Isis, as recorded in the Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass. Then also the priest, all the profane being removed, taking hold of me by the hand, brought me to the penetralia of the temple, clothed in a new linen garment. Perhaps, inquisitive reader, you will very anxiously ask me what was then said and done. I would tell you, if it could be lawfully told, you should know it, if it were lawful for you to hear it, but both ears and the tongue are guilty of rash curiosity. Nevertheless, I will not keep you in suspense with religious desire, nor torment you with a long-continued anxiety. Hear, therefore, but believe what is true. I approached to the confines of death, and having trod on the threshold of Proserpine, I returned from it, being carried through all the elements. At midnight I saw the sun shining with a splendid light, and I manifestly drew near to the gods beneath, and the gods above, and proximately adored them. Behold, I have narrated to you things, of which, though heard, is nevertheless necessary that you should be ignorant. I will therefore only relate that which may be enunciated to the understanding of the profane without a crime. Kings and princes paid homage to the initiate, the newborn man, the favorite of the gods. The initiate had actually entered into the presence of the divine beings. He had died, been raised again into the radiant sphere of everlasting light. Seekers after wisdom journeyed across great continents to hear his words, and his sayings were treasured with the revelations of oracles. It was esteemed an honor to receive from such a one an inclination of the head, a kindly smile, or a gesture of approbation. Disciples gladly paid with their lives for the master's word of praise, and died of a broken heart at his rebuke. On one occasion, Pythagoras became momentarily irritated because of the seeming stupidity of one of his students. The master's displeasure so preyed upon the mind of the humiliated youth that, drawing a knife from the folds of his garment, he committed suicide. So greatly moved was Pythagoras by the incident that never from that time on was he known to lose patience with any of his followers, regardless of the provocation. With a smile of paternal indulgence, the venerable master who senses the true dignity of the mystic tie should gravely incline the minds of the brethren toward the sublimer issues of the craft. The officer who would serve his lodge most effectively must realize he is of an order apart from other men, that he is the keeper of an awful secret, that the chair upon which he sits is the seat of immortals and that if he would be a worthy successor to those master masons of other ages, his thoughts must be measured by the profundity of Pythagoras and the lucidity of Plato. Enthroned in the radiant east, the worshipful master is the light of his lodge, the representative of the gods, one of that long line of hierophants who, through the blending of their rational powers with the reason of the ineffable, have been accepted into the great school. This high priest, after an ancient order, must realize that those before him are not merely a gathering of properly tested men, but the custodians of an eternal lore, the guardians of a sacred truth, the perpetuators of an ageless wisdom, the consecrated servants of a living God, the wardens of a supreme mystery. A new day is dawning for Freemasonry. From the insufficiency of theology and the hopelessness of materialism, men are turning to seek the god of philosophy. In this new era wherein the old order of things is breaking down and the individual is rising triumphant above the monotony of the masses, there is much work to be accomplished. The temple builder is needed as never before. A great reconstruction period is at hand. The debris of a fallen culture must be cleared away. The old footings must be found again that a new temple significant of a new revelation of law may be raised thereon. This is the peculiar work of the builder. This is the high duty for which he was called out of the world. 
This is the noble enterprise for which he was raised and given the tools of his craft. By doing his part in the reorganization of society, the workman may earn his wages, as all good masons should. A new light is breaking in the East. A more glorious day is at hand. The rule of the philosophic elect, the dream of the ages, will yet be realized and it is not far distant. To her loyal sons, Freemasonry sends this clarion call. Arise ye, the day of labor is at hand, the great work awaits completion, and the days of man's life are few. Like the singing guildsmen of bygone days, the craft of the builders marches victoriously down the broad avenues of time. Their song is of labor and glorious endeavor. Their anthem is of toil and industry. They rejoice in their noble destiny, for they are builders of cities, the hewers of worlds, the master craftsmen of the universe. On one occasion, Pythagoras became momentarily irritated because of the seeming stupidity of one of his students. The master's displeasure so preyed upon the mind of the humiliated youth that, drawing a knife from the folds of his garment, he committed suicide. So greatly moved was Pythagoras by the incident that never from that time on was he known to lose patience with any of his followers, regardless of the provocation. With a smile of paternal indulgence, the venerable master who senses the true dignity of the mystic tie should gravely incline the minds of the brethren toward the sublimer issues of the craft. The officer who would serve his lodge most effectively must realize he is of an order apart from other men, that he is the keeper of an awful secret, that the chair upon which he sits is the seat of immortals, and that if he would be a worthy successor to those master masons of other ages, his thoughts must be measured by the profundity of Pythagoras and the lucidity of Plato. Enthroned in the radiant east, the worshipful master is the light of his lodge, the representative of the gods, one of that long line of hierophants who, through the blending of their rational powers with the reason of the ineffable, have been accepted into the great school. This high priest, after an ancient order, must realize that those before him are not merely a gathering of properly tested men, but the custodians of an eternal lore, the guardians of a sacred truth the perpetuators of an ageless wisdom, the consecrated servants of a living God, the wardens of a supreme mystery. A new day is dawning for Freemasonry. From the insufficiency of theology and the hopelessness of materialism, men are turning to seek the God of philosophy. In this new era wherein the old order of things is breaking down and the individual is rising triumphant above the monotony of the masses, There is much work to be accomplished. The temple builder is needed as never before. A great reconstruction period is at hand. The debris of a fallen culture must be cleared away. The old footings must be found again that a new temple significant of a new revelation of law may be raised thereon. This is the peculiar work of the builder. This is the high duty for which he was called out of the world. This is the noble enterprise for which he was raised and given the tools of his craft. By doing his part in the reorganization of society, the workman may earn his wages, as all good masons should. A new light is breaking in the East. A more glorious day is at hand. The rule of the philosophic elect, the dream of the ages, will yet be realized and it is not far distant. To her loyal sons, Freemasonry sends this clarion call. Arise ye, the day of labor is at hand, the great work awaits completion, and the days of man's life are few. Like the singing guildsmen of bygone days, the craft of the builders marches victoriously down the broad avenues of time. Their song is of labor and glorious endeavor, their anthem is of toil and industry. They rejoice in their noble destiny, for they are builders of cities, the hewers of worlds, the master craftsmen of the universe. Chapter 20. The Goal of Philosophy Today is the hope of the world. Here and now we are welding that great chain of tomorrows which extends from the instant to infinity. We live not for ourselves alone but for all futurity. Our accomplishments survive us, for long after we have descended into the earth the orders which we have established shall dominate the activities of men. 
The world is an ancestral shrine filled with the mortuary tablets of the honored dead. We bow before our illustrious progenitors. We are the substance of their aspirations, the consummation of their dreams, for today is the focal point of time. We are all that has been about to be projected into all that shall be. Each human soul holds eternity in suspension. Recognizing this truth, several modern scientists have formulated the theory that immortality is achieved through a succession of lives. That the father achieves immortality in his son, the son in his progeny, and so on to the end of generation. The torch of life which each expiring personality hands on to another does not go out. It is immortal, but he who bears it must perish, by the way. Men are but incidents in the flow of life. Yet they have a strange power, for while they cannot cause the vital flame to blaze up from nothingness, they are empowered to snuff it out, and when generations cease, the countless ages die together. To be is to be immortal, for that which has been can never utterly cease. The past hovers in the air like a mirage. Men feel its presence, they breathe it in, and enveloped by it live their little now. Upon the surface of their polished mirrors, the ancient magi caught faint visions of forgotten times. Within the next century, we shall discover that history is written in the air, that so-called space itself is photographic, preserving as on a sensitized plate the varied activities of created things. Egypt, as a physical empire, has long since crumbled into dust. But upon each minute particle of the atmosphere, the glory of ancient Egypt is preserved for all time. Men speak words, and their words seemingly vanish into nothingness. But in the living substances of the universe, these selfsame words are traced in everlasting characters, to be read in some distant time by men as yet unborn. Thoughts unuttered are not wholly lost, nor do dreams perish because their dreamer dares not give them speech. Somewhere in the infinite vistas of space, impressed as it were upon the memory of the infinite and sharing together a common immortality, all aspirations, all visions, and all deeds await the day when men with unfolding reason will bind all time into a common now. In his experiments with plants, the late Luther Burbank found substantiation for the scientific concept of immortality through progeny. The doctrine of natural salvation as it is called, was demonstrated to Burbank through phenomena arising from the cross-pollination of plants. For example, Burbank pollinated a variety of plants bearing white flowers with another variety bearing colored flowers, and as a result, secured blossoms which were wholly white, some wholly colored, and still others of mixed colors. Taking a white plant from his cross-pollination test, Burbank pollinated it with another white plant, the result being a number of new plants, all white. Taking one of the latter, he again pollinated it with white, and the result was again white. This experiment was repeated ten times. In every case, the flowers were entirely white. But the eleventh time, several blossoms reverted to the original color of the plant, thereby proving that, though latent for a considerable period, the elements of the first cross-pollination survived to reappear again. The original colored shrub had died long before its activities reappeared among the white blossoms. But Burbank recognized in this phenomena the immortality of the colored flower which was reborn in its own progeny. To Burbank, man was but a human plant, and the great horticulturist solved the philosophic problem of his life by observing the habits of the growing things in his garden. If after the lapse of ten pollinations the identity of a distant progenitor was re-established, was it not reasonable to assume that men are born again to blossom forth in their descendants? Is not immortality the carrying forward of a primitive trace? And is it not the urge which we feel within ourselves the voice of some ancestral impulse? For the physical thinker, to whom the invisible universe is simply a vast mechanism, and spirit an unnecessary hypothesis, there can be no immortality other than that which is carried in the seed. How small a germ man springs from, yet how much that germ contains, for in each wriggling sperm is the man with character, personality, and individuality. 
from so slight a beginning, what great issues come. For in the single tiny germ are contained not only the epitome of all the past, but also all the greatness that is to follow. The philosopher takes issue with the scientist, not as to the accuracy of the conclusion, but rather as to the field to which the conclusion is applied. Fact is a fact, but for the clarification, it may often seem half a lie. Recognizing only the physical universe, the savant limits all his premises to physical concerns, with the result that his discoveries are rendered of little value by false emphasis. If man were actually a body, physical immortality would be his hope, and he would indeed survive in his progeny. But since man is not a physical body, the laws controlling the body are powerless over the intangible essence which resides within its innermost parts. Indwelling spirit is not to be measured wholly by its outer form. Body has hands and feet, but spirit has no need of such appendages except when functioning in the physical world. Body has parts and dimensions, but spirit is impartable and dimensionless. Thus, while the laws of physical generation produce the actual phenomena so carefully classified by Burbank, it does not necessarily follow that spirit, which is not material, is dependent upon generation for its survival. It is obvious that spirit depends upon generation for its manifestation and form, but such manifestation is merely a phase in the condition of spirit. Heredity is limited to the sphere of generation. It is of the accidents and not the essence of man. While men may inherit physical tendencies, even physical attitudes, and under some conditions, physical thoughts, this shell of personality is soulless until he animates it with his own immortal principle, then gradually shapes it into an appropriate destiny. Heredity only controls such as are incapable of controlling themselves. Steeped in the vibration of its previous states, the stuff from which bodies are made comes to each incarnating soul. The life into whose vehicles it was formerly incorporated set the minute atoms whirling at a definite speed, and imprinted upon each of them its own purpose and characteristics. The child coming into the world must battle with these strange vibrations, reorganizing the substances of its body and individual vehicles by overcoming the motion of past agencies and revibrating the electrons according to its own needs. The plant is a victim of circumstances to a far greater extent than is man. To escape its environment, the plant must either die or trust to the unlikelihood of some gardener transplanting it to a more ideal habitat. Man, however, if his surroundings be incongenial, may move at will to an environment more propitious to his destiny. The analogy may be projected into the invisible structures of both plants and man. The evolving plant life is still working through a vehicle too low in its organic quality to respond to the impulses of the inner agent, while man is empowered to resist the impulses of heredity, as these incline his physical body in one direction or another. The plant must abide by the dictates of its former part. The fallibility of the law of heredity has already been proved. And additional evidence of its inaccuracy will be accumulated as evolving man takes more of his destiny into his own hands and relies less upon the elements of chance and environment. As the stars impel yet do not compel, so man's hereditary impulses traced upon the fabric of his atomic nature urge him to follow in the old accustomed way. The self, however, declares otherwise, and one by one the impediments of heredity are overcome by the onward march of consciousness towards perfection. Whereas science fights to maintain the dignity of form and the supremacy of matter throughout the universe, philosophy would establish the excellence of life and the rulership of all creation by its rational part. If we come to worship matter and elevate the physical universe to first place among the spheres, we can never hope to establish well-being in the nature of men, or fellowship among the nations of the earth. The premise of material supremacy is wholly destructive of the moral sense, and reduces ethics to a superstition, and aesthetics to an artist's vagaries. All that is beautiful is thus sacrificed in the defense of a premise, and the sovereign good is martyr to a notion. More cruel than Moloch is the god of the materialist, for he would feed whole nations into the maw of greed. 
To remedy a condition, we must discover its cause. Man's boast of a godless age is his undoing. For he who destroys the concept of deity destroys with it the sufficiency of his own internal nature. In his pride that he is now able to govern the universe unaided, the 20th century thinker has given the divinities on high Olympus notice to gather up their belongings and depart. The gods have obliged him. Their thrones are empty. They have left for some other sphere where mortals are less vain. But man is still unhappy. His boasted knowledge has brought him doubt. Doubt has brought terror, and terror has sapped away his strength. Afraid that his worst conclusions may yet be true, the materialist clings to his little ball of dirt, shuddering in anticipation of that day when he will be hurled therefrom into the abyss he himself has postulated. The heart of the thinker cannot accept the soulless universe that his mind has declared. How strangely fickle is the mind that from pure imaginings fashions a universal order, and then dissatisfied with the fabric it has spun convicts high heaven of man-made inconsistencies. In his New Atlantis, a work unfinished, Sir Bacon recites the virtues of an ideal philosophic empire. This empire, which he calls Ben Salem, the son of peace, or of the latter, is ruled over by a mysterious institution designated Solomon's House. This house is an order of men united in the quest of universal realities. They are patrons of the arts and sciences and investigators of nature's lore. The whole story is founded upon Plato's Empire of Poseidon, the lost Atlantides, or the Isles of the Sea. One cannot read this account of the perfect state without marveling at the scope of Bacon's vision. Herein is set forth the substance of things hoped for, and the prophecy of that which must inevitably come to pass, in that time the gods decreed to be opportune. Bacon claims America to be the lost Atlantis, adding that the Greeks were mistaken as to the sinking of the ancient continent, which was not actually submerged but rather temporarily inundated by tidal waves and freshets in the mountains. The inhabitants of the valleys were drowned, but the more savage peoples who roamed the tangled highlands escaped. In this manner, culture was destroyed and only savagery left to reestablish the orders of nations. In his Holy Guide, John Hayden reprints the New Atlantis as an alchemical allegory, definitely connecting the book with the Rosicrucian mysteries and, through inference, with the symbols of Freemasonry. The discriminating Mason can hardly ignore the obvious fact that Solomon's house, as described by Bacon, is the temple of universal wisdom and education. Nor can he overlook the several degrees of ascent, whereby men did climb up to the same, as if it had been a scala coli. In his philosophy, the new Atlantis sets forth an ideal government of the earth. It foretells that day when, in the midst of men, there shall rise up a vast institution composed of the philosophic elect an order of illumined men banded together for the purpose of investigating the laws of life and the mysteries of the universe. In this labor will be employed the ancient disciplines reconstructed and restated by Bacon in the Novum Organum. Fate decrees that empires must fall and states vanish from the earth, for erected upon and maintained by selfishness, these shall ultimately be destroyed by the internal dissension generated through selfishness. The age of boundaries is closing, and we are approaching a nobler era when nations shall be no more, when the lines of race and caste shall be wiped out, when the whole earth shall be under one order, one government, one administrative body. As Asgard rose amid the fertile plains of earth, and as the Aesir guided the destinies of mortal creatures from their lofty thrones upon the snow-capped peaks, so upon the earth there shall rise a noble institution, destined to lead humanity toward the condition of knowledge. A great city shall be established like the holy city of ancient fable, which shall be the capital of the world, the seat of all power, the hub of world administration. Here an exalted legislative body shall be convened, which will mete out the justice of the wise and guide the unfoldment of the indigent many. From the seats of their authority, the various heads of human undertaking will direct the destinies of all enterprise. Being in agreement with each other, these enlightened executives will move in accordance with the principles of harmony and compatibility. 
No longer will the various divisions of society oppress each other. For when all the parts work toward a common end, the excellence of one over another is without consequence. The time has not yet arrived when the average man is strong enough or wise enough to rule himself. Even when unfolding destiny greatly magnifies the accomplishments of the many, there will not come a day when the wisdom of the mass will be equal to the wisdom of the wisest few. As men's minds increase in capacity and establish newer and nobler codes of ethics and morals, there will still be the exceptional intellect that by divine providence excels, and by virtue of such excellence, demonstrates its fitness for honor and responsibility. By an exceptional intellect, we do not mean an individual who through scheme or subterfuge steals glory from the impotent. Such thieves of prestige have a special substratum reserved for them in the realm of retribution. We refer to those illumined philosophers and mystics who, marching ahead of the body of the race, are the only ones actually fitted to directionalize human activities. Never will peace reign upon earth until we are ruled by the fit. Until he who possesses vision is permitted to see for the blind. Until he who senses greatness is permitted to interpret its issues for those who are unresponsive to magnitudes. Men are truly free only when governed by the wise. They are inclined gently toward the perfection of their own natures. Men are truly great only when, admitting the supremacy of the wise, they offer both life and chattel to the service of integrity. Plato dreamed of that glorious day when the wranglings and contentions of mankind would cease, when people would turn from their petty tyranny to unite in a common destiny, when the needs of the many would be removed from exploitation by the few. He dreams in vain, however, who envisions a government of the people or by the people, but he is a seer indeed who can formulate the concept of a rational government for the people. The man is happy who can trust his lord. That state is fortunate whose prince is a philosopher. Humanity turns toward wisdom when the fruits of wisdom are apparent to it. Having once beheld the rewards of integrity, all men will move joyously toward that state of concord wherein dwell the wise, conserving their resources and fulfilling the destiny of rational souls. We must learn that wisdom is neither book learning nor empty pedantry. The sham studiousness of the sophists was facetiously termed eyeglass believing by the medieval mystics. Our present education system would be fundamentally opposed to this philosophic program because the school is the servant of utility and our standards of utility are lamentably insufficient. We teach men to bargain, barter, and connive. We are unsparing of both time and money in our effort to fit them into a system, obviously impractical. Centuries must pass before the body of society will be sufficiently sickened of the vanities it supports to be inclined toward integrity. Eventually, the day of awakening must come, for man cannot suffer indefinitely, and the saturation point of human endurance must sometime reach its limit. The unnecessary burden which we carry and have borne through uncounted ages will then be cast aside, and turning to truth we shall find liberation. Polemics is not necessarily the abode of the wise, nor is much hair-splitting to be confused with erudition. The elevation of a man to high position does not ipso facto improve the quality of his nature or increase his capacity to receive. True elevation is opportunity, but the innate characteristics of the one promoted must determine the use to be made of that opportunity. To remove politicians from power and replace them with scientists or philosophers trained according to our present concepts would not necessarily solve our problem. The sages of Plato's vision are the truly wise, men initiated into the disciplines of the soul and deeply versed in the mysteries of life. In the senates of the philosophic elect, blocks of biologists would not combine to frustrate the legislation of the physicists. Nor would astronomers hold out on technicalities against the geometricians. Savants would neither give a little of this for a little of that, nor arbitrate away the rights of men to prolong an ephemeral political prestige. Where the learned differ, it is evident that there is no learning. In that city of the wise, all the arts and sciences will complement each other, and the disciples of every branch of learning will mutually venerate each other's knowledge. 
Competition will cease and cooperation will be reinstated as the true life of trade. The bartering of interests, the misappropriation of power, the malfeasance of office, all these are crimes possible only in a non-philosophic age where the blind who follow are unable to discern the fallacies of the blind who lead. For thousands of years a devotee to the fetish of competition, man has devastated that Edenic garden over which the Lord designed him to be the keeper. A poor gardener he has made. He has torn up all the flowering plants which lend beauty to the spot, that in their place he might grow weeds for a little profit. The highest expression of wisdom on the part of the many involves first appreciation for the still greater wisdom of the few, and secondly, the high-mindedness to waive the rights of personal privilege that thereby the greatest good to the greatest number may be achieved. Death is the invariable product of ignorance, but life is prolonged in conformity with intelligence. Heedless of our own destiny and the vain struggle for possessions, we often perish for lack of wisdom, even as we reach out to grasp the substance of our desires. The plains of earth are broad, the resources of earth are incalculable, and on this globe there is ample to satisfy the needs of all. Through commerce and industry, through legitimate intercourse and exchange, and with reasonable effort man can enjoy those necessities which contribute to his well-being. Acceptance of the false principle of diversity, however, has been man's undoing, for the existence of contiguous states or nations has been the excuse for their exploitation. Boundary lines were originally set up that they might later become diplomatic technicalities. For it was presupposed that an invading horde should someday sweep them away. Nations consequently prey upon nations according to their presumptions of necessity. Strong peoples absorb weaker peoples into themselves, thereby depriving some of that which is necessary that others may have more than enough. Oppression by the invader and retaliatory wars by the oppressed are the inevitable products of such encroachments. Fighting for what he conceives to be his inherent right, the patriot is a martyr to vain standards and hopeless issues. He opposes ignorance with ignorance, and thus the sorrows of the ages are compounded. Man destroys man that man may live. Life lives by killing. Freedom is achieved by intolerance. And if we are to believe the pronouncements of the foolish, peace is preserved by the sword. Where, may we ask, is the beginning or the end of this vicious circle which survives by destroying and also destroys by surviving? Occasionally we find an individual of such innate perversity that he will actually cheat himself in material things. In matters pertaining to the spirit, however, dishonesty is quite the common order. In our foragings we generally descend Assyrian-like upon the stranger still reasoning with primitive caveman logic that which is not already our own as legitimate prey. With the abolishment of political states and the unification of all peoples into one great nation, the misunderstanding directly due to national jealousy and competition would be outlawed. For what people would be so foolish as to raise an army for the conquest of that which is already part of itself and cooperating for the sovereign good? Such a national attitude, when once established, would constitute a powerful moral deterrent to individual conduct. So far-reaching is the influence of our environment that, in a comparatively short time, the spirit of competition, as applied to individual concerns, would be broken, and men would build into the common pattern of public weal instead of striving to acquire a passing supremacy over the bodies of the dead. To be a wholesale killer is no longer the hallmark of greatness, for no strength is stronger than that which, withholding the hand, prevents violence. No courage more courageous than that which, facing the problems of each passing day, fights the battles of peace. Upon first thought, it may be difficult to visualize a world ruled by philosophy instead of politics. What is politics, however, but the philosophy of government? And is not universal law applied to the government of men, and should not the one who is made a ruler over others be conversant also with those sidereal forces by which the order of creation is maintained? For knowledge of cosmogony and universal law were a prerequisite to rulership, 
how many of our present governors would occupy their official chairs. Yet, for the regulation of human affairs, what pattern is more sublime than the harmony of the celestial spheres, or the innate orderliness of crystal formation? The science of mundane government has failed because it has ceased to be a science of government and has become a science of personal interests. What is responsible for this perversion and misdirection of executive power? Simply the elevation of the unfit. We recall the words of the satirist who, philosophizing upon the effects of the French Revolution, declared that the reign of terror had taken the affairs of the state out of the hands of a despotic few and transferred them into the keeping of the unqualified many. Let us never forget the words of that great Jewish statesman, Disraeli, who said, The world is weary of statesmen whom democracy has degraded into politicians. The theory of democracy is one of the noblest yet conceived by man. It is the aristocratic gesture of the proletarian. It fails, however, because at no time can man be more than himself. For man's government, like his God, perforce must be but a highly magnified reflection of himself. The true seat of government is in the home. In his Apothegms of Kings and Grand Commanders, Plutarch describes a reformer who was discussing with Lycurgus the setting up of a democracy in Sparta. Pray, retorted the Spartan lawgiver. Do you first set up a democracy in your own house? Governments obviously cannot succeed where men fail, for we are the makers of government, and our statutes unsparingly reflect both the depth and the shallowness of our own individual selves. When the citizen is told to appoint a representative, he generally takes the advice too literally. If the leader resembles too faithfully his constituency, he is unable to point out to his following any course of action which they could not have discovered by their own efforts. Hence, the interval of rationality should intervene between the governed and the governor. When this interval of superiority is insufficient, our vices and not our virtues become the rulers of the state. Democracy, writes Lowell in the Bigelow Papers, gives every man a right to be his own oppressor. Each faction of the people mistakenly assumes that its primal need is a representative who will interpret its whims and further its own particular ends at the expense of all other groups. Philosophy, however, corrects this attitude, declaring that the popular need is a virtuous mind strong enough to incline the populace toward a greater good. Spokesmen of the masses seldom says anything, for the voice of the masses is the incoherent babble of many voices, in which no single voice is intelligible. The political philosopher should be an idealist, not a realist. Not content with preserving things in their present state, he should desire to elevate them to the state of the ideal. Government is the science of leadership, the philosophy of administration, the art of reconciling the apparently irreconcilable viewpoints of the many. Of all the sciences, government demands the greatest measure of integrity, a position requiring a superlative quality of integrity and involving the widest sphere of influence should, by every rule of logic, be reserved for the wisest and best fitted. Only that man who is above personal interest is a safe politician. For the citizenry suffers when so-called public servants are the servants of their own desires. Only when the world is ruled by its best balanced intellects can we expect it to be well ruled. We have never had a sufficient number of illumined leaders to permit the smaller nations a proper and adequate form of government. Only by combining into a single people and choosing the wisest of men, regardless of race or creed, to directionalize the activities of the human race, can we approach that philosophic empire which Bacon, profoundly versed in the theory of government, advanced as the true solution of empire. When inferior intellects are chosen to administer governmental destinies, dissension is inevitable in the state. The true philosopher is the born ruler of men though now considered impractical because he lives in a world divorced from personal interest. In reality, the philosopher dwells in the sphere of things as they ought to be, contemplating as he does the eternal verities of the universe. He is peculiarly fitted to ponder the affairs of government. 
For from such contemplation of eternal verities, he has come to realize that if any institution is to endure, it must be patterned after the enduring qualities of the universe. By incorporating universal truths into the social structure, the philosopher affects the stabilization of society. The true ends of philosophy are not realized in the spinning of vain theories or fourth-dimensional wool-gathering. Philosophy is the pondering of problems, the quest for solutions, the effort to organize life, so that by conforming his life to the dictates of rationality, man may come to enjoy the maximum of peace, efficiency, and individual completeness. As each age comes into manifestation, it brings with it a definite philosophic revelation designed to solve the problems peculiar to that age. These revelations are keynotes of thought, and by their aid we bridge the ethical intervals between generations. Racial systems of culture now dead are remembered chiefly for the words of power which they passed on to the civilizations that succeeded them. Through the tangled mystery of time we have wound our way, achieving according to the measure of our understanding. In philosophic history, certain outstanding individuals have come to be regarded as the epitome of vast orders of learning. We regard these individualities as the formers and reformers of doctrines and orders of life. Thus, all the elements of Hindu Brahmanism are gathered into one colossal personality, Manu, the giver of the law. As the embodiment of Egyptian culture, Hermes founded the mysteries of statecraft, giving to the world the doctrines of universal order and procedure. In ancient Greece, the half-mythical Orpheus established the cult of beauty, teaching men the gospel of rhythm. Then to Asia came the strong voice of Buddha, calling men to the way of renunciation and the noble eightfold path. Again in Greece, while pondering the science of numbers, Pythagoras revealed God to the world as the great geometrician, bidding men enter upon the mathematical life. Then Socrates, the immortal proletarian, affirmed the necessity to be the greatest good, giving men the gospel of justice. In China, Confucius, the unapotheosized saint and utilitarian of the celestial empire, expounded the worship of the imminent and the service of the now. In Syria, Jesus, the rabbi of the Essenes, preached the gospel of friendship, seeking to unite the diverse interests of mankind in the fellowship of the Spirit. To Arabia, Muhammad, the desired of all nations, holding high the sword of Islam, brought the philosophy of retribution and a righteous destiny. Modern religious and philosophic concepts thus comprise an intricate eclecticism combining the reconcilable elements of these and various other revelations. The faith we live by is woven from many threads. We are the sons of the prophets of elder days, and half-heartedly we strive to keep the varied array of their commandments. But behold, the dawn of a new era is at hand. Humanity has elevated itself in temporal things, far above all previous states of power. National strength has become so dominating as to require a code more ample, a revelation more specific. Ascendancy brings with it great responsibility, and the ethical structure of society must be rendered stable if integrity is to be preserved amid the temptations of preeminence. Never before has the lawgiver been faced with a problem involving humanity as a whole. Previous revelations have been addressed, for the most part, to single nations or chosen peoples. The prophet of those days brought that which was necessary for the survival of his own clan and the well-being of that particular order of which he himself was a part. Thus, while each of these messages contains elements of truth that are imperishable, they are not wholly suitable to present needs. For this age we must have a doctrine of synthesis, a code actuated and dominated by the spirit of unification. The supreme need is to blend the diverse interests of men into a common purpose. The philosophy of this age must reveal the interdependence of the Chinaman and the Turk, the white man and the black, the great and the small. In other words, we have need of a common denominator, a fundamental premise upon which all will be agreed. For if we are to establish the government of the philosophic elect, it must be erected upon the foundation of mutual understanding. Today we have one set of laws for men who live in the valleys and another for those who dwell upon the hills.
The diversified interests of a great populace require many representatives to interpret those needs at the seats of government. For the tiller of the soil is a stranger to the captain of industry, and the financier in the environment of his money world little senses these broad impulses animating the souls of poets and philosophers. Humanity has grown to be so strong that it is now dangerous to allow its parts to remain disunited. No longer can we maintain our position of isolated individualism without endangering the rights of all men. The old truth that man cannot live by himself alone is still true. The ever-increasing strength of the individual confers upon him an ever-increasing capacity to injure. And unless the desire to hurt seizes within his own soul, he is capable of infinite destructiveness. The same is true of nations on a grander scale. War has revealed the destructive potentialities resident in aggregations of people. Communities apparently benign and harmless can be metamorphosed overnight into a death-dealing mechanism which, justifying its destructiveness, like the Macedonian phalanx from which it was derived, can move across the face of the virgin earth and leave nothing but shattered hopes and smoldering ruins in its wake. This power to injure, inherent in human nature and now scientifically organized and trained to wreck the fullest measure of evil, is an impending menace against which the race must protect itself. The social structure is infected with the hereditary taint of war, and none is so wise that he can predict at just what point the plague will break out next. In such emergencies, laws are impotent, preachments in vain, and moralizings futile. For intoxicated with the lust for power, men will turn against all that they formerly held dear and in the name of patriotism, march ruthlessly to their own ultimate destruction. When they have loosed the dogs of war, men study Napoleon, not Socrates. When the bloodletting is over and men have turned from the glory altar of Ares, they seek solace not in Caesar's memoirs, but in the words of Jesus or Buddha. But man's forethought always comes behind, for he keeps the power of devastation in his own name, and invokes deity only during the reconstruction periods. After the plenitude of destruction has been wrought, a repentant people like naughty children turn to their eternal parent for sympathy. In those more placid moments when our emotions are at rest and the stagnant pools of our desires are left unstirred, we are indeed a noble race, striving for a heavenly crown. But when greed stirs up our bile, we revert to a most barbarous and primitive type, eagerly trading our equity in a state of future bliss for a few square leagues of a more substantial earth, from all of which it is apparent that as yet no spiritual revelation has come sufficiently strong to successfully withstand the inherent weakness of the flesh. The rewards promised for virtue are so distant and ephemeral that they do not tempt more sordid men as do the instantaneous compensations which are apparently the rewards of perversion. Centuries must yet pass before the human soul will be sufficiently liberated from the involvements of the material nature to dominate and directionalize the activities of its objective nature. We have come to a day of intense classifications, of vast industries and corporations, of factional organizations. Each individual is ambitiously striving to become a specialist in some department of the arts and sciences or professions of living. Each one's goals is to attain a position of familiarity with his subject, which will enable him to corner the field and exploit it to its own aggrandizement. It consequently follows that when men simply use each other as means to further their own selfish ends, there must result an ever-decreasing bond of understanding between them. For their selfishness and divergence of interest inevitably segregates and eventually results in utter isolation. Like rays of light pouring from a radiant center, humanity today is traveling at an incalculable rate towards diversity, limited only by its innate capacity to diverge. A new keynote must consequently be struck, a new word of power sounded, a new message brought which will warn men that in this mad dash toward diversity lies annihilation, that this senseless separateness of interests must ultimately result in a confusion of tongues and the obliteration of all effort. 
The highest message of yesterday was the message of friendship, an effort to unite men in a common cause. But friendship has proved insufficient as a remedy, for friendship is capable of perversion. The undeveloped man is a natural abuser of privileges and a perverter of issues. Friendship has become the chosen institution of rogues, and thus the power of evil has been strengthened. For when thugs fraternize, the entire social order is at hazard. It has been demonstrated that the powers of evil, unable to lean upon the infinite which was presumably against them, have developed the pernicious habit of depending upon themselves and each other, with the result that virtue is a disorganized and vice a well-regulated institution. Friendship has failed, first, because men could not understand it, hence degraded it to a tool of interest. Secondly, because to the average individual it is an artificial relation, established in an effort to create a condition which did not naturally exist. Men have mouthed the word until it has become obnoxious and synonymous with the vagaries of a decadent faith. As yet, we have not reached that point in our spiritual unfoldment where universal friendship is apparent to us. When you tell a man that friendship exists in nature and that God has decreed his creations to live together in amicable relations, he may point to the jungle law where every animal lurks behind a bush ready to devour the passerby. Or he may ask you to explain the earthquake or the storm and the host of natural agencies which conceal their affinity for each other so successfully that only a theologian can hope to discover them. The new message is the gospel of identity. It is not an effort to unite lives and a common interest, but a recognition of the fact that all forms are but manifestations of one indivisible agent. According to this concept, there are no longer two who can be friends, but rather one that cannot be divided, and whom the sense of diversity is an illusion of form and not a reality of spirit. No longer must we conceive of that type of friendship in which several parts fraternize, and all too often patronize, but rather that indissoluble unity which is fundamental throughout the universe. To the wise, however, this is not one life working against another, but the parts of one life moving upon each other. Cataclysms possibly evidence a magnified form of those same inconsistencies which man manifests when he deliberately injures some part of his own body for the gratification of a whim. The gospel of identity is not one that can be thundered from the pulpits, preached from the housetops, or harangued in the marketplace. It is something that must come to be realized, that must be felt within the nature itself. It is that fundamental unity of each with all, the power which discovers all things within the self and the self within all things. The gospel of tomorrow will be the gospel of one being. No longer will a million universes or billions of half-formed creatures struggle out the destiny of worms. No longer will there be a seemingly endless, crawling, seething mass of minute lives. For out of this Toshito heaven has come the Lord of tomorrow, the sovereign of eternity, whose doctrine is that of identity. The star and the gnat will be united suspended, as it were, from a single monad, one in essence, though several in aspect. No longer will there be the great and the small, but one spirit moving inevitably toward itself. No longer will there be a great order of evolving lives, but rather one ideating whole, an expression moving from itself outward to the inclusion of all. Today we live in an involuting civilization, a civilization of separateness a world dedicated to the concept of struggling with the parts of itself, a world obsessed with the illusion that the self has parts. We must overcome the belief that self can rise up against its own nature, or that spirit is fragmentary, or that one man should compete with another is as senseless as that the fingers should fight the hands to which they are attached, or dissent from each other as to their individual supremacy. From the condition of primitive isolation, man has raised himself through successive revelations to a limited capacity to understand the issues of life. A few broad-minded, far-seeing individuals have recognized the fundamental equality of life and have issued an emancipation proclamation declaring all creatures by right of their divine origin to be entitled to a place in the sun. 
From equality, it is but a logical step to identity. So the enlightened man who has been elevated to the point where, when he meets another man, he says, You are my friend, will tomorrow meet the same man and say, You are myself. No longer will complicated codes be necessary to administer human affairs, when each man's interest becomes the interest of all the rest, and each man's needs the needs of all. Laws are largely established to govern relationships, but when all relationships are done away with, laws will pass with them, for the one is always itself, and the intervals for which theoretical relationships are remedial agencies cannot exist in a united body. An intellectual concept of the gospel of identity is not sufficient. In fact, intellectualism is the trap by which most minds are ensnared. A fact is not established by the intellect, but a deeper power which we like to term realization. Hence, the truth of identity is demonstrated by the realization of identity. Never until we have true equality, until we realize that equality is based upon identity. For that which is self is equal to self. And upon the appreciation of this fact, democracy is established. Democracy is not the condescending, patronizing attitude of the politician, nor is it the system whereby a hundred million folk of uncertain mind are empowered to elect one from their number as their leader. Democracy is the realization of the unity of life, and this realization shatters forever the competitive standard of civilization, which is based upon the erroneous assumption that one part of life can survive without or at the expense of another. Competition was founded upon the dualistic theory, an ancient anthropomorphism in which two spirits wage an endless fight for supremacy. So wherever two individuals, institutions, or nations conceive a separate origin or a separate destiny, we have the boast that one will be holier than the other, as long as we conceive of separateness in origin and ultimate there will be grounds for competition. And upon the basis of competition is erected the whole structure of human sorrow. We have an age, therefore, in which the parts struggle with each other, a world that thinks it has accomplished greatly when it picks the right pocket to fill its left pocket. Diversity is simply the manifestation of those potentialities that are ever within the substance of unity. The universe is simply the objectification of a single causal agent. This does not imply that all things are alike, but rather that while they may differ in non-essentials, as for example external composition, they are composed of the same agencies and essences. The gospel of identity includes the theory of difference, not difference from the standpoint of inequality, but from the standpoint of condition. The philosopher does not infer that a gnat is a star, but that in their essential natures each is the manifestation of a common life, and that whatever may occur to one is registered in the single life principle that agitates them both. We have a civilization in which each part is attempting to include the whole within itself. Man, as an individual, dreams of the day when he can dominate men as a mass failing to realize that such dominance is in an appearance only, and that the individual can never be more than he is, one of many. Through consciousness he may elevate himself to the point where he and the many are one, but having achieved this exalted goal, he ceases to be himself and becomes the many, thinking in the terms of the many and serving the ends of the many. The gospel of identity shows man his true greatness. Namely, that he possesses the power to interpret the whole and can actually come to realize his kinship with all. Through such realization, he achieves philosophic liberation. He who escapes from the littleness, which is his not self, into the vastness, which is his real self, achieves greatly and serves the sovereign good. There is but one cure for selfishness. Namely, to realize that nothing can be added to us and nothing taken from us, that we are what we are and have what we have. We may temporarily possess a certain measure of opulence, but unless it is our own, it will depart from us again. Yet in departing it is not gone, for that which is the possession of anyone is ultimately the possession of all. What use, then, can there be for selfishness when he who believes that he takes from another really takes from himself. 
And why should not a man be generous when that which he gives to another he gives to himself? In philosophy, there is consequently neither giver nor a receiver, in that the gift, the giver, and the receiver are one. The spirit in man is not merely a life enclosed within a frame. Man is really a frame enclosed within a spirit. The thing in you that says, I am, is identical with the thing in me that says, I am. And why should we not unite in common purpose? Why should we struggle for a little outer glory and battle with shadows in the service of our greeds? If he so desires, each individual by receding into his own divine nature may discover within himself the divine nature of all creatures. He may even become every other creature, for that part of himself which is real is every other creature. In the annihilation of the sense of separateness, we annihilate both life and death. For when we identify ourselves with the one life moving through all things, how can we end? As long as there is life, we are that life. As long as a single star twinkles in the heavens, we are that star. As long as a single blade of grass grows, we are that blade of grass. We are not of the same race as those hands and feet which we have so long identified with ourselves. We are not that driveling creature clutching at power. That mad thing of destruction which tears and rends in childish rage and harbors revenge within its heart. When we have recognized the universality of spirit, we are one with the very fabric of life and are no longer tortured with fears and premonitions. In our folly, we have tried to be petty despots and establish empires of our own. We have desired the gold braid and tinsel of princes and are peevish when someone takes away our principality. Let us turn from our petty despotism to behold the greater glory, which is our natural right. For we are citizens of eternity. We are that very life that in the beginning moved upon the face of the deep. We are that shining power that walked in the garden with the Lord. We are the seraphim and the cherubim and the choirs of the ineffable. We are not gods. We are God, exiled for a little while into the forgetfulness of ourselves, yet soon to awaken to the full measure of our splendor. O slumbering life, awake from your dreams of manyness and soar into the free air of concord. Turn from the wheels that you have set spinning in the building of an ephemeral empire. Depart from the unsubstantialness which you have come to love too well and lift your eyes to the contemplation of a nobler state. You have given so much for a little power. You have become so weary in your fruitless quest of gain. The world asks so much for the little it can give, and that semblance of happiness which oppression has given you is so shallow and devoid of peace. Philosophy summons you to a greater calling, a more noble profession, a more excellent destiny. The sages of old would welcome you into the brotherhood of the elect, into the true ranks of the immortals where life flows on in broad full sweep throughout all eternity. Leave the half-built world which crumbles even as you raise its structures, for the Great Mother always had shaken countless civilizations from off her back. The very dust beneath our feet cries out with desire unfulfilled, for it is the powdered substance of ambition. Only in truth is their sufficiency. Only in reality is their power. The unity of life is man's great truth upon which foundation he may build the empire of his soul. He is rich who is rich in truth. He is poor who is poor in truth. All else is of little moment. We are immortal, and that our soul tomorrow may be in peace, let us rebuild our civilization. Let us establish our government of realities, our commonwealth of the wise. We as citizens of today are also the citizens of tomorrow. We are the life that shall throb in the communities yet to come. We are the voice that shall speak in the senates of an unborn day. To that great life which is our true self, to that tomorrow which to us must ever be the now, let us dedicate our inner selves and the achievements of our external natures. The End This has been an audio recording of Lectures on Ancient Philosophy by Manly P. Hall Read by Graham Dunlop Edited by Darren Grimes